An Alarm to the Unconverted by Joseph Alain, first published in 1671 and read on these tapes by Dr. Stephen Westcott of Bristol, England. 1. Biographical Introduction Joseph Alain was born into a Puritan family at Devizes in Wiltshire, England, and baptised on April 8, 1634. England was then in the throes of these stirring events which were soon to lead to the Civil War, and before Elaine was ten years old the Market Square, where his home stood, echoed with the crash of cannon and the peal of muskets as Royalists put Roundhead to flight at the Battle of Roundway, July 1643. Two years later the tables were turned and Cromwell himself saw to it that the blue banner of the Parliament was raised aloft over the old castle that stood opposite the home of Elaine's childhood. The family circle was also not without its trials. His father, though a clothier of good standing, suffered some of the economic misfortunes of the war, and to their grief Joseph's elder brother Edward, already in the Christian ministry, died in 1645. That same year saw Elaine setting forth in the Christian race, and imploring his father that he might be educated to succeed his brother in the work of the ministry. Thus, in April 1649, we find him going up to Oxford to sit at the feet of such divines as John Owen and Thomas Goodwin. In November 1651, he moved from Lincoln to Corpus Christi College, the latter under the presidency of the saintly Dr. Edward Staunton, being a more thoroughgoing Puritan seminary. Here he took his Bachelor of Arts degree on July 6, 1653, became a tutor and subsequently chaplain to the college. Doubtless it was due partly to Elaine's influence that Henry Jesse could write in 1660 I think there was scarce such a place in the world as Corpus Christi where such a multitude held forth the power of godliness the purity of God's worship even an Eden it was but now it is a barren wilderness Elaine's years at Oxford were characterised by piety and diligent study his warm disposition found him many friends, but if their visits interrupted his studying time, he had no leisure to let them in, saying, It is better that they should wonder at my rudeness than that I should lose my time, for only a few will take notice of the rudeness, but many may feel the loss of my time. As a chaplain, he laboured to evangelise the country villages around Oxford, and also preached to the prisoners in Oxford jail every fortnight. Such was his training for his future ministry. Not yet twenty-one, he had already learned to be infinitely and insatiably greedy for the conversion of souls, and to this end he poured out his very heart in prayer and in preaching. It's no wonder that a worthy Puritan divine, George Newton, 1602 to 1681, minister of St. Mary Magdalene, Taunton in Somersetshire, called Elaine to be his assistant in 1655. Taunton, a wool manufacturing town with a population of perhaps some 20,000, was a Puritan stronghold in the English West Country. The spirit of the town had been clearly displayed ten years early, when with heroic steadfastness it had withstood more than one desperate royalist siege, even when half the streets had been burned down by a storm of mortars and many of the inhabitants had died of starvation. It was here, amongst the hills and meadows and orchards of Somerset, that Elaine was to spend his short but unforgettable ministry. Immediately following the commencement of his work at Taunton, Elaine was married on October the 4th, 1655, to his cousin Theodosia Elaine, a woman of singular spirituality, who
who left a moving account of her husband's ministry. The only fault for which she chided her husband was that he did not spend more time with her, to which he would reply, Ah, my dear, I know thy soul is safe, but how many that are perishing have I to look after? Oh, that I could do more for them. Elaine's whole life was an illustration of his saying, Give me a Christian that counts his time more precious than gold. When the week began, he would say, Another week is now before us. Let us spend this week for God. And each morning, let us live this one day well. All the time of his health, writes his wife, he did rise constantly at or before four o'clock, and on the Sabbath sooner, if he did wake. He would be much trouble if he heard any smiths or shoemakers or such tradesmen at their trades before he was in his duties with God, saying to me, Oh, how this noise shames me! Does not my master deserve better than theirs? From four till eight he spent in prayer, holy contemplation, and the singing of psalms, which he much delighted in, and did daily practice alone as well as in his family. Together this devoted pair laboured for souls. Theodosia Elaine kept a school for children in her home, while her husband spent five afternoons every week following up the urgent calls to the unconverted, which sounded forth Sunday by Sunday from beneath the stately tower of Mary Magdalene. He kept a catalogue of the names of the inhabitants of each street and saw that they were all visited and catechized. This resulted in a numerous ingathering of souls. His supplications and his exhortations, said George Newton, many times were so affectionate, so full of holy zeal, life and vigour, that they quite overcame his hearers. He melted them and sometimes dissolved the hardest hearts. It was clear that even in an age when powerful preaching and successful evangelism were comparatively common, Elaine's ministry was outstanding in the eyes of his brethren. Few ages have produced more eminent preachers than Mr. Joseph Elaine, declared that apostolic North Country Puritan Oliver Haywood. And Baxter speaks of his great ministerial skillfulness in the public explication and application of the scriptures, so melting, so convincing, so powerful. A day of grace was nearing its sunset when Elaine entered into his ministry. Within three years, Oliver Cromwell was dead. Two years more and the bells at Taunton rang merrily to welcome the home kinging coming of King Charles II and the restoration of the monarchy, 1660. But the happiness in Puritan hearts was short-lived. For the era when, as Philip Henry said, the face of godliness was upon the nation was over, and in 1662, by the infamous act of uniformity, 2,000 of the best ministers in England were cast out of their pulpits. Among the 85 or so ministers who suffered in this way, in Somersetshire, we find, as we might well expect, the names of George Newton and Joseph Elaine. But though debarred from his pulpit, Elaine refused to be silenced. Indeed, his wife tells us how, laying aside all other studies, because he accounted his time to be but short, he increased his preaching activity. I know that he hath preached fourteen times in eight days, and ten often, and six or seven ordinarily in these months. At length, after surviving many threats, Elaine received a summons on May 26, 1663. The following night he appointed to meet his people about one or two of the clock in the morning, to which they showed their readiness. There was of young and of old many hundreds. He preached and prayed with them about three hours. The very next day he was thrown into prison at Ilchester. After a year he was released, but only to be confronted with the rigours of the Five Mile Act 
and the conventicle act. Although now declining in health, he nevertheless resumed preaching in secret until July the 10th, 1666. On that evening, while he was preaching, from Psalm 147 verse 20, to a gathering in a private house, the doors were battered open, and he was seized and again taken to prison. Once more he was released, and with undiminished spiritual energy he considered what he might do yet to further, further the gospel of Christ. Now we have one day more, he would say to his wife as he rose in the morning. Here is one day more for God. Let us live well this day, work hard for our souls, lay up for us treasure in heaven this day, for we have but a few days to live. His wife tells us how, with true Puritan spirit, his thoughts turn to the possibility of missionary work in Wales or even in China. Never did the evangel of Jesus Christ burn more fervently in any English heart. But Elaine's work was done, for his physical constitution never recovered from the hardships of his confinements, and his body was sinking fast. On November the 17th, 1668, at the age of 34, God took him away from the evils yet to come, and the aged George Newton stood by his body as it was laid to rest in the chancel of the church, which had once resounded with the alarms of his call to the unconverted. This book embodies the substance of Elaine's message, and in doing so provides a true model of Puritan evangelism. Phraseology must differ from age to age and gifts from man to man, but here we have no hesitation in saying are the principles which must be present in any true presentation of the gospel. More than one great evangelist had had his views moulded by the following pages. George Whitfield, while a student at Oxford, tells us in his journal how Elaine's alarm much benefited him. Charles Haddon Spurgeon recalls how, when he was a child, his mother would often read a piece of Elaine's alarm to them as they sat round the fire on a Sunday evening. And when brought under conviction of sin, it was to this old book that he turned. I remember, he writes, when I used to wake in the morning, and the first thing I took up was Elaine's alarm, or Baxter's call to the unconverted. Oh, those books! Those books, I read them and devoured them. With his heart thus burning with the fires of Puritan divinity, Spurgeon was prepared to follow in the steps of Elaine and Whitfield. Countless editions of this book have been issued since it was first uh, published and saw the light in the year 1671. Dr. Calamy wrote concerning it in 1702, multitudes will have cause to be ever thankful for it. No book in the English tongue, the Bible alone excepted, can equal it for the number that hath been dispersed. There have been 20,000 sold under the title of the Call or Alarm, and 50,000 more of the same under the title A Sure Guide to Heaven, 30,000 of which were sold at one impression. As a remarkable illustration of the spiritual influence of this work, we may mention one example. Towards the end of the 18th century, a minister of a Highland congregation, a man more eminent for scholarship than for evangelical fervour, was approached by a society to translate the alarm into Gaelic. The book was thus passed into his hands, and finding it suitable material for the pulpit, he commenced to repeat the substance of it in successive uh, days to his congregation. The result, it said, was a widespread awakening which long prevailed in the district of Nether Lawn. With the prayer that the substance of this book may again be sounded forth throughout our land and across the seas, we commend this book to the blessing of him whose word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. 
but the word of the Lord endureth for ever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. First Epistle of Peter chapter 1 verses 24 to 25. Two, an earnest invitation to sinners to turn to God. Dearly beloved, I gladly acknowledge myself a debtor to you, and am concerned, as I would be found a good steward of the household of God, to give every one his portion. But the physician is more concerned for those patients whose case is the more doubtful and hazardous, and the father's pity is especially turned towards his dying child. So unconverted souls call for earnest compassion and prompt diligence to pluck them as brands from the burning. Jude 23 Therefore it is to them I shall first apply myself in these pages. But from where shall I fetch my argument? With what shall I win them? Oh, that I could tell! I would write to them in tears. I would weep out every argument. I would empty my veins for ink. I would petition them on my knees. Oh, how thankful should I be if they would be prevailed upon to repent and turn. How long have I labored for you? How often would I have gathered you? This is what I have prayed for and studied for these many years, that I might bring you to God. Oh, that I might do it now! Will you yet be entreated? But, O oh Lord, how insufficient I am for this work! Alas, with what shall I pierce the scales of Leviathan, or make the heart feel that it is as hard as a nether millstone? Shall I go and speak to the grave, and expect the dead that they would obey me and come forth? Shall I make an oration to the rocks, or declaim to the mountains, and think to move them with my arguments? Shall I make the blind to see? From the beginning of the word, world, it was not heard that a man hath opened the eyes of the blind. John chapter 9 verse 32 But, O Lord, Thou canst pierce the heart of the sinner. I can only draw the bow at a venture, but Thou direct the arrow between the joints of the harness. Slay the sin, save the soul of the sinner that casts his eyes upon these pages. There is no entering into heaven but by the straight passage of the second birth. Without holiness you shall never see God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 Therefore give yourselves unto the Lord now. Set yourselves to seek him now. Set up the Lord Jesus in your hearts. Set him up in your houses. Kiss the Son. Psalm 2 verse 12 and embrace the tenders of mercy. Touch his scepter and live. For why will you die? I do not beg for myself, but would have you happy. This is the prize I run for. My soul's desire and prayer for you is that you may be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 1 I beseech you to permit a friendly plainness and freedom with you in this your deepest concern. I am not playing the orator to make a learned speech to you, nor dressing the dish with eloquence in order to please you. These lines are upon a weighty errand indeed, to convince and convert and save you. I am not baiting my hook with rhetoric or fishing for your applause, but for your souls. My work is not to please you, but to save you. Nor is my business with your fancies, but with your hearts. If I have not your hearts, I have nothing. If I were to please your ears, I would sing another song. If I were to preach myself, I would steer another course. I would tell you a smoother tale. I would make pillows for you and speak peace. For how can Ahab love this Micaiah that always prophesies evil concerning him? 1 Kings chapter 22 verse 8 How much better are the wounds of a friend than the fair speeches of the harlot 
who flatters with her lips till the dart strike through the liver. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 and chapter 6 verse 26. If I were to quiet a crying infant, I might sing him into a happier mood or rock him asleep. But when the child is fallen into the fire, the parent takes quite another course. For he, for will he not try to still him? Then with a trifle or song, I know, if we succeed not with you, you are lost. If we cannot get your consent to arise and to come away, you will perish for ever. No conversion, no salvation. I must get your good will, or leave you miserable. But here the difficulty of my work again occurs to me. O oh Lord, choose my stones out of the brook. First book of Samuel, chapter 17, verses 14 and 45. I come in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. I come forth like the stripling David against Goliath to wrestle and not with flesh or blood, but with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 This day let to me do thou carry it to the mark and make it sink not into the forehead but into the heart of the unconvicted sinner and smite him to the ground like Saul of Tarsus Acts chapter 9 verse 4 Some of you do not know what I mean by conversion and in vain shall I attempt to persuade you to that which you do not understand therefore for your sakes I will show what conversion is others cherish secret hopes of mercy though they continue as they were for them I must show the necessity of conversion others are likely to harden themselves with a vain conceit that they are converted already. To them I must show the marks of the unconverted. Others, because they feel no harm, fear none, and so sleep as they upon the top of a mast. To them I must show the misery of the unconverted. Others sit still because they do not see the way of escape. To them I must show the means of conversion and finally for the quickening of all I shall close with the motives to conversion 3 mistakes about conversion the devil has made many counterfeits of conversion and cheats one with this and another with that he has such craft and artifice in his mystery of deceits that, if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Now that I may cure the ruinous mistake of some who think that they are converted when they are not, as well as remove the troubles and fears of others who think that they are not converted when they are, I will show you the nature of conversion, both what it is not and what it is. We will begin with the negative. Conversion is not the taking upon us the profession of Christianity. Christianity is more than a name. If we will hear Paul, it does not lie in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. If to cease to be Jews or pagans and put on the Christian profession had been true conversion, as this is all that some would have us to understand by it, who better Christians than they of Sardis and Laodicea? These were all Christians by profession, they had a name to live, but because they had a name, they are condemned by Christ and threatened to be rejected. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. Are there not many that name the name of the Lord Jesus who do not depart from iniquity? 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 and profess that they know God but in works deny him Titus chapter 1 verse 16 so will God receive these as true converts what converts from sin while they live in sin it is a visible contradiction surely if the lamp of profession 
had been served, had served the turn, the foolish virgins would never have been cast out. Matthew chapter 25 verse 12. We find not only professing Christians, but preachers of Christ and wonder workers rejected because they were evil workers. Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 to 23. Conversion is not the putting on the badge of Christ in baptism. Ananias and Sapphira and Simon Magus were baptized as well as the rest. How many make a mistake here? deceiving and being deceived, dreaming that effectual grace is necessarily tied to the external administration of baptism, so that every baptized person is regenerated, not only sacramentally, but really and properly. Hence men fancy that because they were regenerated when they were baptized, they need no further work. But if this were so, then all that have been baptized must necessarily be saved, because the promise of pardon and salvation is made to conversion and regeneration. Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Matthew 19 verse 28. And indeed, were conversion and baptism the same, then men would do well to carry a certificate of baptism when they die. And upon sight of this there is no doubt of their admission into heaven. In short, if there is nothing more to conversion or regeneration than to be baptized, this would fly directly in the face of that scripture, Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 to 14, as well as a multitude of others. If this were true, we could no more say, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. For if all that are baptized are saved, the door is exceeding wide, and we shall henceforth say, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto life. If this is true, thousands may go in abreast, and we will no more teach that the righteous are scarcely saved, or that there is need of such a stair in taking the kingdom of heaven by violence and striving to enter in. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 18 and Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 Luke chapter 13 verse 24 Surely if the way be so easy as many suppose that little more is necessary than to be baptized and to cry out Lord have mercy we need not put ourselves to such seeking and knocking and wrestling as the word requires in order to salvation Again if this is true we shall no more say, few there be that find it. We will rather say, few there be that miss it. We shall no more say, that of the many that are called, few are chosen. Matthew tw chapter 22 verse 14. And that even of the professing Israel, but a remnant shall be saved. Romans chapter 9 verse 27. If this doctrine is true, we shall no more say with the disciples, who then can be saved, but rather, who then shall not be saved? Then if a man be baptized, though he is a fornicator, or a railer, or covetous, or a drunkard, yet he shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11 and chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. But some will reply, such as these, Though they received regenerating grace in baptism, are since fallen away and must be renewed again, or else they cannot be saved. I answer, 1. There is an infallible connection between regeneration and salvation, as we have already shown. 2. Then man must be born again, again, which carries a great deal of absurdity in its face. We might as well expect a man to be twice born in nature as twice born in grace but three and above all this grants the thing I contend for for whatever men do or pretend to receive in baptism if they are found afterwards to be grossly ignorant or profane or formal without the power of godliness they must still be born again John chapter 3 verse 7 or else be shut out of the kingdom of God so then they must have more to plead for themselves than their hopes of baptismal 
regeneration. Well, in this you see all are agreed, that be it more or less, that is, in receiving a baptism, if men are still evidently unsanctified, they must be renewed by a thorough and powerful change, or else they cannot escape the damnation of hell. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whether it be your baptism, or whatever else you pretend, I tell you, from the living God, that if any of you be a prayerless person, or a scoffer, or a lover of evil company, Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20, in a word, if you are not holy, strict, and a self-denying Christian, you cannot be saved. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, Matthew chapter 15 verse 14. Conversion does not lie in moral righteousness. This does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, and therefore cannot bring us into the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Paul, while unconverted, touching the righteousness which is by the law was blameless. Philippians chapter 3 verse 6. The Pharisee could say, I am no extortioner, adulterer, unjust, etc. Luke chapter 18 verse 11. You must have something more than all this to show, or else, however you may justify yourself, God will condemn you. I do not condemn morality, but I warn you not to rest in it. Piety includes morality, as Christianity includes humanity, and as grace does reason, but we must not divide the tables. Conversion does not consist in external conformity to the rules of piety. It is manifest that men may have a form of godliness without the power. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 Men may pray long. Matthew chapter 23 verse 14 May fast often. Luke chapter 18 verse 12 May hear gladly. Mark chapter 6 verse 20 and be very forward in the service of God, though costly and expensive. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11, and yet be strangers to conversion. They must have more to plead for themselves than that they go to church, give alms, make use of prayer, to prove themselves sound converts. There is no outward service, but a hypocrite may do it. Even to the giving of all his goods to feed the poor, and his body to be burned. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 3 Conversion is not the mere chaining up of corruption by education, human laws, or the force of affliction. It's too common and easy to mistake education for grace. But if this were enough, who was a better man than Jehoash? While Jehoiada lived, his uncle, he was very forward in God's service and calls upon him to repair the house of the Lord, 2 Kings chapter 12 verse 7. But here was nothing more than good education all this while. For when his good tutor was taken away, he appears to have been but a wolf chained up, and he falls into idolatry. In short, conversion does not consist in illumination or conviction or in a superficial change or partial reformation. An apostate may be an enlightened man. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 4 A felix may tremble under conviction. Acts chapter 24 verse 25 And a herod may do many things. Mark chapter 6 verse 20 it is one thing to have sin alarmed only by convictions, and another to have it crucified by converting grace. Many, because they have been troubled in conscience for their sins, think well of their case, miserably mistaking conviction for conversion. With these, Cain might have passed for a convert who ran up and down the world like a distracted man under the rage of a guilty conscience till he stifled it up 
with buildings and business. Others think because they've given up their riotous ways, are broken off from evil company or some particular lust, and are reduced to sobriety and civility, that they are now real converts. They forget that there is a vast difference between sanctification and civilization. They forget that many seek to enter into the kingdom of heaven and are not far from it, and arrive to be almost a Christian, and yet fall short at last. While conscience holds the whip over them, many will pray, hear, and read, and forbear their delightful sins. But no sooner is the lion asleep than they are at their sins again. Who more religious than the Jews when God's hand was upon them? Yet no sooner was the affliction over than they forgot God. You may have forsaken some troublesome sin and have escaped the gross pollutions of the world and yet in all this not have changed your carnal nature. You may take a crude mass of lead and mould it into the more comely proportion of a plant or then into the shape of an animal and then into the form and features of a man but all the time it remains lead. So a man may pass through various transmutations from ignorance to knowledge from profanity to civility then to a form of religion and all this time he is still carnal and unregenerate his nature remains unchanged hear then O sinners hear that you would live why should you willfully deceive yourselves and build your hopes upon the sand I know that he will find hard work that goes to pluck away your hopes. It cannot be but unpleasant to you, and truly it is not pleasing to me. I sat about it as a surgeon when about to cut off a mortified limb from his beloved friend, which of necessity he must do, though he do it with an aching heart. But understand me, beloved, I am only taking down the ruinous houses, which otherwise will speedily fall of itself and bury you in the ruins, that I may build it fair and strong and firm for ever. The hope of the wicked shall perish. Proverbs 11 verse 7 And had you not better, O sinner, let the word convince you now in time, and let go your false and self-deluded hopes, than have death open your eyes too late, and find yourselves in hell before you are aware. I would be a false and a faithless shepherd if I should not tell you that you who have built your hopes upon no better ground than these which we have before mentioned are yet in your sins. Let conscience speak. What have you to plead for yourselves? Is it that you wear Christ's livery, that you bear his name, that you are a member of the visible church? that you have knowledge in the points of religion, are civilized, perform religious duties, are just in your dealings, have been troubled in conscience for your sins. I tell you from the Lord, these pleas will never be accepted at God's bar. All this, though good in itself, will not prove you converted, and so will not suffice for your salvation. Oh, look to it, and resolve to turn speedily and entirely. Study your own hearts. Do not rest till God has made a thorough work with you, for you must be to other men, or else you are lost men. If these persons come short of conversion, what shall I say of the profane person? It may well be he will scarcely cast his eyes upon or lend an ear to this discourse. If there be any such reading or within hearing he must know from the Lord that made him that he is far from the kingdom of God may a man keep company with the wise virgins and yet be shut out and shall not a companion of fools the more be destroyed may a man be true in his dealings and yet not justified before God what then will become of you, O wretched man, whose conscience tells you that you are false in your trade and false to your word? If men may be enlightened and brought to the external performance of holy duties, 
and yet go down to perdition for resting in them and sitting down on this side of conversion, what will become of you, O oh, miserable families that live without God in the world? What will become of you, O oh, wretched sinners, with whom God is scarcely in your thoughts at all, that are so ignorant that you cannot pray, or so careless that you will not? O oh, repent and be converted, break off your sins by righteousness. A way to Christ for pardoning and renewing grace. Give up yourselves to Him, to walk with Him in holiness, or you will never see God. Oh, that you would heed the warnings of God. In His name I once more admonish you. Turn ye at my reproof. Forsake the foolish and live. Be sober, righteous and godly. Wash your hands, ye sinners, Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23 and verse, uh, chapter 9 verse 6. Titus chapter 2 verse 12. James chapter 4 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 16 to 70, 17. Uh, but if you will go on, you must die. Four, the nature of conversion. I do not leave you with your eyes half opened, like him who saw men walking as trees. The word is profitable for doctrine as well as for reproof. And therefore, having thus far conducted you by these shelves and rocks of so many dangerous mistakes, I would guide you at length into the haven of truth. Conversion, then, in short, lies in the thorough change both of the heart and life. I shall briefly describe it in its nature and causes. 1. The author of conversion is the Spirit of God, and therefore it is called the sanctification of the Spirit, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus chapter 3 verse 5. This does not exclude the other persons in the Trinity, for the Apostle teaches us to bless the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. And Christ is said to give repentance unto Israel. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. And is called the everlasting Father in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And we his seed and the children which God hath given him. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 13. Yet this work is principally ascribed to the Holy Ghost, and so we are said to be born of the Spirit. John chapter 3 verses 5 to 6. So then, conversion is a work above man's power. We are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1 13. Never think that you can convert yourself. If ever you will be savingly converted, you must despair of doing it in your own strength. It is a resurrection from the dead, Ephesians 2 verse 1. It is a new creation, Galatians 6 verse 15, Ephesians 2 verse 10. It is a work of absolute omnipotence, Ephesians 1 verse 19. Are not these things out of the reach of human power? If you have no more than you had, and by your first birth, a good nature, a meek and chaste temper, etc., you are a stranger to true conversion. This is a supernatural work. 2. The efficient cause of conversion is both internal and external. The internal cause is free grace alone not by works of righteousness which we have done, but of his mercy he saved us, and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus chapter 3 verse 5, of his own will he begat us, James chapter 1 verse 18. We are chosen and called unto sanctification, not because of it, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. God finds nothing in man to turn his heart, but enough to turn his stomach. 
he finds enough to provoke his loathing, but nothing to excite his love. Look back upon yourself, O Christian, reflect upon your swinish nature, your filthy swill, your once beloved mire. 2 Peter chapter 2 Behold your slime and corruption. Do not your own clothes abhor you? Job chapter 9 verse 31 How then should holiness and purity love you? Be astonished, O heavens, at this. Be moved, O earth. Who but must needs cry, Grace, grace? Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7 Hear and blush, you children of the Most High. O unthankful men, that free grace is no more in your mouths, in your thoughts, no more adored, admired, and commended by such as you. One would think that you should be doing nothing but praising and admiring God wherever you are. How can you forget such grace, or pass it over with a slight and formal mention? What but free grace could move God to love you, unless enmity could do it, unless deformity could do it. How affectionately Peter lifts up his hands, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who of abundant mercy hath begotten us again. How feelingly does Paul magnify the free mercy of God in it? God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. The external cause is the merit and intercession of the blessed Jesus. He hath obtained gifts for the rebellious. Psalm 68 verse 18. And through him it is that God worketh in us, which is well pleasing in his sight. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 21 Through him are all spiritual blessings bestowed upon us in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 He intercedes for the elect that believe not. John chapter 17 verse 20 Every convert is the fruit of his travail. Never was an infant born into the world with that difficulty which Christ endured for us. All the pains that he suffered on the cross were our birth pangs. He has made sanctification to us, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. He sanctified himself, that is, set apart himself as a sacrifice, that we might be sanctified. John chapter 17 verse 19. We are sanctified through the offering of his body once for all. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. It is nothing then but the merit and intercession of Christ that prevails with God to bestow upon us converting grace. If you are a new creature, if you know to whom you owe it, you know it is to Christ's pangs and prayers. The foal does not more naturally run after the dam or the suckling search for the breast than a believer goes to Jesus Christ. Where else should you go? If any in the world can show for your heart what Christ can, let them do it. Does Satan claim you? Does the world court you? Does sin sue for your heart? Why, were these things crucified for you? O Christian, love and serve your Lord while you have being. The instrument of conversion is personal and real. The personal instrument is the ministry. In Jesus Christ have I begotten you through the gospel, says Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. Christ's ministers are they that are sent to open men's eyes and turn them to God. Acts chapter 26 verse 18. O oh, unthankful world, little do you know what you are doing when you are persecuting the messengers of the Lord. These are they whose business it is under Christ to save you. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Isaiah 38 verse 23 These are the servants of the Most High God 
that shows the way of salvation. Acts chapter 16 verse 17. And do you requite them thus, O foolish and unwise? Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 6. O sons of ingratitude, against whom do you sport yourselves? These are the instruments that God uses to convert and to save sinners. And do you revile your physicians and throw your pilots overboard? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The real instrument is the word. We are begotten by the word of truth. It is this that enlightens the eye that converts the soul. Psalm 19 verses 7 and 8 that makes us wise unto salvation 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 this is the incorruptible seed by which we are born again 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 if we are washed it is by the word Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 if we are sanctified it is through the truth John chapter 17 verse 17 this generates faith and it regenerates us. Romans chapter 10 verse 17, James chapter 1 verse 18. O ye saints, how you should love the world, for by this you have been converted. You that have felt its renewing power, make much of it while you live, be ever thankful for it, tied about your neck, write it upon your hand, lay it up in your bosom. When you go, let it lead you. When you sleep, let it keep you. When you wake, let it talk to you. Proverbs chapter 6 verses 21 to 22. Say with the psalmist, I will never forget thy precepts, for that by them thou hast quickened me. Psalm 119 verse 93. You that are unconverted, read the word with diligence. Flock to where it is powerfully preached. Pray for the coming of the Spirit in the word. Come from your knees to the sermon, and go from the sermon to your knees. The sermon doesn't prosper because it's not watered by prayers and tears, nor covered by meditation. The final cause or end of conversion is man's salvation and God's glory. We are chosen through sanctification to salvation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, called that we might be glorified, Romans 8 and verse 30, but especially that God might be glorified, Isaiah chapter 60 verse 21, that we should show forth his praises, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, and be fruitful of good works, Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. O Christian, do not forget the end of your calling. Let your light shine, let your lamp burn, let your fruits be good, and many and in season, Psalm 1 verse 3. Let all your designs fall in with God's, that he may be magnified in you. Philippians 1 verse 20 The subject of conversion is the elect sinner, and that in all his parts and powers, members and mind, whom God predestinates, them only he calls. Romans 8 chapter, uh, verse 30 None are drawn to Christ by their calling, nor come to him by believing but his sheep those whom the father has given him John chapter 6 verses 37 and 44 effectual calling runs parallel with eternal election 2 Peter 1 verse 10 so you begin at the wrong end if you dispute about your election prove your conversion and then never doubt your election if you cannot yet prove it, set a present and a thorough turning. Whatever God's purposes be, they are secret. I am sure his promises are plain. How desperately do rebels argue? If I am elected, I shall be saved, do what I will. If not, I shall be damned, do what I can. 
perverse sinner. Will you begin where you should end? Is not the word before you which saith, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out? If you mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Believe and be saved. Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Romans chapter 8 verse 13, Acts chapter 16 verse 31. What, what can be plainer? Do not stand still disputing about your election, but set you to repenting and believing. Cry to God for converting grace. Reveal things belong to you, in these busy yourself. It is just as one well said, that they who will not feed on the plain food of the word should be choked with the bones. Whatever God's purposes may be, I am sure that his promises are true. Whatever the decrees of heaven may be, I am sure that if I repent and believe, I shall be saved. And that if I do not repent, I shall be damned. Is not this plain ground for you? And will you yet run upon the rocks? More particularly, this change of conversion extends to the whole man. A carnal man may have some shreds of good morality, but he is never good throughout the whole cloth. Conversion is not a repairing of an old building, but it takes all down and erects a new structure. It's not the sowing of a patch of holiness, but with the true convert, holiness is woven into all of his powers, principles and practice. The sincere Christian is quite a new fabric, from the foundation up to the top stone. He is a new man, a new creature, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 Conversion is a deep work, it is a heart work. It makes a new man in a new world. It extends to the whole man, to the mind, to the members, to the motions of the whole life. The mind. Conversion turns the balance of the judgment, so that God and his glory outweigh all carnal and worldly interests. It opens the eye of the mind and makes the scales of its native ignorance fall off, and turns men from darkness to light. The man that before so no danger in his condition now concludes himself lost and forever undone. Acts chapter 2 verse 37 Except renewed by the power of grace. He that formerly thought there was little hurt in sin now comes to see it to be the chief of evils. He sees the unreasonableness, the unrighteousness, the deformity and the filthiness of sin so that he is affrighted with it, loathes it, dreads it, flees from it, and even abhors himself because of it. Romans chapter 7 verse 15, Job chapter 42 verse 6, Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 31. He that could see little sin in himself and could find no matter for confession, now sees the rottenness of his heart the desperate and deep pollution of his whole nature. He cries, Unclean! Unclean! Lord, purge me with hyssop! Wash me thoroughly! Create in me a clean heart! He sees himself altogether filthy, corrupt, both root and branch. Psalm 14 verse 3 Matthew 7 verses 17 to 18 He writes, unclean upon all his parts and powers and performances. Isaiah 46 verse 6, Romans 7 verse 18. He discovers the filthy corners that he was never aware of, and sees the blasphemy, the theft, the murder, the adultery that is in his heart, of which before he was ignorant. Hitherto he saw no form or comeliness in Christ, no beauty that he should desire him. Now he finds the hidden treasure, and will sell all to buy that field. Christ is the pearl he seeks. Now, according to this new light, the man is of another mind, another judgment, than he was before. Now God is all with him. He has none under heaven or in earth like him, who truly prefers him before all the world. His favour is his life, 
the light of his countenance is more than corn and wine and oil the good that he formerly inquired after and set his heart upon Psalm 4 verses 6 to 7 a hypocrite may come to yield a general assent that God is the chief good indeed the wiser heathens some few of them have at least stumbled upon this truth but no hypocrite comes so far as to look upon God as the most desirable and suitable good to him and thereupon to acquiesce in him this is the convert's voice the Lord is my portion saith the soul whom have I in heaven but thee and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee God is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever Lamentations chapter 3 verse 24 Psalm 73 verses 25 to 26 God in conversion turns the bias of the will both as to means and end the intentions of the will are altered now the man has new ends and new designs he now intends God above all and desires and designs nothing in all the world so much as that Christ may be magnified in him he counts himself more happy in this than in all that the earth could yield that he is serviceable to Christ and brings him glory this is the mark he aims at that the name of Jesus may be great in the world reader do you read this without asking yourself whether it is thus with you pause a while and ex examine yourself the choice is also changed he pitches upon God as his blessedness and upon Christ and holiness as means to bring him to God he chooses Jesus for his Lord he is not merely forced to Christ by the storm nor does he take to Christ for bare necessity but he comes freely his choice is not made in a fright as with the terrified conscience or the dying sinner that will seemingly, seemingly do anything for Christ but he's only trying to take Christ rather than hell he deliberately resolves that Christ is his best choice and would rather have him than all the good of this world might he enjoy it while he would Philippians chapter 1 verse 23 again he takes holiness for his path he does not out of mere necessity submit to it but he likes it he loves it I have chosen the way of thy precepts Psalm 119 verse 173 he takes God's testimonies not as his bondage but as his heritage yea heritage for ever he counts them not his burden but his bliss not his cords but his cordials first epistle of John verse 3 Psalm 119 verses 14 16 and 47 he does not only bear but he takes up Christ's yoke he takes not holiness as the stomach takes some loathed medicine which a man would rather take than die but as the hungry man does his most beloved food no time passes so sweetly with him when he is himself as that which he spends in the exercises of holiness these are both his aliment and element the desire of his eyes and the joy of his heart put it to your consciences whether you are that man O oh, happy man if this be your case but see that you are thorough and impartial in your search conversion turns the bent of the affections these all run in a new channel the Jordan is now driven back and the water runs upward against its natural course Christ is his hope this is his prize here his eye is here his heart he is content to cast all overboard as the merchant in the storm about to perish so that he may just keep his jewel the first is of his desires he is not after gold but after grace he hungers for it he seeks it as silver he digs for it as for hid treasure he had rather be gracious than great 
He'd rather be the holiest man on earth than the most learned, the most famous, the most prosperous. Well, carnal, he said, oh, if I were but in great esteem, rolling in wealth, or swimming in pleasures, if my debts were paid, and I and mine were provided for, then I would be a happy man. But now the tune is changed. Oh, says the convert, if I had but my corruption subdued, if I had such a measure of grace and fellowship with God, though I were poor and despised, I should not care, I should account myself a blessed man. Reader, is this the language of your soul? His joys are changed. He rejoices in the way of God's testimonies as much as in all riches. He delights in the law of the Lord, in which once he had little savour. He has no such joy as in the thought of Christ, the enjoyment of his company, the prosperity of his people. His cares are quite altered. He was once set for the world, and any scrap of spare time was enough for his soul. Now his cry is, What must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16 verse 30 His great concern is how to secure his soul. Oh, how he would bless you if you could put him out of doubt concerning this. His fears are not so much of suffering as of sinning. Once he was afraid of nothing so much as the loss of his estate or reputation, nothing sounded so terrible to him as pain or poverty or disgrace. Now these are little to him in comparison with God's dishonour or displeasure. How warily does he walk, lest he should tread upon a snare. He looks in front and behind, he has his eye upon his heart, and is often casting it over his shoulder, lest he should be overtaken by some sin. It kills his heart to think of losing God's favour. This he dreads as his only undoing. No such thought pains him so much as that of parting with Christ. His love runs in a new course. My love was crucified, says Ignatius, that is my Christ. This is my beloved, saith the spouse. Canticles chapter 5 verse 16. How often does Augustine pour his love upon Christ? He can find no words sweet enough. Let me see thee, O light of mine eyes. Come, O thou joy of my spirit. Let me behold thee, O gladness of my heart. Let me love thee, O life of my soul. Appear unto me, O oh my great delight, my sweet comfort. O oh my God, my life, and the whole glory of my soul, let me find thee, O oh desire of my heart. Let me hold thee, O oh love of my soul. Let me embrace thee, O oh heavenly bridegroom. Let me possess thee. His sorrows have now a new vent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. The view of his sins, the sight of Christ crucified, that could scarcely stir him before, now how much do they affect his heart? His hatred boils, his anger burns against sin. He has no patience with him himself. He calls himself a fool and beast and thinks any name too good for him when his indignation is stirred up against his sin. Psalm 70 verse 3 and Proverbs chapter 30 verse 2. He could once wallow in it with much pleasure. Now he loathes the thought of returning to it as much as licking up the filthiest vomit. Commune then with your own heart and attend to the general current of your affections whether they be towards God in Christ above all other concerns. Indeed, sudden and strong motions of the affections are often found in hypocrites, especially where the natural temperament is warm. And, contrarywise, the sanctified themselves are often without conscience stirring of the affections, where the temperament is more slow, dry, and dull. 
The great inquiry is whether the judgment and will are steadily determined for God above all other good, real, or apparent. If so, and if the affections do sincerely follow their choice and conduct, so it be not so strongly and feelingly as it is to be desired, there is no doubt but the change is saving. The Members these that before were the instruments of sin are now become the holy utensils of Christ's living temple. He that before dishonored his body now possesses his vessel in sanctification and honor, in temperance, chastity and sobriety, and dedicates it to the Lord. The eye that was once a wandering eye, a wanton eye, a haughty, a covetous eye, is now employed as Mary's in weeping over its sins, in beholding God in his works, in reading his word, or in looking for objects of mercy and opportunities for his service. The ear that was once open to Satan's call and did relish nothing so much as filthy or at least frothy talk and the laughter of fools is now bored to the door of Christ's house and open to his disciples. It says, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. It waits for his word as the rain, and relishes them more than the appointed food. Job chapter 23 verse 12 And more than honey in the honeycomb. Psalm 19 verse 10 The head, that was full of worldly designs, is now filled with other matters, and set on the study of God's will, and the man employs his head, and not so much about his gain as about his duty. The thoughts and cares that fill his head are principally how he may please God and flee from sin. His heart, that was a sty of filthy lusts, is now become an altar of incense where the fire of divine love is ever kept burning and from which the daily sacrifice of prayer and praise and the sweet incense of holy desires, ejaculations and prayers are continually ascending. The mouth is become a well of life. His tongue is choice silver, and his lips feed many. Now the salt of grace has seasoned his speech, has eaten out the corruption, Colossians chapter 4 verse 6, and cleansed the man from his filthy conversation, flattery, boasting, railing, lying, swearing, backbiting, and once came like flashing flashes proceeding from hell that was in his heart. James chapter 3 verse 6 That throat that once was an open sepulchre now sends forth the sweet breath of prayer and of holy discourse. And the man speaks with another tongue in the language of Canaan, and is never so well as when talking of God and of Christ and of the matters of another world. His mouth brings forth wisdom. His tongue is become the silver trumpet of his maker's praise, his glory, and the best member that he has. Now here you will find the hypocrite sadly deficient. He speaks, it may be, like an angel, but he has a covetous eye, or the gain of unrighteousness is in his hand. His hand is white, but his heart is full of rottenness. Matthew chapter 23 verse 27 Full of unmortified cares, a very oven of lust, a shop to pride, a seat of malice. It may be, with Nebuchadnezzar's image, he has a golden head, a great deal of knowledge, but he has feet of clay. His affections are worldly, he minds earthly things, and his way and walk are sensual and carnal. The work is not thorough with him. The life and practice. The new man takes a new course, Ephesians 2 verses 2 to 3. His conversation is in heaven, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. No sooner does Christ call by effectual grace, but he straightway becomes a follower of him follower of him. When God has given a new heart and written his law in his mind, he henceforth walks in his statutes and keeps his judgments. 
though sin may dwell in him, truly a wearisome and unwelcome guest, yet it has no more dominion over him. He has his fruit unto holiness, and he makes his, he, though he makes many a blot, yet the law and life of Jesus is what he looks to as his pattern, and he has an unfeigned respect to all God's commandments. He, make, he makes conscience even of little sins and of little duties. His very infirmities, which he cannot help, though he would, are his soul's burden, and are like the dust in a man's eye, which though it be little, is not a little troublesome. O oh man, do you read this, and never stop to examine yourself? The sincere convert is not one man at church and another man at home. He is not a saint on his knees, and a cheat in his shop. He will not tithe mint and cumin, and neglect mercy and judgment, and the weightier matters of the law. He doesn't pretend piety, and neglect morality. When he turns from all his sins and keeps all God's statutes, though not perfectly, yet in desire and endeavour, yet sincerely, not allowing himself in the breach of any. Now he delights in the word, and sets himself to prayer, and opens his hand and draws out his soul to the hungry. He breaks off his sins by righteousness, and his iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Daniel chapter 4 verse 27 He has a good conscience, willing in all things to live honestly. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18 And to keep without offence towards God and men. Here again you find the unsoundness of many that take themselves to be good Christians. They are partial in the law. Malachi chapter 2 verse 19 and take up the cheap and the easy duties of religion, but they do not go thoroughly in the work. They are like a, ki a cake half-baked and half-raw. It may be you find them exact in their words, punctual in their dealings, but then they do not exercise themselves unto godliness, and as for examining themselves and governing their hearts, to this they are strangers. You may see them, duly at church, but follow them to their families, and there you will see little but what is of the world indeed. Or if they have family duties, follow them into their closets, and there you shall find their souls are but little looked after. It may be that they seem religious, but they do not bridle their tongues, and so all their religion is vain. James chapter 1 verse 26 it may be they come to closet and family prayer, but then follow them to their shops, and there you will find them in the habit of lying, or in some fashionable way of deceit. Thus the hypocrite is not thorough in his obedience. The objects from which we turn in conversion are sin, Satan, the world, and our own righteousness. We turn from sin. When a man is converted, he is forever at enmity with sin. With all sin, but most of all with his own sins, especially his own bosom sin. Sin is now the object of his indignation. His sin swells his sorrows. It is sin that pierces him and wounds him. He feels it like a thorn in his side, like a prick in his eyes. He groans and struggles under it, and not formally, but feelingly cries out, O oh, wretched man! He is not impatient of any burden so much as this of his sin. If God should give him choice, he would choose any affliction so that he might be rid of sin. He feels it like the cutting gravel in his shoes, pricking and paining him as he goes along. Before conversion, he had light thoughts of sin. He cherished it in his bosom, as Uriah his lamb. He nourished it up. It grew up together with him. He did eat as it were of his meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was to him as a daughter. But 
When God opens his eyes by conversion, he throws it away with abhorrence, as a man would a loathsome toad, which in the dark he had hugged fast to his bosom, as though it had been some pretty and harmless bird. When a man is savingly changed, he is deeply convinced not only of the danger, but of the defilement of sin, and oh, how earnest he is with God to be purified. He loathes himself for his sins. He runs to Christ and casts himself into the fountain set open for him and for uncleanness. If he fall, what a stare there is till he gets all clean again. He has no rest till he flees to the word and washes and rubs and rinses in its infinite fountain, laboring to cleanse himself from all filthiness both of flesh and of spirit. The sound convert is heartily engaged against sin. He struggles with it, he wars against it, he is too often foiled, but he will never yield the cause, nor lay down his weapons while he has breath in his body. He will make no peace, he will give no quarter. He can forgive his other enemies, he can pity them and pray for them, but here he is implacable, here he is set upon extermination. He hunts it, as it were, for the precious life. His eye shall not pity, his hand shall not spare, though it be a right hand or a right eye. Be it gainful sin, most delightful to his nature, or the uh, support of his esteem with worldly friends, Yet he will rather throw his gain down in the gutter, see his credit fall, or the flower of his pleasure wither in his hand, than he will allow himself to be any more in a way of known sin. He will grant no indulgence, he will give no toleration. He draws upon sin whenever he meets it, and frowns upon it with this unwelcome salute, Have I found thee, O mine enemy? Reader, has conscience been at work while thou hast been looking upon these lines? Have you pondered these things in your heart? Have you searched the book within to see if these things be so? If not, read it again and make your conscience speak whether it is or is not thus with you. Have you crucified your flesh with its affections and lusts and not only confessed but forsaken your sins all sin in your fervent desires and the ordinary practice of every deliberate and willful sin in your life. If not, you are yet unconverted. Does not conscience fly in your face as you read and tell you that you live in a way of lying to your advantage? That you use deceit in your calling? That there is in some way a secret wantonness that you live in? Why then, do not deceive yourself. Thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Does your unbridled tongue, your indulgence of appetite, your wicked company, your neglect of prayer, of reading and of hearing the word, now witness against you and say, We are your works and we will follow you. Or, if I have not hit you right, does not the monitor within tell you there is such and such a way that you know to be evil, that yet for some carnal respect you tolerate yourself in? If this be the case, you are to this day unregenerate and must be changed or condemned. We turn from Satan. Conversion binds the strong man, spoils his armour, casts out his goods, turns men from the power of Satan unto God. Before, the devil could no sooner hold up his finger to the sinner to call him to his wicked company, sinful games, and filthy delights, but immediately he rose and followed, as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, as the bird that hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 22 to 23. No sooner could Satan bid him lie, but immediately he had it on his tongue. 
No sooner could Satan offer a wanton object, but he was stung with lust. If the devil says, away with these family duties, be sure they will be rarely performed in that house. If the devil says, away with this strictness, this preciseness, he will keep far enough from it. If he tells him, there is no need of secret duties, he will go from day to day and scarcely ever perform them. But after he is converted, he serves another master and takes quite another course. He goes and comes at Christ's bidding. Satan may sometimes catch his foot in a trap, but he will no longer be a willing captive. He watches against the snares and baits of Satan and studies to be acquainted with his devices. He is very suspicious of his plots and is very jealous in what comes across him lest Satan should have some design upon him. He wrestles against principalities and powers. He entertains the messenger of Satan as men do the messengers of death. He keeps his eye upon his enemy and watches in his duties lest Satan should get an advantage. We turn from the world. Before a man has true faith, he was overcome by the world. He either bows down to mammon, or idolizes his reputation, or is a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Here is the root of man's misery by the fall. He is turned aside to the creature, and gives that esteem and confidence and affection. He gives it to the creature that which is due to God. O miserable man, what a deformed monster has sin made you? God made you a little lower than the angels, and sin has made you little better than the devils, a monster that has his head where his uh, heart and where his feet should be. His feet are kicking against heaven, everything is out of its due place. The will that was formed to serve you has come to rule you. The deceitful harlot has bewitched you with her enchantments and made you bow down and serve her. But converting grace sets all in order again and puts God on his throne and the world as his footstool. Christ in the heart and the world under the feet. I am crucified to the world and the world to me. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 Before this change all the cry was who will show us any that is worldly good? But now he prays, Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon me, and take the corn and the wine, whosoever will. Psalm 4, verses 6 to 7. Before his heart's delight and content were in the world, and the song was, Soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. But now all this has withered. There is no comeliness that we should desire it. And he tunes up with the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance. The lions are fallen to me in fair places. I have a goodly heritage. Nothing else can make him content. He has written vanity and vexation upon all his worldly enjoyments and loss and dung upon all human excellences. He has life and immortality now in his pursuit. He pants for grace and glory, and has a crown incorruptible in view. His heart is set in him to seek the Lord. He seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and religion is no longer a casual matter with him, but is his main concern. Before, the world had the sway with him. He could do more for gain than godliness, more to please his friend or his flesh than the God who made him. God must stand by till the world was first served. But now all must stand by. He hates father and mother and life and all in comparison with Christ. Well then, pause a little and look within. Does not this concern you? You pretend to be for Christ. But does not the world sway you? Do you not take more delight and content in this world than in him? Do you not find yourself more at ease when the world is in your mind and you are surrounded with carnal delights than when retired to prayer and meditation in your room 
or attending upon God's word and worship. There is no surer evidence of an unconverted state than to have the things of the world uppermost in our aim, love and estimation. With the sound convert, Christ has the supremacy. How dear is his name to him! How precious is his favour! The name of Jesus is engraved on his heart. Honour is but air, and laughter but madness, and mammon is fallen like Dagon before the ark, with hands and head broken off on the threshold, when once Christ is savingly revealed. Here is the pearl of great price to the true convert. Here is his treasure. Here is his hope. This is his glory. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Oh, it is sweeter to him to be able to say, Christ is mine, than if he could say, The kingdom is mine, the Indies are mine. We turn from our own righteousness. Before conversion, man seeks to cover himself with his own fig leaves, and make himself whole with his own duties. He is apt to trust in himself and set up his own righteousness, and to reckon his counters for gold, and not to submit to the righteousness of God. But conversion changes his mind. Now he counts his own righteousness as filthy rags. He casts it off as a man would the verminous tatters of a nasty beggar. Now he is brought to poverty of spirit, complains of and condemns himself, and all his inventory is poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. He sees a world of iniquity in his holy things, and his once idolized righteousness but filth and loss, and would not for a thousand worlds be found in it. Now he begins to set a high price upon Christ's righteousness. He sees the need of Christ in every duty to justify his person and sanctify his performances. He cannot live without him. He cannot pray without him. Christ must go with him or else he cannot come into the presence of God. He leans upon Christ and bows himself in the house of his God. He sets himself down for a lost, undone man without him. His life is hidden in Christ, as the root of a tree spreads in the earth for stability and nourishment. Before, the news of Christ was a stale and tasteless thing, but now, how sweet is Christ! Augustine could not relish his once admired Cicero, because he could not find in his writings the name of Christ. How emphatically he cries, O oh, most sweet, most loving, most kind, most dear, most precious, most desired, most lovely, most fair. All in a breath when he speaks of and to Christ. In a word, the voice of the convert is, with that of the martyr, none but Christ. The object to which we turn in conversion is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, whom the true convert takes as his all-sufficient and eternal blessedness. A man is never truly sanctified till his heart be truly set upon God above all things, as his portion and chief good. These are the natural breathings of a believer's heart. Thou art my portion. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. My expectation is from him. He only is my rock and the salvation of my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Psalm 119 verse 57, Psalm 34 verse 2, and Psalm 42. Would you be certain whether you are converted or not? Now let your soul and all that is within you attend. Have you taken God for your happiness? Where does the desire of your heart lie? What is the source of your greatest satisfaction? Come then and with Abraham lift up your eyes eastward and westward and northward and southward and look around you. 
What is it that you would have in heaven or on earth to make you happy? If God should give you the choice, as he did to Solomon, or should say to you, as Ahasuerus did to Esther, What is thy petition, and what is thy request, and it shall be granted thee? What would you ask? Go into the gardens of pleasure, and gather all the fragrant flowers there. Would these satisfy you? Go to the treasures of mammon. Suppose you may carry away as much as you desire. Go to the towers, to the trophies of honour. What do you think of being a man of renown, and having a name like the name of the great men of the earth? Would any of these, would all of these, satisfy you, and make you count yourself happy? If so, then certainly you are carnal and unconverted. If not, go further, wade into the divine excellences, and store up his mercies, the hiding of his power, the depths unfathomable of his all-sufficiency. Does this suit you best and please you most? Do you say, it is good to be here? We, here will I pitch, here will I live and die? Will you let all the world go rather than this? Then it is well between God and you. Happy art thou, O man, happy, happy art thou that ever thou wast born. If God can make you happy, you must be happy, for you have taken the Lord to be your God. Did you say to Christ, as he to us, Thy Father shall be my Father, and thy God my God? Here is the turning point. A sound convert never takes up his rest in God, but converting grace does the work, and so cures the fatal misery of the fall by turning the heart from its idol to the living God. Now the soul says, Lord, whither shall I go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Here he centers, here he settles. This is the entrance of heaven to him. He sees his interest in God. When he discovers this, he says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Psalm 116, verse 7 and he is ever ready to breathe out Simeon's song, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. And says with Jacob, when his old heart revive, received the welcome tidings, it is enough. Genesis 45 verse 28 When he sees he has a God in covenant to go to, this is all his salvation and all his desire. Second Samuel 23 verse 5 Is this the case with you? Have you experienced this? If so, then blessed thou art of the Lord. God has been at work with you. He has laid hold of your heart by the power of converting grace or else you could never have done this. More particularly in conversion we turn to Christ the only mediator between God and man 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 His work is to bring us to God 1 Peter 3 verse 18 He is the way to the Father John 14 verse 6 The only plank on which we may escape The only door by which we may enter John 10 verse 9 Conversion brings the soul to Christ To accept him as the only means of life as the only way, as the only name given under heaven. He does not look for salvation in any other but him. He throws himself on Christ alone. Here, says the convinced sinner, I will venture, and if I perish, I perish. If I die, I will die here. But Lord, do not let me perish under the eye of thy mercy. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Here I will throw myself, if thou slay me, I will not go from thy door. Thus the poor soul ventures on Christ, and resolvedly adheres to him. Before conversion the man made light of Christ, minded his farm, friends, merchandise, more than Christ. Now Christ is 
is to him as his necessary food, as his daily bread, the life of his heart, the staff of his life. His great desire is that Christ may be magnified in him. His heart once said, as they to the spouse, What is thy beloved more than another? Canticles 5 verse 9 He found more sweetness in his merry company, wicked games, earthly delights than in Christ. He took religion for a fancy and the talk of great enjoyments for an idle dream. But now to him to live is Christ. He sets light by all that he accounted precious for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. All of Christ is accepted by the sincere convert. He loves not only the wages but the work of Christ, not only the benefits but the burden of Christ. He is willing not only to tread out the corn but to draw under the yoke. He takes up the commands of Christ, yes the cross of Christ. The unsound convert takes Christ by halves. He is all for the salvation of Christ, but he is not for sanctification. He is for the privileges, but he does not appropriate the person of Christ. He divides the offices and the benefits of Christ. This is an error in the foundation. Whoever loves life, let him beware here. It is an undoing mistake, of which you have often been warned, and yet none is more common. Jesus is a sweet name, but men do not love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. They will not have him as God offers to be a prince and a saviour. Acts chapter 5 verse 31 They divide what God has joined, the king and the priest. They will not accept the salvation of Christ as he intends it. They divide it here. Every man's vote is for salvation from suffering, but they do not desire to be saved from sinning. They would have their life saved, but they would still have their lusts. Indeed, many divide here again. They would be content to have some of their sins destroyed, but they cannot leave the lap of Delilah or divorce that beloved Herodias. They cannot be cruel to the right eye or the right hand. Oh, be infinitely careful here. Your soul depends upon it. The sound convert takes a whole Christ and takes him for all intents and purposes, without exception, without limitation, without reserve. He is willing to have Christ upon any terms, he is willing to have the dominion of Christ as well as deliverance by Christ. He says with Paul, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Anything, Lord. He sends the blank for Christ to set down his own conditions. In conversion we turn to the laws, ordinances and ways of Christ. The heart that once was set against these and could not endure the strictness of these bonds, the severity of these ways, now falls in love with them and chooses them as a rule and guide for ever. Four things I observe God works in every sound convert with reference to the laws and ways of Christ by which you may come to know your state if you will be faithful to your own souls. Therefore keep your eyes upon your hearts as you go along. The judgment is brought to approve of them and to subscribe of them as most righteous and most reasonable. The mind is brought to like the ways of God and the corrupt prejudices that were once against them as unreasonable and intolerable are now removed. The man assents to them all as holy just and good Romans chapter 7 verse 12 how is David taken up with the excellences of God's law how does he expiate upon the praises both from their inherent qualities and admirable effects Psalm 19 verses 8 to 10 etc there is a twofold judgment of the understanding the absolute and the comparative 
the absolute judgment is when a man thinks such a course is best in general, but not for him, or not under his present circumstances. Now a godly man's judgment is for the ways of God, and that not only the absolute, but comparative judgment. He thinks them not only the best in general, but the best for him. He looks upon the rules of, of religion not only as tolerable, but desirable, yea, more desirable than gold, fine gold, yea, much fine gold. His judgment is fully determined that it is best to be holy, that it is best to be strict, that it is in itself the most eligible course, and that it is for him the wisest and most rational, rational and desirable choice. Hear the godly man's judgment. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Psalm 119 verses 127 to 128. Mark, he approves of all that God requires, and disapproves of all that he forbids. Righteous, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth for ever. Psalm 119 See how readily and fully he subscribes. He declares his assent and consent to it, and all and everything contained therein. The desire of the heart is to know the whole mind of Christ. He would not have one sin undiscovered, nor be ignorant of one duty required. It is the natural and earnest breathing of a sanctified heart. Lord, if there be any wickedness in me, do thou reveal it. What I know not, teach thou me. And if I have done iniquity, I will do it no more. The unsound convert is willingly ignorant. He does not love to come to the light. He is willing to keep such and such a sin, and therefore is loath to know if it be a sin, and will not let in the light at that window. Now the gracious heart is willing to know the whole latitude and compass of his Maker's law. He receives with all acceptation the word which convinces him of any duty that he knew not, or minded not before, or which uncovers any sin that lay hid before. The free and resolved choice of the will is for the ways of Christ, before all the pleasures of sin and prosperities of the world. His consent is not exhorted by some extremity of anguish, nor is it only a sudden and hasty resolve, but he is deliberately purposed and comes freely to this choice. True, the flesh will rebel, yet the prevailing part of his will is for Christ's laws and government, so that he takes them up uh, not as a toil or burden, but as his bliss. While the unsanctified goes in Christ's ways, as in chains and fetters, the true convert does it heartily, and counts Christ's laws his liberty. He delights in the beauties of holiness, and has this inseparable mark. He had rather, if he might have his choice, live a strictly holy life, than the most prosperous, prosperous and flourishing worldly life. There went with Saul a band of men, whose hearts God had touched. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 26 when God touches the hearts of his chosen, they presently follow Christ, and though drawn, do freely run after him, and willingly devote themselves to the service of the Lord, seeking him with their whole desire. Fear has its issues, but this is not the mainspring or motion of a sanctified heart. Christ does not control his subjects by force, but is the king of a willing people. They are, through his grace, freely devoted to his service. They serve out of choice, not as slaves, but as a son or a spouse, from a spring of love and a loyal mind. 
In a word, the laws of Christ are the convert's love, delight and continual study. The bent of his course is directed to keep God's statutes. It is the daily care of his life to walk with God. He seeks great things. He has noble designs, though he fall too short. He aims at nothing less than perfection. He desires it. He reaches after it. He would not rest in any degree of grace till he were quite, quite rid of sin and perfected in holiness. Philippians chapter 3 verses 11 to 14 here the hypocrite's rottenness may be discovered. He desires holiness, as one well said, only as a bridge to heaven, and inquires earnestly what is the least that will serve his turn. And if he can get but so much as may bring him to heaven, this is all he cares for. But the sound convert desires holiness for holiness's sake, and not merely for heaven's sake. He would not be satisfied with so much as might save him from hell, but desires the highest degree. Yet desires are not enough. What is your way and your course? Are the drift and scope of your life altered? Is holiness your pursuit and religion your business? If not, you fall short of sound conversion. And this, this which we have described, the conversion that is of absolute necessity to salvation, then be informed that straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to, unto life, and there are few that find it, that there is need of divine power savingly to convert a sinner to Jesus Christ. Again, be exhorted, O man, to examine thyself. What does conscience say? Does it begin to accuse? Does it not pierce you as you go? Is this your judgment and this your choice and this your way that we have described? If so, then all is well. But does your heart condemn you and tell you of a certain sin which you, li you are living in against your conscience? Does it not tell you that there is such and such a secret way of wickedness that you wish to pursue? Such and such a duty that you make no conscience of? Does not conscience carry you to your closet and tell you how seldom prayer and reading were performed there? Does it not carry you into your family and show you the charge of God and the souls of your children that are neglected there? Does not conscience lead you to your shop, your trade, and tell you of some iniquity there? Does it not carry you to the public house or to the private club and blame you for those loose companies you have kept there, the precious time you have misspent there, the talents that you have wasted there? Does it not carry you into your secret chamber and read there your condemnation? O oh, conscience, do your duty. In the name of the living God I command you, discharge your office. Lay hold upon this sinner, fall upon him, arrest him, apprehend him, undeceive him. What? Will you flatter and soothe him while he lives in sin? Awake, O conscience! What meanest thou, O sleeper? What? Have you no reproof in your mouth? What? Shall this soul die in his careless neglect of God and of eternity? And you altogether hold your peace? What? Shall he go on still in his trespasses, and yet have peace? Oh, rouse yourself, do your work. Now let the preacher in your bosom speak. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Let not the blood of his soul be required at your hands. 5. The Necessity of conversion. It may be you are ready to say, what does this stare mean? And are, are apt to wonder why I follow you with such earnestness, still ringing the same lesson in your ears, that you should repent and be converted. But I must say to you, as Ruth to Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee. Were it a matter of indifference, might you be saved as you are, I would gladly let you alone. 
But would you not have me concerned for you when I see you ready to perish? As the Lord liveth before whom I am, I have not the least hope of seeing your face in heaven except you be converted. I utterly despair of your salvation except you will be prevailed with thoroughly to turn and give yourself to God in holiness and newness of life. Has God said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? And yet do you wonder why your ministers labor so earnestly for you? Do you think it strange that I am in earnest with you to follow after holiness and long to see the image of God upon you? Never did any, nor shall any, enter into heaven by any other way than this. The conversion described is not a high attainment of some advanced Christians, but every soul that is saved undergoes this change. It was the saying of the noble Roman when he was hasting with corn to the city in the famine, and the mariners were loath to set sail for foul weather. It is necessary for us to sail. It is not necessary for us to live. What is it that you count necessary? Is your bread necessary? Is your breath necessary? Your conversion is much more necessary. Indeed this is one thing, the, the one thing, which is necessary. Your possessions are not necessary. You may sell all for the pearl of great price and yet be a gainer by the purchase. Your life is not necessary. You may part with it for Christ to infinite advantage. Your reputation is not necessary. You may be reproached for the name of Christ and yet be happy. Yes, you may be much more happy in reproach than in repute. But your conversion is necessary. Your salvation depends upon it. And is it not needful in so important a matter to take care? On this one point depends your making or marring to all eternity. Shall I more particularly show the necessity of conversion in five things? Without conversion your being is in vain. Is it not a pity that you should be good for nothing? an unprofitable burden on the earth, a mere wart on the body of the universe. Thus you are, while unconverted, for you cannot answer the end of your being. Is it not for the divine pleasure that you are and were created? Did not God make you for himself? Are you a man, and have you reason? Then think how you came into being, and why you exist. Behold God's worksmanship in your body and ask for yourself, for what purpose did God rear this fabric? Consider the noble faculties of your heaven-born soul. To what end did God bestow these excellencies? Was it for no other end than that you should please yourself and gratify your senses? Did God send men into the world only like swallows to gather a few sticks and mud and build their nests and rear their young, and then fall away. The very heathen could see farther than this. Are you so fearfully and wonderfully made? And do you not yet reason with yourself, surely this must be for some noble and exalted end? O oh man, set your reason a little in the chair. Is it not a pity that such a goodly fabric should be raised in vain? Verily, it, it is in vain except you are in God, it were better you had no being at all than not to be in Him. Would you serve your end? You must repent and be converted. Without this you are to no purpose, indeed to a bad purpose. But to no purpose, unconverted man is like a choice instrument that has every string broken or out of tune. The spirit of the living God must repair and tune it by the grace of regeneration and sweetly move it by the power of actuating grace. Or else your prayers will be but howlings and all your service will make no music in the ears of the Most High. All your powers and faculties are so corrupt 
in your natural state that except you be purged from dead works you cannot serve the living God an unsanctified man cannot work the work of God he has no skill in it he is altogether as unskillful in the work as in the word of righteousness there are great mysteries in the practice as well as the principles of godliness now the unregenerate do not know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven you may as well expect him to read that never learn the alphabet or look for goodly music on a lute from one that never set his hand to an instrument as that a natural man should do the Lord any pleasing service he must first be taught of God John 6 verse 45 taught to pray Luke 11 verse 1 taught to profit Isaiah 48 verse 17 taught to walk Hosea 11 verse 3 or else he will be utterly at a loss he has no strength for it how weak is his heart Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 30 he is soon tired the Sabbath what a weariness is in it Malachi 1 verse 13 he is yet without strength Romans 5 verse 6 yea dead in sin Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 he has no mind to it he desires not the knowledge of God's ways Job 21 verse 14 he does not know them and he does not care to know them Psalm 82 verse 5 he knows not neither will he understand he has neither due instruments nor materials for it a man may as well hew the marble without tools or paint without colors or brushes or build without materials as perform any acceptable service without the graces of the spirit which are both the materials and the instruments in this work almsgiving is not a service of God but of vain glory if it does not spring from love to God what is the prayer of the lips without grace in the heart but a carcass without life what are all our confessions unless they are exercises of godly sorrow and unfeigned repentance what are our petitions unless animated with holy desires and faith in the attributes and promises of God what are our praises and thanksgiving unless they spring from the love of God and a holy gratitude and sense of God's mercies in the heart so that a man may as well expect that trees should speak or look for motion from the dead as look for any service holy and acceptable to God from the unconverted when the tree is evil how can the fruit be good also without conversion you live to bad purpose the unconverted soul is a very cage of unclean birds Revelation chapter 18 verse 2 a sepulchre full of corruption and rottenness Matthew chapter 23 verse 27 a loathsome carcass full of crawling worms sending forth a most noxious stench in the nostrils of God Psalm 14 verse 3 oh dreadful case do you not see that a change is needful would it not have grieved one to see the golden consecrated vessels of God's temple turned into quaffing bowls for drunkenness and polluted with an idle surface Daniel chapter 5 verses 2 to 3 was it such an abomination to the Jews when Antiochus set up an image of a swine at the entrance of the temple how much more abominable then would it have been to have had the very temple itself turned into a stable or a sty and to have the holy of holies serve as the house of Baal this is just the case of the unregenerate all your members are turned into instruments of unrighteousness servants of Satan and your inmost heart into a receptacle of uncleanness you may see what kinds of guests are within by what come out for out of the heart perceiveth proceed evil thoughts murders adulteries fornications thefts false witness blasphemies Matthew 15 verse 19 
this troop shows what a hell there is within. O oh, abuse insufferable, to see a heaven-born soul abased to such vileness, to see the glory of God's creation, the chief of the works of God, the lord of this lower world, eating husks with the prodigal, was it such a lamentation to see those that did feed delicately sitting desolate in the streets, and the precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, esteemed as earthen pitchers, and those that were clothed in scarlet, embracing dunghills, Lamentations chapter 4 verses 2 and 5, and is it not much more fearful to see the only being that has immortality in this lower world and carries the stamp of God become as a vessel wherein is no pleasure and to be put to the most sordid use. O oh, indignity intolerable! Better you were dashed in a thousand pieces than continue to be abased in so vile a service. Not only man but the whole visible creation is in vain without conversion. God has made all the visible creatures in heaven and earth for the service of man, and man only is the spokesman for all the rest. Man is in the world like the tongue to the body, which speaks for all the members. The other creatures cannot praise their maker except by dumb signs and hints to man that he should speak for them. Man is, it, as it were, the high priest of God's creation to offer a sacrifice of praise for all his fellow creatures. The Lord God expects a tribute of praise from all his works. Now all the rest do bring in their tribute to man and pay it by his hand. So then if the man is false and faithless and selfish God is robbed of all and has no active glory from his works. No dreadful thought that God should build such a world as this and lay out infinite power and wisdom and goodness thereupon and all in vain and that man should be guilty at last of robbing and spoiling him of the glory of all oh think of this while you are unconverted all the offices of the creatures are in vain to you your food nourishes you in vain the sun holds forth its light to you in vain. Your clothes warm you in vain. Your beast carries you in vain. In a word, the unwearied labour and continuing travail of the whole creation as to you are in vain. The service of the creatures that drudge for you and yield forth their strength unto you, which you should, um, with which you should serve their maker, is all but lost labour. It is hence that the whole creation groaneth, Romans chapter 8 verse 22, under the abuse of unsanctified men who pervert all things to the service of their lusts, quite contrary to the very end of their being. Without conversion, your religion is in vain. All your religious performances will be lost, for they can neither please God nor save your soul which are the very ends of religion. Romans 8 verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 2 to 3. Be your services ever so specious, yet God has no pleasure in them. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 14, and Malachi chapter 1 verse 10. Is not the man's case dreadful, whose sacrifices are as murders, whose prayers are a breath of abomination? Isaiah of 66 verse 3 Proverbs 28 verse 9 Many under conviction think they will set upon mending and that a few prayers and arms will set all to rights again but alas sirs while your hearts remain unsanctified your duties will not pass How punctilious was Jehu and yet all was rejected because his heart was not upright See Second Kings chapter 10 with Hosea chapter 1 verse 4. How <coughs> blameless was Paul, and yet being unconverted, all was but loss. Philippians chapter 3 verses 6 to 7. Men think they do much in attending to God's service, 
and are ready to set him down so much the debtor whereas their persons being unsanctified their duties cannot be accepted O oh soul do not think when your sins pursue you that a little praying and reforming your ways will pacify God you must begin with your heart if that is not renewed you can no more please God than one who having unspeakably offended you should bring you the most loathsome things in an attempt to pacify you or having fallen into the mire should think that his filthy embraces would reconcile him to you it is a great misery to labour in the fire the poets could not invent a worse hell for Sisyphus than ever toiling to get a stone up the hill and then that it should presently roll down again and renew all his labour God threatens it as the greatest temporal judgments that they should build and not inhabit plant and not gather and that their labours should be eaten up by strangers Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 30 and 38 to 41 is it so great a misery to lose our common labours to sow in vain and to build in vain how much more to lose our pains in religion to pray to hear to fast in vain this is an undoing and eternal loss be not deceived if you go on in your sinful uh, state though you should spread forth your hands God will hide his eyes though you make many prayers he will not hear Isaiah verse one, chapter 1 verse 15 if a man without skill sets about our work and spoils it in the doing though he takes much pains we will give him but small thanks God will be worshipped after his due order if a servant do our work but quite contrary to our orders he shall have stripes rather than praise God's work must be done according to God's mind or he will not be pleased and this cannot be so except it be done with a holy heart without true conversion your hopes are vain the hope of the hypocrite shall perish Job chapter 8 verses 12 to 13 the Lord hath rejected thy confidences Jeremiah 2 verse 37 the hope of comfort here is vain it's not only necessary for the safety but comfort of your condition that you be converted without this you shall not know peace Isaiah 58 chapter 8 without the fear of God you cannot have the comfort of the Holy Ghost Acts chapter 9 verse 31 God speaks peace only to his people and to his saints Psalm 85 verse 8 if you have a false peace continuing in your sins it is not of God speaking and therefore you may guess who is the author sin is the real sickness Isaiah 1 verse 5 yea the worst of sicknesses it is a leprosy in the head Leviticus 13.44 a plague in the heart 1 Kings 8.38 brokenness in the bones Psalm 51 verse 8 it pierces, it wounds, it racks, it torments 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 a man may as well expect ease when his diseases are in their full strength or his bones are out of joint as true comfort whilst living in his sins O oh, wretched man that can have no ease in this case but what comes from the deadliness of the disease you shall have the poor sick man saying in his wildness he is well when you see death in his face he would be up and about his business when the very next step is likely to be to his grave the unsanctified often see nothing amiss they think themselves whole and cry not for the physician but this only shows the danger of their case sin naturally breeds diseases and disturbances of the soul what a continual tempest is there in a discontented mind what a corroding evil is inordinate care what is passion 
but a very fever of the mind. What is lust, but a fire in the bones? What is pride, but a deadly dropsy? Or covetousness, but an insatiable and insufferable thirst? What is malice, and envy, but venom in the very heart? Spiritual sloth is but a scurvy in the mind, and carnal security a mortal lethargy. How can that soul have true comfort, which is labouring under so many diseases? But converting grace cures, and so eases the mind, and prepares the soul for a settled, standing, immortal peace. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, verse 165. They are the ways of wisdom that afford pleasure and peace. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17. David had infinitely more pleasure in the word than in all the delights of his court. Psalm 119, verses 103 and 127. The conscience cannot be truly pacified until soundly purified. Hebrews 10 verse 22. Cursed is that peace which is maintained in the way of sin. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verses 19 to 20. Two sorts of peace are more to be dreaded than all the troubles in the world. Peace with sin and peace in sin. The hope of salvation hereafter is in vain. This hope is most injurious to God, most pernicious to yourself. There is death, despair and blasphemy in this hope. There is death in it. Your confidence shall be rooted out of your tabernacles. God will up with it, root and branch. It will bring you to the king of terrors. Job chapter 18 verse 14 Though you may lean upon this house, it will not stand, but will prove like a ruinous building to you, which when a man trusts to it, falls down about him. Job chapter 8 verse 15 There is despair in it. Where is the hope of the hypocrite, when God taketh away his soul? Job chapter 27 verse 8 then there is an end for ever of this hope. Indeed the hope of the righteous has an end, but it is not destructive, but a perfect end. His hope ends in fruition, others in frustration. The godly may say at death, it is finished, but the wicked, it is perished, and may earnestly bemoan himself as Job did, though mistakenly in his case, where is now my hope? He hath destroyed me, I am gone, and my hope is removed like a tree. Job chapter 19 and verse 10. But the righteous hath hope in his death. Proverbs 14 verse 32. When nature is dying, his hopes are living. When his body is languishing, his hopes are flourishing. His hope is a living hope but others a dying, yea, a damning, soul undo undoing hope. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of the unjust man perisheth. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 7 It shall be cut off, and prove like a spider's web. Job chapter 8 verse 14 Which he spins out of his own bowels, but then comes death and destroys it all. And so there is an eternal end to all the confidence in which he trusted. The eyes of the wicked shall fail, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Job chapter 11 verse 20 Wicked men are fixed in their carnal hope, and will not be beaten out of it. They hold it fast, they will not let it go, but death will knock it off their fingers. Though we cannot undeceive them, death and judgment will. When death strikes his dart to your liver, it will ruin your soul and your hopes together. The unsanctified have hope only in this life, and therefore are of all men the most miserable. When death comes, it lets them out into the amazing gulf of endless despair. There is 
blasphemy in it. To hope we shall be saved, though continuing unconverted, is to hope that we will prove God a liar. He has told you that, merciful and compassionate as he is, he will never give you, uh, never save you, and notwithstanding, if you go on in a course of ignorance and unrighteousness. In a word he has told you, that whatever you are or do, nothing shall avail you to salvation unless you become new creatures. Now to say God is, is merciful and to hope he will save you without conversion is in effect to say we hope that God will not do as he says. We must not set God's attributes at variance. God has resolved to glorify his mercy but not at the prejudice of his truth as the presumptuous sinner will find to his everlasting sorrow. Objection. But we hope in Jesus Christ, we put our whole trust in God, and therefore do not doubt that we shall be saved. Answer. This is not hope in Christ, but hope against Christ. To hope to see the kingdom of God without being born again, to hope to find eternal life in the broad way, is to hope Christ will prove a false prophet. David's plea is... I hope in thy word. Psalm 119 verse 81. But this hope is against God's word. Show me a word for Christ, for your hope, that he will save you in your ignorance, in your profane neglect of his service, and I will never again try to shake your confidence. But God rejects this hope with abhorrence. Those condemned by the prophet went on in their sins, Yet, says the prophet, they will lean upon the Lord. Micaiah chapter 3 verse 11. God will not endure to be made a prop to men in their sins. The Lord rejected those presumptuous sinners that went on still in their trespasses, and yet would stay themselves, or say they did, upon Israel's God, as a man would shake off the briars that cleave to his garment. If your hope is worth anything, it will purify you from your sins. 1 John chapter 3 verse 3 But cursed is that hope which cherishes men in their sins. Objection. Would you have us despair? Answer. You must despair of ever coming to heaven as you are, that is, while unconverted. You must despair of ever seeing the face of God without holiness. You must, not, must by no means despair of finding mercy upon your thorough repentance and conversion. Neither may you despair of attaining to repentance and conversion in the use of God's means. Without conversion all that Christ has done and suffered will be, as to you, in vain. That is, it will in no way avail you to salvation. Many urge this as a sufficient ground for their hope, that Christ died for sinners. But I must tell you, Christ never died to save impenitent and unconverted sinners. So continuing. A great divine was accustomed in his private dealings with souls to ask two questions. What has Christ done for you? What has Christ wrought in you? Without the application of the Spirit in regeneration, we have no saving interest in the benefits of redemption. I tell you from the Lord that Christ himself cannot save you if you go on in this state. To save men in their sins would be against his trust. The mediator is the servant of the Father. He shows his commission from him, acts in his name, and pleads his commands for his justification. John chapter 10 verse 18 and verse 36, John chapter 6 verses 38 and 40. God has committed all things to him, entrusted his own glory and the salvation of his elect to him. Matthew chapter 11 verses 20, verse 27 and John chapter 17 and verse 2. Accordingly, Christ gives his Father an account of both parts of his trust 
before he leaves the world. John chapter 17. Now Christ would quite thwart his Father's glory, tarnish his greatest trust, if he should save men in their sins. For this would overturn all his counsels and offer violence to all his attributes. It would overturn all God's counsels, of which this is the order that men should be brought to salvation through sanctification. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. He has chosen them that they should be holy. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. They are elected to pardon and life through sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. If you can repeal the law of God's immutable counsel, or corrupt him whom the Father has sealed, to go directly against his commission, then, and not otherwise, you may get to heaven on this condition. To hope that Christ will save you while unconverted is to hope that Christ will prove false to his trust. He never did, nor ever will save one soul, but whom the Father has given him in election, and drawn to him by effectual calling. John chapter 6, verses 37 and 44. Be assured, Christ will save none in a way contrary to his Father's will. To save men in their sins would offer violence to all the attributes of God, to his justice. The righteousness of God's judgment lies in rendering to all according to their works. Now should men sow to the flesh, and yet of the Spirit reap everlasting life? Where were the glory of divine justice, since it would be given to the wicked according to the works of the righteous? to his holiness. If God should not only save sinners, but save them in their sins, his most pure and strict holiness would be exceedingly defaced. The unsanctified, in the eyes of God's holiness, are worse than a swine or viper. He would be offering the extremest violence to his infinite purity, the purity of his divine nature, to have such dwell with him. They cannot stand in his judgment, so they cannot abide in his presence. If holy David would not endure such sinners in his house, nor in his sight, Psalm 101 verses 3 and 7, can we think that God will? Should he take men as they are, from the mire of their filthiness, straight to the glory of heaven, the world would think that God was not at such a great distance from sin, nor had any such dislike to it, as we are told that he has. They would be ready to conclude that altogether God was such an one as themselves, as some of the old wickedly did, from the forbearance of God. Psalm 1 verse 21 To his veracity God has declared from heaven that if any say he shall have peace, though he should go on in the imagination of his own heart, his wrath shall smoke against that man. Deuteronomy 29 verses 19 to 20. He has declared that they only who confess and forsake their sins shall find mercy. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 13. He has declared that they shall never enter into his hill unless they are of clean hands and a pure heart. Psalm 24 verses 3 and 4. Where were God's truth, if notwithstanding all of this, he should bring men to salvation without conversion? O desperate sinner, that dares to hope that Christ will make his father a liar, and nullify his word to save you. To his wisdom. This were to throw away the choices of mercies on them who would not value them, nor were any way suited to them. They would not value them. The unsanctified sinner puts, his, puts but little price upon God's great salvation. He thinks no more of Christ than they that are whole do of the physician. He prizes not his balm, values not his cure, but tramples on his blood. Now would it stand with wisdom to force pardon and life on those who would return no thanks for them? 
with an all-wise God, who has forbidden us to do it through his holy things to dogs and his pearls to swine, that would, as it were, but turn again and rend him. This would make mercy to be despised indeed. Wisdom requires that life be given in a way suitable to God's honour, and that God provide for the securing of his own glory as well as of man's felicity. It would be dishonourable in God to bestow his choicest riches on those that have more pleasure in their sins than in the heavenly delights that he offers. God would lose the praise of his glory and of his grace if he should cast it away upon those who are not only unworthy but unwilling. Also, the mercies of God are in no way suited to the unconverted. God's wisdom is seen in suiting things to each other, the means to the end, the object to the faculty, the quality of the gift to the capacity of the receiver. Now, if Christ should bring the unregenerate sinner to heaven, he could take no more felicity there than a beast would, if you, you should bring him into a beautiful room and the society of learned men whereas the poor thing had much rather be grazing with his fellows in the field. Alas, what could an unsanctified man do in heaven? He could not be content, because nothing would suit him there. The place doesn't suit him. He would be quite out of his element, as a fish out of water. The company doesn't suit him. What communion has darkness with life? Corruption with perfection? Vileness and sin? with glory and immortality. The employment does not suit him. The anthems of heaven do not fit in his mouth, do not suit his ear. Can you charm a donkey with music? Or will you bring him to your organ and expect that he should make melody for you, or keep time with a tuneful choir? Had he skill, he would not have the will, and so could find no pleasure in it. Spread your table with delicacies before a languishing patient, and it will be but an offence. Alas, if the poor man think a sermon long and serve the Sabbath day, what a weariness is in it! How miserable would he be to be engaged in an everlasting Sabbath! To his immutability, or as to his omniscience and omnipotence, it is enacted in heaven and enrolled in the decree of the court above that none but the pure in heart shall see God. Matthew 5 verse 8 Now, if Christ bring any to heaven unconverted, either he must get them in uh, without his father's knowledge, and then where is his omniscience, or against his will, and then where is his omnipotence, or he must change his will, and then, where is his immutability? Sinner, will you not give up your vain hope of being saved in this condition? Bildad says, Shall the earth be forsaken for thee, or the rocks be moved out of their place? Job chapter 18 and verse 4 May I not much more reason thus with you? Shall the laws of heaven be reversed for you? Shall the everlasting foundation be overturned for you? Shall Christ put out the eye of his Father's omniscience or shorten the arm of his eternal power for you? Shall divine justice be violated for you? Or the brightness of his holiness be blemished for you? O oh, the impossibility absurdity, blasphemy of such a confidence to think Christ will ever save you in this condition is to make the Saviour become a sinner and do more wrong to the infinite majesty than all the wicked on earth or devils in hell ever did or ever could do and yet will you not give up such a false and blasphemous hope to save men in their sins would be against the word of Christ we need not say who shall ascend into heaven to bring down Christ from above or who shall descend into the deep to bring up Christ from beneath the word is nigh us Romans chapter 10 verses 6 to 8 are you agreed 
that Christ shall end this controversy? Hear then his own words. Except you be converted, you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. If I wash you not, you have no part in me. Except you repent, ye shall perish. Matthew chapter 18 verse 3, John chapter 3 verse 7, John chapter 13 verse 8, Luke chapter 13 verse 3. One word, and one would think, were enough from Christ. But how often and earnestly does he reiterate it? Verily, verily, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 verse 3. Yea, he not only asserts, but proves the necessity of the new birth from the fleshliness and sinfulness of man from his first birth, by reason of which man is no more fit for heaven than the beast is for the chamber of the king. And will you yet rest in your own presumptuous confidence directly against Christ's words? He must go quite against the law of his kingdom and the rule of his judgment to save you in this state. To save men in their sins would be against the oath of Christ. He has lifted up his hand to heaven. He has sworn that those who remain in unbelief and know not his ways, that is ignorant of them or disobedient to them, shall not enter into his rest. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 18 And will you not yet believe, O sinner, that he is in earnest? The covenant of grace is confirmed by an oath and sealed by blood. But all must be made void and another way to to heaven found out if you you are to be saved, living and dying still unsanctified. God is come to his last terms with man and has condescended as far as in honour he could. Man cannot be saved while unconverted, except they should get another covenant made. And the whole frame of the gospel, which was established for ever with such dreadful solemnities, quite altered. And must not they be demented who hope that it shall? To save men in their sins would be against his honour. God will so show his love to the sinner but at the same time show his hatred to sin. Therefore, he that names the name of Jesus must depart from iniquity and deny all ungodliness, and he that hopes of life by Christ must purify himself as he is pure. Otherwise Christ would be thought a favourer of sin. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Titus 2, verse 12, 1 Epistle of John 3, verse 3. The Lord Jesus would have all of the world know that though he pardons sin, he will not protect it. If holy David says, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, Psalm 6 verse 8, and shuts the doors against them, Psalm 101 verse 7, shall we not much more expect it from Christ's holiness? Would it be for his honour to have dogs at the table? or lodge the swine with his children, or have Abraham's bosom become a nest of vipers? To save men in their sins would be against his offices. God has exalted him with the offices of being a prince and a saviour. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. He would act against both should he ever save men in their sins. It is the office of a king to be a terror to evildoers and to praise them that do well. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath on him that doeth evil. Romans chapter 13 verse 4. Now should Christ favour the ungodly, so continuing, and take those to reign with him that would not that he should reign over them, this will be quite against his office. He therefore reigns that he may put his enemies under his feet. Now, should he instead lay them in his bosom, he would frustrate the end of his regal power. It belongs to Christ as a king to subdue the hearts and slay the lusts of his chosen. Psalm 
45 verse 5 and Psalm 110 verse 3. What king would take rebels in open hostility to him into his court? What would this but to betray life, kingdom, government and all together? If Christ is a king, he must have honour, homage, subjection. Now to save men, while in their natural enmity, were to obscure his dignity, lose his authority, bring contempt on his government, and sell his dear bought rights for naught. Again, as Christ would not be a prince, so neither a saviour, if he should do this, for his salvation is spiritual. He is called Jesus because he saves his people from their sins. Matthew 1, chapter, uh, verse 21. So that should he save them in their sins, he would be neither Lord nor Jesus. To save men from punishment and not from the power of sin were to do his work by halves and be an imperfect saviour. His office as the deliverer is to turn ungodliness from Jacob. Romans chapter 11 verse 26. He is sent to bless men in turning them from their iniquities. Acts chapter 3 verse 26. To make an end of sin. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. So that he would destroy his own designs and nullify his own offices if he were to save men in their unconverted state. Arise then. What meanest thou, O sleeper? Awake, O secure sinner, lest you be consumed in your iniquities, lest, as the lepers, if we sit here, we shall die. Second Kings chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Verily, it is not more certain that you are now out of hell then that you shall speedily be in it, except you repent and be converted. There is but this one door for you to escape by. Arise then, O sluggard, make away with your excuses. How long will you slumber and fold your hands in sleep? Will you lie down in the midst of the sea, or sleep on top of a mast? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 34. There is no remedy but you must either turn or burn. There is an unchangeable necessity of the change of your condition unless you have resolved to abide the worst of it and try matters out with the Almighty. If you love your life, O oh man, arise and come away. I think I see the Lord Jesus laying the merciful hands of a holy violence upon you. I think he acts like the angels to Lot. Then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, lest thou be consumed. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him without the city, and said, Escape for thy life. Stay not in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. Genesis 19, verses 15 to 17. Oh, how willful will your destruction be if you should yet harden yourself in your sinful state. But none of you can say that you have not had a fair warning. Yet I cannot leave you so. It is not enough for me to have delivered my own soul. What? Shall I go without my errand? Will none of you arise and follow me? Have I been all this while speaking to the wind? Have I been charming the deaf adder, or allaying the restless ocean with arguments? Do I speak to the trees, or the rocks, or to men? To the tombs and the monuments of the dead, or to the living? If you are men, and not senseless stocks, stop and consider where you are going. If you have the reason and the understanding of men, do not dare to run into the flames and fall into hell with your eyes open, but stop and think, and set about the work of repentance. What, men, and yet run into the pit, where the very beasts will not be forced into? What, endowed with reason, and yet trifle with death and hell and the vengeance of the Almighty? Are men 
only distinguished from brutes in that these, having no foresight, have no care to provide for the things to come? And will you, who are warned, not hasten to escape from eternal torments? Oh, show yourself to be men, and let reason prevail with you. It is a reasonable thing for you to contend against the Lord your Maker, do you think? Or to harden yourself against his word, as though the strength of Israel should lie? Isaiah 45 verse 9, Job chapter 9 verse 4, 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 29. Is it reasonable that an understanding creature should lose, yea, live quite against the very end of its being? Is it reasonable that the only being in this world that God has made capable of knowing his will and bringing to glory should yet live in ignorance of its maker and be unserviceable to him, yea, should be engaged against him and spit his venom in the face of his creator? Here. O heavens, and give ear, O earth, and let the creatures without sense judge if this be reason, that man whom God has nourished and brought up should rebel against him. Judge in your own selves. Is it a reasonable undertaking for briars and thorns to set themselves in battle against the devouring fire, or for the potsherds of the earth to strive with its maker? You will say, This is not reason. Or surely the eye of reason is quite put out? And if this be not reason, then there is no reason that you should continue as you are, but there is every reason in the world that you should immediately turn and repent. What shall I say? I could spend myself on this argument. Oh, that you would only hearken to me, that you would now set upon a new course. Will you not be made clean? When shall it once be? Reader, will you sit down and consider the forementioned arguments and debate it whether it is not best to turn? Come and let us reason together. Is it good for you to be here? Is it good for you to try whether God will be as good as he says he would in his word? Or to harden yourself in conceit that all will be well with you while you yet remain unsanctified? Alas for such sinners! Must they perish at last by hundreds? What cause shall I use with them? But I have not tried. What shall I do for the daughter of my people? Jeremiah 9 verse 7 O Lord God, help! Alas, shall I leave them thus? If they will not hear me, yet do thou hear me. O that they might live in thy sight! Lord, save them, or they perish. My heart would melt to see their houses on fire while they were fast asleep in their beds, and shall not thy soul be moved within me to see them falling into endless perdition. Lord, have compassion, and save them out of this burning. Put forth thy divine power, and the work will be done. 6. The Marks of the Unconverted while we keep aloof in general statements, there is little fruit to be expected. It is the hand-to-hand -hand fight that does the execution. David was not awakened by the prophets hovering at a distance in parabolical insinuations. Nathan was forced to close with him and tell him plainly, Thou art the man. Few will, in words, deny the necessity of a new birth but they have a self-deluding confidence that the work is not to be done now. And because they know themselves to be free from that gross hypocrisy, which takes up religion merely for a colour to deceive others, and for covering wicked designs, they are confident of their sincerity, and do not suspect that more close hypocrisy in which the greater danger lies, and by which a man deceives his own soul. But man's deceitful heart is such a matchless cheat, and self-delusion is so reigning and so fatal a disease that I do not know which is the greater, the difficulty or the necessity of the undeceiving work that I am now upon. 
Alas for the unconverted, they must be undeceived, or they will be undone. But how shall this be effected? Help, O oh, oh, searching light, and let thy discerning eye disclose the rotten foundations of the self-deceiver. Lead me, O oh Lord God, as thou didst the prophet, into the chambers of imagery, dig through the wall of the sinner's heart, and reveal the hidden abominations that are lurking out of sight in the dark. O oh, send thy angel before me to open the sundry wards of their hearts, as thou didst before Peter, and make even the iron gates fly open of their own accord. And as Jonathan no sooner tasted the honey, but his eyes were enlightened, O oh, grant, O oh, Lord, that when the poor deceived souls with whom I have to do shall cast their eyes upon these lines, their minds may be illuminated, and their consciences convinced and awakened, that they may see with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted, and thou mayest heal them. This must, must, be, must be premised uh, before we proceed, that it is most certain that men have a confident persuasion that their hearts and states are good, whilst yet they are unsound. Hear the truth himself who shows, in Laodicea's case, that men may be wicked and miserable and poor and blind and naked and yet not know it. Yes, they may be confident that they are rich and increased in grace. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30 verse 12. Who better persuaded of his state than Paul, while he was yet remaining unconverted? Romans 7 verse 9. So that they are miserably deceived, who take a strong confidence for a sufficient evidence. They have no better proof than barely a strong persuasion that they are converted, as certainly as yet they are strangers to conversion. But to come closer, as it was said to the adherents of Antichrist, so here, some of the unconverted carry their marks on their forehead more openly, and some in their hands more covertly. The Apostle reckons up some among whom he writes the sentence of death, as in these dreadful catalogues which I beseech you to attend to with all diligence. For this you know, that no whoremonger or unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 to 6. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderous and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 to 10. Woe to them that have their names written in this catalogue. Such may know, as certainly as if God told them himself from heaven that they are unsanctified and under an impossibility of being saved in that condition. There are then these several classes that, beyond all dispute, are unconverted. They carry their marks in their foreheads. 1. The unclean. These are ever reckoned among the goats, and have their names, or whatever else is left out, in all the aforementioned catalogue. 2. The covetous. These are ever branded for idolaters, and have the doors of the kingdom shut against them by name. 3. Drunkards. 
not only such as drink away thy reason, but withal, yea, above all, such as are too strong for strong drink. The Lord fills his mouth with woes against these, and declares them to have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and 22, and Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. 4. Liars. God that cannot lie has told them that there is no place for them in his kingdom, no entrance into his hill, but their portion is with the father of lies, whose children, children they are, in the lake of burnings. Revelation 21 verse 8 and verse 27, John chapter 8 verse 44, Proverbs chapter 6 verse 17. 5. Swearers. The end of these, without deep and speedy repentance, is swift destruction, and most certain and unavoidable condemnation. James chapter 5 verse 12, Zechariah chapter 5 verses 1 to 3. 6. Railers and backbiters, that love to take up a reproach against their neighbour, and fling all the dirt they can in his face, or else wound him secretly behind his back. Psalms 15 verses 1 and 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. 7. Thieves and extortioners, oppressors that grind the poor, or defraud their brethren when they have the opportunity. These must know that God is the avenger of all such. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 6. Here, O you false and purloining and wasteful servants, here, O you deceitful tradesmen, hear your sentence. God will certainly shut his door against you and turn your treasures of unrighteousness into the treasures of wrath and make your ill-gotten silver and gold to be a torment to you like burning metal on your flesh. James chapter 5 verses 2 to 3. 8. All that do ordinarily live in the profane neglect of God's worship that do not hear his word, that will not call upon his name, nor that restrain prayer before God, that do not mind their own nor their family souls, but live without God in the world. John 8, chapter, verse 47, Job, chapter 15, verse 4, Psalm 14, verse 4, Psalm 79, verse 6, Ephesians 2, verse 12, and Ephesians 4, verse 18. 9. Frequenters and lovers of vain company. God has declared that he will be the destroyer of all such, and that they shall never enter into the hill of his rest. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 6 and chapter 13 verse 20. 10. Scoffers at religion, that make a scorn of precise living, and mock at the messengers and diligent servants of the Lord, and at their holy profession, and make themselves merry with the weakness and failings of professing Christians. Hear ye despisers, hear your dreadful doom. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 29, and Second Chronicles chapter 36 verse 16. Section 6. The Marks of the Unconverted. While we keep aloof in general statements, there is little fruit to be expected. It is the hand-fighting that does the execution. David is not awakened by the prophets hovering at a distance in parabolical insinuations. Nathan is forced to close with him, and to tell him plainly, Thou art the man. Few will, in words, deny the necessity of the new birth but they have a self-deluding confidence that the work is not to be done now. And because they know themselves to be free from that gross hypocrisy which takes religion merely for a colour to deceive others and for covering wicked designs, they are confident of their sincerity and do not suspect that more close hypocrisy in which the greatest danger lies and by which a man deceives his own soul may be their case. But man's deceitful heart is such a matchless cheat, and self-delusion so reigning, and so fatal a disease, that I do not know which is the greater, the difficulty or the necessity of the undeceiving work 
that I am now upon. Alas for the unconverted, they must be undeceived or they will be undone. But how shall it be affected? Help, O all-searching light, and let thy discerning eye disclose the rotten foundation of the self-deceiver. Lead me, O my God, as thou didst the prophet, into the chambers of imagery, and dig through the wall of sinners' hearts, and reveal the hidden abominations that are lurking out of sight in the dark. O send thy angel before me to open the sundry wards of their hearts, as thou didst before Peter, and make even the iron gates fly open of their own accord. And as Jonathan no sooner tasted the honey, but his eyes were enlightened, so grant, O Lord, that when the poor deceived souls with whom I have to do shall cast their eyes upon these lines, their minds may be illuminated, and their consciences convinced and awakened, that they may see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and be converted, and thou mayst heal them. This must be premised before we proceed, that it is most certain that men may have a confident persuasion that their hearts and states are good, while yet they are unsound. Hear the truth himself who shows, in Laodicea's case, that men may be wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and yet not know it. Yea, they may be confident that they are rich and increased in grace. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30 verse 12 Who better persuaded of his state than Paul while he yet remained unconverted? Romans chapter 7 verse 9 So that they are miserably deceived who take a strong confidence for their sufficient evidence. They that have no better proof than barely a strong persuasion that they are converted are certainly as yet strangers to conversion. But to come even closer, as it was said to the adherents of Antichrist so here, some of the unconverted carry their marks in their forehead most openly, and some in their hands more covertly. The Apostle reckons upon some whom he writes the sentence of death as in these dreadful catalogues which I beseech you to attend with all diligence. For this you know, that no whoremonger, or unclean person, or covetous man, man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 5 to 6 But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Revelation 21 verse 8 Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 to 10 Woe to them that have their names written in this catalogue. Such may know, as certainly as if God told them it themselves from heaven, they are unsanctified and under an impossibility of being saved in that condition. There are then these several classes which, past all dispute, are unconverted. They carry their marks in their foreheads. 1. The unclean. These are ever reckoned among the goats and have their names, whatever else is left out, in the aforementioned catalogues. 2. The covetous. These are ever branded for idolaters 
and the doors of the kingdom are shut against them by name. 3. Drunkards Not only such as drink away their reason, but withal, yea, above all, such as are too strong for strong drink. The Lord fills his mouth with woes against these, and declares them to have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 5 verses 11, 12 and 22 Galatians chapter 5 verse 21 4. Liars The God that cannot lie has told them that there is no place for them in his kingdom no entrance into his hill but their portion is with the father of lies whose children they are in the lake of burnings Revelation chapter 21 verses 8 and 27 and John chapter 8 verse 44 Proverbs chapter 6 verse 17 5. Swearers The end of these without deep and speedy repentance is swift destruction and most certain and unavoidable condemnation James chapter 5 verse 12 Zechariah chapter 5 verses 1 to 3 6. Railers and backbiters but love to take up a reproach against their neighbour and fling all the dirt they can in his face or else wound him secretly behind his back Psalm 15 verses 1 and 3 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11 7. Thieves, extortioners oppressors that grind the poor or defraud their brethren when they have the opportunity these must know that God is the avenger of all such 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 6 Hear, O you false and purloining and wasteful servants Hear, O you deceitful tradesmen Hear your sentence God will certainly shut his door against you and turn your treasures of unrighteousness into the treasures of wrath and make your ill-gotten silver and gold to torment you like burning metal on your flesh James chapter 5 verses 2 to 3 8. All that do ordinarily live in the profane neglect of God's worship, that do not hear his word, that do not call on his name, who restrain prayer before God, that do not mind their own nor their family souls, but live without God in the world. John chapter 8 verse 47, Job chapter 15 verse 4, Psalm 14 verse 5, Psalm 79 verse 6, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 and chapter 4 verse 18 9. Frequenters and lovers of vain company God has declared that he will be the destroyer of all such and they shall never enter into the hill of his rest Proverbs chapter 9 verse 6 and chapter 13 verse 20 and 10. Scoffers at religion that make a scorn of precise living a mock at the messengers and diligent servants of the Lord and at their holy profession and make themselves merry with the weaknesses and failings of professed Christians hear ye despisers hear your dreadful doom Proverbs chapter 19 verse 29 Second Chronicles chapter 26 verse 16 Sinner Consider diligently whether you are not to be found in one of these ranks. For if this is the case, you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity, and all these do carry their marks in their foreheads, and are undoubtedly the sons of death. And if so, the Lord pity our poor congregations. Oh, how small a number will remain after these ten sorts are taken out. Sirs, at what efforts you make to keep your confidence of your good state when God from heaven declares against you and pronounces you in a state of condemnation. I would reason with you as God with them. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 23 Man is not your conscience aware of your tricks of deceit of your secret sins, of your way of living. Yea, are not your friends, your family, your neighbours witnesses to your profane neglect of God's worship, to your covetous practices, 
to your envious and malicious behaviour may they not point to you as you go there goes a gambling prodigal there goes a drunken Nabal a companion of evil doers there goes a railer or a scoffer or a loose liver beloved God has written it with a sunbeam in the book by which you much must be judged that these are not the marks of his children and that none such except renewed by converting grace shall ever escape the damnation of hell oh that you would now be persuaded to repent and turn from all your transgressions or else iniquity will be your ruin Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30 alas for poor hardened sinners must I leave you at last where you are? Must I leave the drinker still at his bar? Must I leave the malicious still in his venom? However, you must know that you have been warned that I am clear of your blood. And whether men will hear or whether they will forbear, I will leave these scriptures with them which will prove either as thunderbolts to awaken them or as searing irons to harden them. God shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such an one as goes on still in his trespasses. He that, being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, I will laugh at your calamity when your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Psalm 68 verse 21 Proverbs 21 verse 1 Proverbs 1 verses 24 to 27 And now I imagine many will begin to bless themselves and think that all is well because they cannot be reproached with these grosser evils And I must tell you there is another sort of unsanctified person who carry their mark in their foreheads but more secretly more covertly these frequently deceive themselves and others and pass for good Christians when they are all the while unsound at heart many pass undiscovered till death and judgment brings all to light these self deceivers seem to come even to heaven's gate with confidence of their omission and yet are turned away at last Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 I beseech you deeply to lay to heart and firmly retain this awakening consideration that multitudes perish by the hand of some secret sin that is not only hidden from others but from want of observing of their own hearts is even hidden from themselves a man may be free from open pollutions and yet die at last by the hand of some unobserved iniquity and there are these twelve hidden sins through which, through which souls go down by numbers into the chambers of eternal death these you must also search carefully for and take them as black marks wherever they are found revealing a graceless and unconverted state and as you love your lives read carefully with a holy jealousy of yourselves lest you should be the persons concerned 1. Gross willful ignorance Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 oh how many poor souls does this sin kill in the dark while they think verily they have good hearts and are all set fair for heaven this is the murderer that dispatches thousands in a silent manner while they suspect nothing and do not see the hand that comes to destroy them you shall find whatever excuses you make for ignorance that it is a soul ruining evil Isaiah chapter 27 verse 11 Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 oh would it not have grieved a man's heart to see that dreadful spectacle when the poor protestants were shut up in a barn and a butcher came with his hand warmed in human blood and led them out one by one blindfold to a block where he slew them one after another by scores in cold blood but how much more should your hearts bleed to think of the hundreds that ignorance destroys in secret and leads also blindfold to the block 
beware that this is not your case make no plea for ignorance if you spare that sin know that it will not spare you and would a man keep a murderer in his bosom 2. secret reserves in closing with Christ to forsake all for Christ to hate father and mother yea a man's own life for him this is a hard saying Luke chapter 14 verse 26 some will do much but they will not have the religion that will save them they never come to be entirely devoted to Christ nor to be fully resigned to him they must have this sweet sin they mean to do themselves no harm but they have secret exceptions for life, liberty or estate many take Christ thus and never consider his self-denying terms nor count the cost and this error is the foundation that mars all and ruins them forever Luke chapter 14 verses 28 to 33 3. Formality in religion many rest in the outside of religion and the external performance of holy duties and very often this most effectually deceives them and more certainly undoes them than open profaneness as it was in the Pharisees case they hear, they fast, they pray, they give alms and therefore will not believe that their case is not good whereas resting in the work done and coming short of the heart work and inward power and vitality of religion they fall at last into the burning from the flattering hope and confident persuasion of their being all set on the way to heaven O oh, dreadful case when a man's religion shall serve only to harden him and effectually to delude and to deceive his own soul for the prevalence of a wrong motives in holy duties this was the bane of the Pharisees oh how many a poso is undone by this and drops into hell before he discerns his mistake he performs his good duties and so thinks all is well but does not perceive that he is actuated by carnal motives all the while it is too true that even with the really sanctified many carnal ends will often creep in but they are the matter of their hatred and humiliation and never become to be habitually prevalent with them or bear the greatest sway but when the main thing that ordinarily moves a man to religious duties is some carnal end as to satisfy his conscience to get the reputation of being religious to be seen of men to show his gifts and talents to avoid the reproach of being a profane or irreligious person or the like this reveals an unsound heart O Christians if you would avoid self-deceit see that your mind and your actions be the same 5. Trusting in their own righteousness this is a soul ruining mischief when men trust in their own righteousness they do indeed reject Christ's beloved you had need to be watchful on every hand for not only your sins but your duties may undo you it may be you never thought of this but so it is that a man may as certainly perish by his seeming righteousness and supposed graces as by gross sins and that is when a man trusts to these as his righteousness before God for satisfying his justice appeasing his wrath procuring his favour and obtaining his pardon this is to put Christ out of office and make a saviour of our own duties and graces O oh, professing Christian you are much in duties but this one fly will spoil all of your ointment when you've done most and best be sure to go out of yourselves to Christ and reckon your own righteousness as filthy rags Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 Isaiah 64 verse 6 6 a secret enmity against the strictness of religion many moral persons punctilious in their formal devotions have yet a bitter enmity against strictness and zeal and hate the life 
and the power of religion. They do not like this forwardness, nor that men should make such a stir about religion. They condemn the strictness of religion as singularity, indiscretion, intemperate zeal. And with them, a zealous preacher or a fervent Christian is but a wild enthusiast. These men do not love holiness as holiness, for then they would love the height of holiness, and therefore are undoubtedly rotten at heart whatever good opinion they may have of themselves. 7. The resting in a certain degree of religion. When they have so much as will save them, as they suppose, they look no farther, and so show themselves short of true grace, which always sets men aspiring onwards towards perfection. Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18. 8. The predominant love of the world. This is a sure evidence of an unsanctified heart. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. But how often does this sin lurk under the fair cover of forward profession? Yea, such a power of deceit is there in this sin that many times, when everybody else can see a man's worldliness and covetousness, he cannot see it himself, but has so many excuses and pretenses for his eagerness after the world that he blinds his own eyes and so perishes in self-deceit. How many professing Christians are there with whom the world has more of their hearts and affections than has Christ, who mind earthly things, and thereby are evidently after the flesh and likely to end in destruction? Romans chapter 8 verse 5, Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. Sinner, consider diligently whether you are not to be found in one of these ranks. For if this is the case, you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. For all these do carry their marks in their foreheads, and are undoubtedly the sons of death. And if so, the Lord pity our poor congregations. Oh, how small a number will remain if these ten sorts are taken out. He says, what effect you make to keep up your confidence of your good state, when God from heaven declares against you, and pronounces you in a state of damnation. I would reason with you as God with them. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 23. Man, is not your conscience aware of your tricks of deceit, of your secret sins, of your way of lying? Yea, are not your friends, your family, your neighbours witnesses to your profane neglect of God's worship, to your covetous practices, to your envious and malicious behaviour? May they not point at you as they go. There goes a gaming prodigal, there goes a drunken Nabal, a companion of evil doers. There goes a railer, or a scoffer, or a loose liver. Beloved, God has written it as with a sunbeam in the book by which you must be judged, that these are not the marks of his children, and that none such, except they be renewed by converting grace, shall ever escape the damnation of hell. Oh, that you would now be persuaded to repent and turn from all of your transgressions, or else iniquity shall be your ruin. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30. Alas, for poor hardened sinners, must I leave you at last where I found you? Must I leave the drinker still at his bar? Must I leave the malicious still in his venom? However, you must know that you have been warned, that I am clear of your blood, and whether men will hear, or whether they will forbear, I will leave these scriptures with them, which will prove either as thunderbolts to awaken them, or as searing irons to harden them. God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such an one, as goeth on still in his trespasses. He that, being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Because I have called, and you have refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, I will laugh at your calamity, when your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Psalm 
68 verse 21, Proverbs 29 verse 1, Proverbs chapter 1 verses 24 to 27. And now I imagine many will begin to bless themselves and think that all is well, because they cannot be re reproached with these grosser evils. But I must tell you that there is another sort of unsanctified person who carries their mark not in their foreheads, but more secretly and covertly. These frequently deceive themselves and others and pass for good Christians, when they are all the while unsound in heart. Many pass undiscovered till death and judgment bring it all to light. These self-deceivers seem to come even to heaven's gate with confidence of their admission, and yet are turned away at last. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 I beseech you deeply to lay to heart and firmly retain this awakening consideration that multitudes perish by the hand of some secret sin that is not only hidden from others, but from want of observing their own hearts, things which are hidden even from themselves. A man may be free from open pollutions and yet die at last by the hand of some unobserved iniquity. And there are these twelve hidden sins, through which souls go down by numbers into the chambers of eternal death. These you must carefully search for and take them as black marks against you wherever they are found, revealing a graceless and unconverted state. And as you love your lives, read carefully with a holy jealousy of yourselves. Yes, you should be the persons concerned. 1. Gross, willful ignorance. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. Oh, how many poor souls doth this sin kill in the dark, while they think verily that they have good hearts, and are all set for heaven? This is a murderer that dispatches thousands in a silent manner, when they suspect nothing, and do not see the hand that destroys them. You shall find, whatever excuses you make for ignorance, that it is a soul-ruining evil. Isaiah 27 verse 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3. Ah, would it not have grieved a man's heart to see that dreadful spectacle when the poor Protestants were shut up in a barn and the butcher came, with his hands warmed in human blood and led them out one by one, blindfold, to a block where he slew them one after another by scores in cold blood? How much more? Should your hearts bleed to think of the hundreds that ignorance destroys in secret and leads blindfold to the block? Beware that this is not your case. Make no plea for ignorance. If you spare this sin, know that it will not spare you. And would a man keep a murderer in his bosom? 2. Secret reserves in closing with Christ. To forsake all for Christ, to hate father and mother, yea, a man's own life for him, this is a hard saying. Luke chapter 14 verse 26. Some will do much, but they will not have the religion which is the only one that will save them. They never come to be entirely devoted to Christ, nor to be fully resigned to him. They must have the sweet sin. They mean to do themselves no harm. They have secret exceptions uh, for life, liberty, state. Many take Christ thus and never consider his self-denying terms, nor count the cost, and this error is the foundation that mars all and ruins them forever. Luke chapter 14 verses 28 to 33. 3. Formality in religion. Many rest in the outside of religion and an external performance of holy duties, and this very often most effectively deceives men, and more certainly undoes them than open profaneness. Thus it was in the Pharisees' case. They hear, they fast, they pray, they give alms, and therefore will not believe that their case is anything but good. Whereas resting in the work done and coming short of the heart work and the inward power and vitality of religion, they fall at last into the burning from the flattering hope and confident persuasion of their being all set on the way to heaven. Oh, dreadful case, when a man's religion shall serve only to harden him and effectually to delude and deceive his own soul. 4. The prevalence of wrong motives in holy duties. This was the bane of the Pharisees. Oh, how many a poor soul is undone by this and drops into hell before he discerns his mistake. He performs his good duties and so thinks all is well but does not perceive that he is actuated by carnal motives all the while. It's too true 
but even with the really sanctified many carnal ends will often creep in but they are the matter of their hatred and humiliation and never come to be habitually prevalent with them or bear the greatest sway but when the main thing that ordinarily moves a man to religious duties is some carnal end as to satisfy his conscience to get reputation of being religious to be seen of men to show his own gifts and talents to avoid the re reproach of being a profane or irreligious person or the like this reveals an unsound heart O Christian if you would avoid self-deceit see that you mind not only your actions but your motives 5. Trusting in their own righteousness this is a soul-ruining mischief. When men trust in their own righteousness, they do indeed reject Christ's. Beloved, if you had need to be watchful on every hand, uh, for not only your sins, but your duties may undo you, it may be you never thought of this. But so it is that a man may as certainly perish by his seeming righteousness and supposed graces as by gross sins. And that is when a man trusts to these as his righteousness before God for satisfying his justice, appeasing his wrath, procuring his favour, and obtaining his pardon. This is to put Christ out of office and to make a saviour of our own duties and graces. Beware of this, O professing Christians. You are much in duties, but this one fly will spoil all the ointment. When you have done most and best, be sure to go out of yourselves to Christ. Reckon your own righteousness as filthy rags. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 6. A secret enmity against the strictness of religion Many moral persons, punctilious in their formal devotions yet have a bitter enmity against strictness and zeal and hate the life and the power of religion They do not like this forwardness nor that men should make such a stare about religion they condemn the strictness of religion as singularity, indiscretion, intemperate zeal. And with them, a zealous preacher or a fervent Christian is but a wild enthusiast. These men do not love holiness as holiness, for then they would love the height of holiness, and therefore are undoubtedly rotten at heart whatever good opinion they have of themselves. 7. The resting in a certain degree of religion when they have so much as will save them as they suppose they look no further and so show themselves short of true grace which always sets men aspiring to perfection Philippians 3 verse 13 Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 8. The predominant love of the world This is the sure evidence of an unsanctified heart If any man love the world the love of the Father is not in him 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 but how often does this sin lurk under the fair cover of outward formal profession? Yea, such a power of deceit is there in this sin that many times when everybody else can see the man's worldliness and covetousness, he cannot see it himself, but has so many excuses and pretenses for his eagerness after the world that he blinds his own eyes and perishes in self-deceit. How many professing Christians are there with whom the world has more of their hearts and affections than has Christ, who mind earthly things, and thereby are evidently after the flesh, and likely to end in destruction. Romans chapter 8 verse 5, Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. Yet ask these men, and they will tell you confidently they prize Christ above all, for they do not see their own earthly mindedness, for want of a strict observance of the working of their own hearts. Did they but carefully search, they would quickly find that their greatest satisfaction is in the world and their greatest care and they maintain the greatest endeavour to get and to secure the things of this world these are the certain signs of an unconverted sinner may the professing part of the world take earnest heed lest they perish by the hand of this sin unobserved men may be and often are kept off from Christ as effectually by the inordinate love of lawful comforts as by the most unlawful courses. 9. Reigning malice and envy against those that disrespect them and are injurious to them. Oh, how many that seem to be religious remember injuries and carry grudges, rendering evil for evil, 
loving to take revenge, wishing evil on those that wrong them. This is directly against the rule of the gospel, the pattern of Christ, the nature of God. Doubtless, where this evil is kept boiling in the heart, and is not hated, resisted and mortified, but habitually prevails, that person is in the very gall of bitterness and in a state of death. Matthew chapter 18 verses 32 to 35, 1 John chapter 3 verses 14 to 15. 10. Unmortified pride. When men love the praise of men more than the praise of God and set their hearts upon men's esteem, applause and approbation, it is most certain that they are yet in their sins and strangers to true conversion. John chapter 12 verse 43, Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. When men do not see, nor complain, nor groan under the pride of their own hearts, it is a sign that they are stark dead in sin. Oh, how secretly does this live and reign in many hearts, and they know it not, but are very strangers to themselves. John chapter 9 verse 40. 11. The prevailing love of pleasure. This is a black mark. When men give the flesh the liberty that, that it craves, and pamper and please it, and do not deny and restrain it, when their great delight is in gratifying their bellies and pleasing their senses, whatever appearance they may have of religion, all is unsound. A flesh-pleasing life cannot be pleasing to God. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh, and are careful to keep it under as their enemy. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 25 to 27. 12. Carnal security, or a presumptuous confidence that their condition is already good. Many cry peace and safety when sudden destruction is coming upon them. This was that which kept the foolish virgins sleeping when they should have been working, upon their beds when they should have been at the market. They did not perceive their lack of oil till the bridegroom had come, and while they went to buy, the door was shut. I know that these foolish virgins had no successors. Where is the place, yea, where is the house almost, where such do not dwell? Men are willing to cherish in themselves, upon ever so slight grounds, a hope that their condition is good, and so are not concerned about a change, and by these means perish in their sins. Are you at peace? Show me upon what grounds your peace is maintained. Is it scripture peace? Can you show the distinguishing marks of a sound believer? Can you evidence that you have something more than the hypocrite in the world ever had? If not, fear this peace more than any trouble, and know that a carnal peace commonly proves the most mortal enemy of the soul, and while it kisses and smiles and speaks fairly, it fatally smites, as it were, under the fifth rib. By this time I would think uh, that I hear my readers crying out uh, with the disciples, Who then can be saved? Set out from our congregation all these ten racks of the profane on the one hand, and then take out these twelve classes of self-deceiving hypocrites on the other hand, and tell me whether it is not a remnant that shall be saved. How few will be the sheep that are left, when all these have been separated and set aside among the goats? For my part, of all my numerous hearers, I have no hopes to see any of them in heaven that are to be found among these twenty-two classes that I have mentioned, except it be by sound conversion, so that they are brought into another condition. And now, conscience, do your work. Speak out and speak home to him that hears or reads these lines. If you find any of these marks upon him, you must pronounce him utterly unclean. Do not take a lie into your mouth. Do not speak peace to him whom God speaks no peace to. Do not let sense bribe you, or self-love, or carnal prejudice blind you. I summon you from the court of heaven to give your evidence. If you will answer it at your peril, give a true report of the state and case of him that reads this book. Conscience, will you altogether hold your peace at such a time as this? I adjure you by the living God that you tell the truth. Is the man converted, or is he not? Does he allow himself in any way of wickedness, or does he not? Does he truly love and please and prize and delight in God above all things, or not? 
Can conscience give a definite answer? How long shall this soul live in uncertainty? O oh, conscience, bring in your verdict. Is this man a new man, or is he not? How do you find him? Has there passed a thorough and mighty change upon him, or has there not? When was the time, or where was the place, or what was the means by which this thorough change of a new birth was wrought in his soul? Speak, conscience. Or if you cannot tell the time and place, can you show scripture evidence that the work is done? Has the man ever taken off from his false foundation, from the false hopes and false peace in which, which he once trusted? Has he been deeply convicted of sin, and of his lost and undone condition, and brought out of himself, and off from his sins, to give himself up entirely to Jesus Christ? Or do you not find him, to this day, under the power of ignorance, or in the mire of worldliness? Have you not found upon him the gain of unrighteousness? Do you not find him a stranger to prayer, a neglecter of the word, a lover of this present world? Do you not sometimes catch him in a lie? Do you not find his heart fermented with malice, or burning with lust, or going after his covetousness? Speak plainly to all the forementioned particulars. Can you acquit this man, this woman, from being in any one of the twenty-two classes here described? If he is found in any of them, set him aside. His portion is not with the saints. He must be converted, and made a new creature, or he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Beloved, do not be your own betrayers. Do not deceive yourselves, nor set your hands to be your own ruin, by willfully blinding yourselves. Set up a tribunal in your own breasts. Bring the word and the conscience together to the law and to the testimony. Hear what, how the word concludes of your state. O oh, follow the search till you know where your case stands. Make a mistake here, and you perish. And such is the treachery of the heart, the subtlety of the temper, and the deceitfulness of all sin, all conspiring to flatter and to deceive the poor soul, and so common and easy is it to make this mistake, that it is a thousand to one that you will be deceived, unless you are very careful and thorough and impartial in the inquiry into your spiritual condition. Oh, therefore, be diligent in your work, Go to the bottom, search with candles, weigh yourself in the balance, come to the standard of the sanctuary, bring your coin to the touchstone. Satan is a master of deceit. He can draw to the life. He is perfect in the trade. There is nothing which he cannot Im imitate. You cannot wish for any grace, but he can fit you with a counterfeit. Be jealous, trust not even your own heart. Go to God to search you and to try you to examine you, and to prove your reins. If other help do not suffice to bring all to an issue, but you are still at a loss, consult some godly and faithful minister or Christian friend. Do not rest till you have put the business of your eternal welfare out of all doubt. O searcher of hearts, set this soul-searching, and help him in his search. 7. The Miseries of the unconverted. So unspeakably dreadful is the case of every unconverted soul, that I have sometimes thought if I could only convince men that they are still unregenerate, the work were more than half done. But I find by sad experience that such a spirit of sloth and slumber possesses the unsanctified, that though they are convicted, they are not yet converted, and often they carelessly sit still through the love of sensual pleasure, or the hurry of worldly business, or the noise and clamour of earthly cares and lusts and affections, the voice of conscience is drowned, and men go no further than some cold wishes and general purpose of repenting and amending. It is therefore of high necessity that I not only convince men that they are unconverted, but I also endeavour to bring them to a sense of the fearful misery of that state. But here I find myself a ground at first setting off. For what tongue can tell the heirs of hell sufficiently of their misery, unless it were that of Dives in his flame? Luke chapter 16 verse 24. Where is the ready writer whose pen can depict the misery of those who are without God in the world? This cannot be fully done unless we know the infinite ocean of bliss which is in perfection in God. 
and from which a state of sin excludes men. Who knoweth, says Moses, the power of thine anger? Psalm 90 verse 11. And how shall I tell men that which I do not know? Yet so much we do know that one would think it would shake the heart of that man that had the least degree of spiritual life or sense. Well, this is yet a more perplexing difficulty that I am to speak to them who are without spiritual sense. Alas, this is not the least part of man's misery that he is dead and dead in trespasses and sins. Could I bring paradise into view or represent the kingdom of heaven to as much advantage as the tempter did the kingdoms of the world and the glories thereof to our Saviour? Or could I uncover the face of the deep and the devouring gulf of Tophet with all its terrors and open the gates of the infernal furnace? Alas, he has no eyes to see it. Could I paint the beauties of holiness or the glories of the gospel? Or could I expose to view the more than diabolical deformity and ugliness of sin? He can no more judge of the loveliness and the beauty of the one or the filthiness and the hatefulness of the other than a blind man can of colours. He is alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in him because of the blindness of his heart. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18 He neither knows nor can know the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 His eyes cannot be savingly opened but by converting grace. Acts chapter 26 verse 18 He is a child of darkness he walks in darkness, yea, the very light that is in him is darkness. Shall I ring his knell, or read his sentence, or sound in his ears the terrible trump of God's judgments, that one would think should both make both of his ears to tingle, and strike into him and Belshazzar's fit, even to change his countenance, loosen his joints, make his knees to smite one against the other? Alas, he perceives me not. He has no ears to hear. Or shall I call up the daughters of music and sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb? Yet he will not be stirred. Shall I allure him with the joyful sound and the lovely song and the glad tidings of the gospel with the most sweet and inviting calls, comforts and cordials of the divine promises so exceeding great and precious? It will not affect him savingly unless I could find him ears as well as tell him the news. What then shall I do? Shall I show him the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone? Or shall I open the box of spikenard, very precious, that fills the whole house of the universe with its perfume, and hope that the saviour, savour of Christ's ointment and the smell of his garments will attract him? Alas, dead sinners are like the dumb idols. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They are destitute of spiritual sense and motion. Let me try the sense that leaves us, and draw the sword of the word. Yet, though I choose mine arrows from God's quiver, and direct them to his heart, and nevertheless he does not feel it. For how should he be in past feeling? Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 So that though the wrath of God abide on him and the mountainous weight of so many sins yet he goes up and down as light as if nothing availed him. In a word he carries a dead soul within a living body and his flesh is but the walking coffin of a corrupt mind that is twice dead. Jude chapter 12 Which way then shall I come at the miserable object that I have to deal with? Who shall make the heart of stone relent, or the lifeless carcass to feel and to move? That God, who is able of stones to raise up children unto Abraham, that raises the dead and melts the mountains, and strikes water out of the flint, that loves to work beyond the hopes and beliefs of man, that peoples his churches with dry bones, he is able to do this. Therefore I bow my knee to the Most High God, and as our Saviour prayed at the sepulchre of Lazarus, and the Shunammite ran to the man of God for her dead child, so your mourning minister carries you in the arms of prayer to that God in whom your help is found.
O thou all powerful Jehovah, who workest and none can hinder thee, who hast the keys of death and hell, pity thou the dead souls that lie here entombed, and roll away the gravestone, and say to the dead body of Lazarus, Come forth, lighten now this darkness, O inaccessible light, and let the day spring from on high visit the dark regions of the dead to whom I speak, for thou canst open the eye that death hath closed, thou that formest the ear can restore the hearing. Say thou to these ears, Ephatha, be thou opened, and they shall be opened. Give thou eyes to see thine excellences, a taste that may relish thy sweetness, a scent that may savour thy ointment, a feeling that may discern the privileges of thy favour, the burden of thy wrath, the intolerable weight of unpardoned sin, and give thy servant order to prophesy to dry bones, and let the effect of this prophecy be as of thy prophet, when he prophesied in the valley of dry bones into a living army exceeding great. But I must proceed as I am able to unfold that misery which I confess no tongue can unfold, no heart can sufficiently comprehend. Know therefore that while you are unconverted, one, the infinite love of God is engaged against you. It is no small part of your misery that you are without God. How does Micah run crying after the Danites? You have taken away my gods, and what have I more? Judges chapter 18 verse 24. Oh, what a morning must then you lift up who are without God, who can claim, lay no claim to him without a daring usurpation. How piercing a moan is that of Saul in his last extremity. The Philistines are upon me, and God is departed from me. First Samuel chapter 28 verse 15. Sinners, what will you do in the day of your visitation? Where will you flee for help? Where will you leave your glory? What will you do when the Philistines are upon you? When the world shall take its eternal leave of you, when you must bid your friends, houses and lands farewell for ever, what then, I say, will you do, who have not God to go to? Who will you, will you call on him? Will you cry to him for, for help? Alas, then he will not own you. He will not take any notice of you, but will send you away with, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew chapter 7 verse 23 They who know what it is to have a God to go to, a God to live upon, they know a little what a fearful misery it is to be without God. This made a holy man cry out, Let me have God or nothing. Let me know him and his will, and what will please him, and how I may come to enjoy him. Or would I never have an understanding to know anything? But you are not only without God, God is against you. Oh, if God would stand neutral, so he did not own nor help the poor sinner, his case were not so deeply miserable. But God should give up the poor creature to the will of his enemies, to do their worst with him, though he should deliver him over to the tormentors, the devil should tear and torture him with their utmost power and skill, yet this were not half so fearful. But God will set himself against the sinner, and believe it, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 There is no friend like him, no enemy like him. As much as heaven is above the earth, omnipotence above impotence, so much more terrible is it to fall into the hands of a living God than into the paws of bears or lions, yea, furies and devils. God himself will be your tormentor. Your destruction shall come from the presence of the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 If God is against you, who can be for you? If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 25 Thou, even thou, art to be feared, and who shall stand in thy sight when th once thou art angry? Psalm, Psalm 76 verse 7 
Who or what shall deliver you out of his hands? Can money, riches, profit not in the day of wrath? Proverbs chapter 11 verse 4. Can kings or warriors? No, they shall cry to the mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 to 17. Sinner, I think this should go like a dagger to your heart to know that God is your enemy. Where will you go? Where will you shelter yourself? There is no hope for you unless you lay down your weapons and sue out your pardon and get Christ to stand as your friend and make your peace. If it were not for this, you might go into some howling wilderness and there pine in sorrow and run mad for anguish of heart and horrible despair. But in Christ, there is a possibility of mercy for you, yea, an offer of mercy to you, that you may have God more for you than he is now against you. But if you will not forsake your sins, nor turn thoroughly and purposefully to God by a sound conversion, the wrath of God abides upon you, and he proclaims himself to be against you, as in the prophet, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee. Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 8 His face is against you. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them. Psalm 34 verse 16 Woe to them whose God, whom God shall set his face against, when he did but look on the host of the Egyptians, how terrible was the consequence. I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and will cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 8 His heart is against him. He hates all the workers of iniquity. Man, does not your heart tremble to think of your being an object of God's hatred? Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be towards this people, cast them out of my sight. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 1 My soul loathed them, and their souls also abhorred me. Zechariah chapter 11 verse 8 His attributes are against you. His justice is like a flaming sword unsheathed against you. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine adversaries, and will behold them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood. Deuteronomy 32 verses 41 to 42. So exact is justice that it will by no means clear the guilty. God will not discharge you. He will not hold you guiltless, but will require the whole debt in person from you unless you can make a scripture claim to Christ and his satisfaction. When the enlightened sinner looks on justice and sees the balance in which he must be weighed and the sword by which he must be executed, he feels an earthquake in his breast. But Satan keeps this out of sight and persuades the soul, while he can, that the Lord is all made up of mercy and so lulls it asleep in sin. Divine justice is exact. It must have satisfaction to the uttermost farthing. It denounces indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish to every soul that doeth evil. Romans 2 verses 8 to 9. It curseth every one that continues not in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. The justice of God to the unpardoned sinner who has a, a sense of his guilt is more terrible than the sight of the creditor to the bankrupt debtor or of the judge and bench to the robber or of the irons and gibbet to the guilty murderer. When justice sits upon life and death what dreadful work does it make with the wretched sinner? Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness where shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Matthew chapter 22 verse 13 and 25 verse 41. This is the terrible sentence 
that justice pronounces. Sinner, by this severe justice must you be tried, and as God liveth, this killing sentence must you hear, unless you repent and be converted. The holiness of God is against you. He is not only angry with you, so he may be with his children, but he has a fixed habitual displeasure against you. God's nature is infinitely contrary to sin, and so he cannot delight in a sinner who is out of Christ. Oh, what a misery is this to be out of the favour, yea, under the hatred of God, that God who can as easily lay aside his nature and cease to be God as to be contrary to you and detest you, except you be changed and renewed. O oh, sinner, how dare you think of the bright and radiant sun of purity, or the beauties, the glory, the holiness of God? The stars are not pure in his sight. He humbles himself to behold things that are done in heaven. Job 25 verse 5 Psalm 113 verse 6 Oh those all-searching eyes of his! What do they spy in you? And have you no interest in Christ neither, that he should please plead for you? I think he should hear you crying out, astonished with the Bethshemites. Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? The power of God is mounted like a mounted cannon against you. The glory of God's power is to be displayed in the amazing confusion and destruction of those that obey not the gospel. He will make his power known in them. Romans chapter 9 verse 22. How mightily he can torment them. For this end he raises them up that he might make his power known. Romans chapter 9 verse 17. O man, are you able to contend with your maker? Sinner, the power of God's anger is against you, and power and anger together make a fearful work. It were better you had all the world in arms against you than to have the power of God against you. There is no escaping his hand, no breaking his prison. The thunder of his power, who can understand? Job 26 verse 14 Unhappy man that shall understand it by feeling it, if he contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and prospered? Which removeth the mountains, and they know it not? Which overturneth them in his anger? Which shaketh the earth out of her place? And the pillars thereof tremble? Which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not? And sealeth up the stars? Who shall say unto him, what doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. Job chapter 9 And are you a fit match for such an antagonist? O oh, consider this, ye that forget God, lest he tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Psalm 50 verse 22 Submit yourself to mercy. Let not, not dust and stubble stand out against the Almighty. Set not briars and thorns against him in battle, lest he go through them and consume them together. But lay hold on his strength, that you may make peace with him. Isaiah chapter 27 verses 4 to 5. Woe to him that striveth with his maker. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 9. The wisdom of God is set to ruin you. He has ordained his arrows and prepared instruments of death and made all things ready. Psalm 7 verses 11 to 13. His counsels are against you to contrive your destruction. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 11. He laughs in himself to see how you will be taken away and then ensnared in the evil day. Psalm 37 verse 13. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is coming. He sees how you will come down mightily in a moment, how you will wring your hands and tear your hair and eat your flesh and gnash your teeth for anguish and astonishment of heart when you see you are fallen irredeemably into the pit of destruction. The truth of God is sworn against you. He is faithful and true. 
you must perish if you go on unless he is false to his word you must die except you repent if we believe not yet he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13 he is faithful to his threatenings as well as to his promises and will show his faithfulness in your destruction if we believe him not God has told you as plain as it can be spoken that if he wash you not you have no part in him if you live after the flesh you shall die but except you be converted you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven and John chapter 13 verse 8 Romans chapter 8 verse 13 Matthew 18 verse 3 Beloved as the immutable faithfulness of God in his promise and oath affords believers strong consolation so it is to unbelievers for strong consternation and confusion O sinner tell me what do you think of all the threatenings of God's word that stand upon record against you do you believe that they are true or not if not you are a wretched infidel but if you do believe them O oh, heart of adamant that you have that you can, you can walk up and down in quiet when the truth and faithfulness of God are already engaged to destroy you the whole book of God testifies against you while you remain unconverted it condemns you in every leaf it is to you like Ezekiel's roll written within and without with lamentation and mourning and woe and all this shall surely come upon you except you repent heaven and earth shall pass away but one jot or tittle of this word shall never pass away Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 now put all this together and tell me if the case of the unconverted is not deplorably miserable as we read of some persons that have bound themselves with an oath and a curse to kill Paul so you must know O sinner that all the attributes of the infinite God are bound by an oath to punish you O man what will you do where will you flee if God's omniscience can find you you have no escape if the true and faithful God will regard his oath perish you must except you believe and repent if the Almighty has power to torment you you must be perfectly miserable in soul and body to all eternity unless this be prevented by speedy conversion 2. the whole creation of God is against you the whole creation says Paul groans and travails in pain Romans 8.22 but what is it that the creation groans under the fearful abuse it is subject to in serving the lusts of unsanctified men is what it groans under and what is it that the creation groans for is for freedom and liberty from this abuse for the creature is not willingly made subject to this bondage Romans 8 22 if the irrational and inanimate creatures had speech and reason they would cry out under it as a bondage insufferable to be abused by the ungodly contrary to their natures and the ends for which the great creator made them it is a saying of an eminent divine the liquor that the drunkard drinks if it had reason like a man would know how shamefully it is abused would groan in the bowel against him it would groan in the cup against him groan in his throat groan in his stomach against him it would fly in his face if he could speak and if God should open the mouths of his creatures as he did the mouth of Balaam's ass the proud man's garment on his back would groan against him there's not a creature if it had to know how it is abused till a man be converted but would groan against him the land would groan to bear him the air would groan to give him breath their houses would groan to lodge them their beds would groan to ease them their food to nourish them their clothes to cover them and the creature would groan to give them any help or comfort so long as they live in sin and rebellion against God I think this should be a terror to an unconverted soul to think that he is a burden on creation cut it down why cut
cumbereth it the ground. Luke 13 verse 7. If inanimate creatures could but speak, your food would say, Lord, must I nourish such a wretch as this, and hold forth my strength for him to dishonour thee? No, I would rather choke him, if thou would give me the commission. The very heir would say, Lord, must I give this man breath, to set his tongue against heaven, and scorn thy people, and vent his pride and wrath in filthy talk, to belch out oaths and blasphemy against thee? No, if thou wilt say the word, he shall be breathless for me. The poor beast would say, Lord, must I carry him upon his wicked designs? No, I would rather break his bones, I would rather end his days, if I had but leave from thee. A wicked man? The earth groans under him, hell groans for him, till death satisfies both. While the Lord of hosts is against you, be sure the host of the Lord is against you, and all the creatures as it were an arm still, until the man's conversion and the controversy is settled between God and him, and he makes a covenant of peace with the creatures for him. Job chapter 5 verses 22 to 24, Hosea chapter 2 verses 18 to 20. 3. Satan has full power over you. You are fast in the paw of that roaring lion who is greedy to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. In the snare of the devil, held captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26. This is the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. His drudges they are, and his lusts they do. He is the ruler of the darkness of this world. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. That is, of ignorant sinners who live in darkness. You pity the poor Indians who worship the devil for their God, but little think it is your own case. It is the common misery of all the unsanctified that the devil is their God. Not that they intend to do him homage, they will be ready to defy him, and him that should say so of them, but all this while they do serve him and live under his government. His servants ye are whom ye obey. Romans 6 verse 16. Oh, how many will then be found to be the real servants of the devil, who take themselves now for no other than the children of God? He can no sooner offer a sinful delight or opportunity for your unlawful advantage than you embrace it. If he suggests a lie or prompts you to revenge, you readily obey. If he forbids you to read or to pray, you hearken to him, and therefore his servants ye are. Indeed, he stands behind the curtain, he acts in the dark, and sinners do not see who sets them working, but all the while he leads them. Doubtless the liar does not intend to serve Satan, but his own advantage. Yet it is he that stands unobserved and puts the thing into his heart. Undoubtedly, doubtedly Judas, when he sold his master for money, and the Chaldeans and Sabaeans, when they plundered Job, did not intend to do the devil a pleasure, but to satisfy their own covetousness. Yet it was he that actuated them in their wickedness. John chapter 13 verse 27, Job chapter 1 verses 12, 15 and 17. Men may be very slaves and common drudges for the devil and not know it. Nay, they may please themselves in thoughts of liberty. Are you yet in ignorance and not turn from darkness to light? I fear then that you are under the power of Satan. Do you live in the willful practice of any known sin? Know that you are of the devil. Do you live in strife, or envy, or malice? Verily, he is your father. O oh, dreadful case! However Satan may provide his slaves with various pleasures, yet it is but to draw them down to endless perdition. The serpent comes with a fruit in his mouth, but, as with Eve, you do not see the deadly sting. He that is now your tempter will one day be your tormentor. Oh, that I could but make you see how bad a master it is you serve, how merciless a tyrant you gratify, whose pleasure is to set you on to make your perdition and damnation sure, 
and heat the furnace hotter and hotter in which you must burn for millions and millions of ages. 4. The guilt of all your sins lies upon you like a mountain. Poor soul, you do not feel it, but this is that which seals your misery. While unconverted, none of your sins are blotted out. They are all upon record against you. Regeneration and remission are never separated. The unsanctified are unjustified and unpardoned. It is a fearful thing to be in debt, but above all to be in God's debt. For there is no arrest so formidable as this, no prison so dreary as his. Look upon the enlightened sinner, who feels the weight of his own guilt. Oh, how frightful are his looks! How fearful are his complaints! His comforts are turned into wormwood, and his moisture into drought, and his sleep is departing from his eyes. He is a terror to himself and all that are about him, and is ready to envy the very stones that lie in the street, because they are without sense and do not feel his misery. He wishes that he had been a dog rather than a man, because then death would, put a, would have put an end to his misery, whereas now it is but the beginning of that which he will know no end. However, he may make light of it now, you will one day find the guilt of unpardoned sin to be a heavy burden. This is a millstone, that whosoever falls upon it shall be broken, but upon whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Matthew 21 verse 44 The guilt of our sins caused the agony and death of the blessed Saviour. And if it did this in the green tree, what shall it do in the dry? Oh, think of your case in time. Can you think of that threat without uh, trembling? You shall die in your sins. And John chapter 8 verse 24 Oh, better were it for you to die in jail, in a ditch, in a dungeon, than to die in your sins. If death, as it will take away all your comforts, would take away all your sins too, it would be some mitigation. But your sins will follow you where your friends cannot where all worldly enjoyments shake hands and part with you. Your sins will not die with you, as a prisoner's debts die with him, but they will go to judgment with you, there to be your accusers, and they will go to hell with you, there to be your tormentors. Oh, the work that these will make you! Oh, look over your debts in time! How every one of God's commandments is ready to arrest you, and take you by the throat for the innumerable bonds it has upon you. What will you do, then, uh, when they shall all together come against you? Hold open the eyes of your conscience and consider this, that you may despair of yourself, that you may be driven to Christ, and fly for refuge to lay hold on the hope that is set before you. 5. Your raging lusts miserably ensnare you. While unconverted, you are a very servant to sin. It reigns over you, it holds you under its dominion, till you are brought within the bonds of God's covenant. There is not such a, another tyrant as sin. Oh, the vile and fearful work that it engages its servants into! Would it not pierce your heart to see a company of poor creatures drudging and toiling to car carry together faggots and fuel for their own burning? This is the employment of sin's drudges. Even while they bless themselves in their unrighteous gains, while they sing in their pleasures, they are but treasuring up vengeance for their own eternal burning. They are but adding to the pile of tofet and flinging in oil to make the flame rage the fiercer. Who would serve such a master whose work is drudgery and whose wages is death? What a woeful spectacle was the poor wretch pressed with the legion. Will you not have grieved your hearts to see him among the tombs cutting and wounding himself? This is your case. Such is your case. Every stroke is a thrust at your heart. Conscience indeed is now asleep, but when death and judgment shall bring you to your senses, then you will feel the anguish in every wound. The convinced sinner is an instance of the miserable bondage of sin. Conscience flies upon him, he tells him that the end of these things is death, and he is such a slave to his lusts that on he goes, though he sees it is to his perdition. 
when the temptation comes lust breaks the cords of all his vows and promises and carries on him on headlong to his own destruction 6. The furnace of eternal vengeance is heated ready for you Hell and destruction open their mouths for you they gape for you they groan for you Isaiah 5 verse 14 waiting as it were with greedy eyes as you stand on the brink if the wrath of man be as the roaring of a lion Proverbs 19 verse 12 more heavy than sand Proverbs 27 verse 3 what is that to the wrath of infinite God if the burning furnace heated in Nebuchadnezzar's fiery rage when he commanded it to be made seven times hotter was so fierce as to burn up even those who drew near to throw the three children in how hot is that burning of the Almighty's fury surely this is seventy times seven more fierce what can you think O oh man of being a faggot in hell to all eternity can thine heart endure or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 14 can you abide the everlasting burnings can you dwell with consuming fire when you shall be as glowing iron in hell and your whole body and soul shall be perfectly possessed by God's burning vengeance as the sparkling iron with fire when heated in the fiercest furnace some of the choicest servants of God when under the hidings of his face and the dreadful effects of his displeasure have bewailed their condition with bitter lamentations how then will you endure when God shall pour out all his vials and set himself against you to torment you when he shall make your conscience the tunnel by which he will be pouring his burning wrath into your soul for ever when he shall fill all your pores as full of torment as they are now full of sin when immortality shall be your misery and to die the death of a brute and to be swallowed up in the gulf of annihilation will be such a felicity as a whole eternity of wishes and an ocean of tears could never purchase now you can put off the evil day and laugh and be merry and forget the terrors of the Lord but how will you hold out or hold up when God casts you into that bed of torments Revelation chapter 2 verse 22 or makes you to lie down in sorrows Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 when roarings and blasphemies shall be your only music and the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation shall be your only drink Revelation 14 verse 10 in a word when the smoke of your torment shall ascend for ever and ever and you shall have no rest day or night no rest in your conscience no ease in your bones but shall be an execration and astonishment and a curse and a reproach for evermore Jeremiah 42 verse 18 O sinner stop here and consider if you are a man and not a senseless block consider think where you are standing upon the very brink of destruction as the Lord liveth and as your soul liveth there is but a step between you and this do you not know when you lie down but you may be in hell before you rise in the morning do you not know when you rise that you may drop into hell before night dare you make light of this will you go on in such a dreadful condition as if nothing availed you if you put it off and say it does not belong to you look again over the previous chapter and tell me the truth are none of those black marks found against you do not blind your eyes do not deceive yourself see your misery while you may prevent it think what it is to be a vile outcast a lost reprobate a vessel of wrath into which the Lord will be pouring out his tormenting fury while he has a being divine wrath is a fierce devouring everlasting unquenchable fire and this must be your portion unless you consider your ways and speedily turn to the Lord by a sound conversion sinner it is in vain to flatter you this would be but to draw you into that in unquenchable fire know from the living God that here you must lie with these burnings you must dwell till immortality die 
and immutability change till eternity run out and omnipotence is no longer able to punish except you be in good earnest renewed by sanctifying grace 7 the law discharges all its threats and curses at you oh how dreadfully does it thunder it flashes devouring fire in your face its words are as drawn swords and as sharp arrows of the mighty it demands satisfaction to the utmost and cries justice justice it speaks blood and war and wounds and death against you O oh man away to your stronghold away from your sins haste to the sanctuary the city of refuge even the Lord Jesus Christ hide in him or else you are lost without any hope of recovery 8 the gospel itself binds the sentence of eternal damnation upon you if you continue in your impenitent or unconverted state know that the gospel denounces a much sorer condemnation than ever would have been for the transgression only of the first covenant is it not a dreadful case to have the gospel itself fill its mouth with threats to have the Lord to roar from Mount Zion against you Joel chapter 3 verse 16 hear the terror of the Lord he that believeth not shall be damned except you repent you shall all perish this is condemnation that the light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light he that believeth not the wrath of God abideth on him if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation he that despised Moses' law died without mercy of how much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God Matthew chapter 16 verse 16 Luke chapter 13 verse 3 John chapter 3 verse 19 and verse 36 Hebrews chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 Hebrews chapter 10 verses 28 to 29 and is this true indeed is this your misery yea it is as true as God is better open your eyes and see now while you may remedy it than blind and harden yourself till to your eternal sorrow you will feel what you would not believe and if it is true what do you mean by lingering and loitering in such a state as this alas for you poor man how effectively sin has undone you depraved you and despoiled you of even your reason to look after your own everlasting good O oh, wretched man what stupidity and senselessness has surprised you well let me knock and awake this sleeper who dwells within the walls of this flesh is there a soul in there a rational understanding soul or are you only a senseless lump are you a rational soul and yet so far brutified as to forget that you are immortal and to think yourself to be as the beasts that perish O oh, unhappy soul that was the glory of man the companion of angels and the image of God that was God's representative in the world and had the supremacy among the creatures and the dominion over the maker's works are you now become a slave to sense are you heaping together a little refined earth so unsuited to your spiritual and immortal nature oh why do you not consider where you will spend eternity death is at hand the judge is even at the door yet a little while and time shall be no longer and will you run the hazard of continuing in such a state in which if you are overtaken you are irrecoverably miserable come then arise and attend to your dearest concerns tell me where are you going what will you live in such a course in which every act is a step towards perdition and you do not know but the next night you may, may be making your bed in hell oh if you have a spark of reason consider and turn and hearken to your true friend who would show you your present misery 
that you might in time make your escape and be eternally happy. Hear what the Lord saith. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord, will you not tremble at my presence? Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 22. O sinners, do you make light of the wrath to come? I'm sure there is a time coming when you will not make light of it. Why, the very devils believe and tremble. What? Are you more hardened than they? Will you run upon the edge of the precipice? Will you play at the hole of the asp? Will you put your hand into the cockatrice's den? Will you dally with devouring wrath, as if you were indifferent, whether you escape or endure it? There is no one so beside himself as the willful sinner, that goes on in his unconverted state without sense, as if nothing ailed him. The man that runs into the cannon's mouth and sports with his blood, or lets out his life for a frolic, is sensible, sober, and serious, compared with him that goes on still in his trespasses. For he stretcheth out his hand against God, stretcheth himself against the Almighty. He runneth upon him, even upon his neck, upon the thick bosses of his bucklers. Job chapter 15, verses 25 to 26. Is it wisdom to sport with the second death? Or to venture into the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone? What shall I say? I can find no expression, no comparison, by which to set forth the dreadful madness of that soul which will go on in sin. Awake! Awake, O sinner! Arise and take your flight. There is but one door that you may flee by, and that is the narrow door of conversion and the new birth. Unless you turn unfeignedly from all of your sins and come to Jesus Christ and take him for the Lord your righteousness and walk in him in holiness and newness of life, as the Lord liveth, it is not more certain that you are now out of hell than that you shall without fail be in it but a few days or nights from now. O oh, set your heart to think on your case. Does not your everlasting misery or welfare deserve a little consideration? Look again over the miseries of the unconverted. If the Lord not spoken by me, regard me not. But if it is the very word of God that all this misery lies upon you, what a state you are in. It is for one uh, that has his senses to live in such a condition and not make all possible haste to prevent his own utter ruin O man who has bewitched you that in the matters of this present life you should be wise enough to forecast your business foresee your danger prevent your ruin but in matters of everlasting consequence shall be slight and careless as if they concerned you little is it nothing to you to have all the attributes of God engaged against you? Can you live without his favour? Can you escape his hands or endure his vengeance? Do you hear the creation groaning under you and hell groaning for you and think your case good enough? Are you under the power of corruption in the dark noisome prison fettered with lusts working out your own damnation? And is this not worth a thought? Will you make light of all the terrors of the law, all its curses and thunders, as if they were but the threatenings of a child? Do you laugh at hell and destruction? Or can you drink the envenomed cup of the Almighty's fury, as if it were but a common potion? Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. Are you such a leviathan, as that the scales of your pride should resist your Maker? Will you esteem him, and his arrows as straw, and the instruments of death as rotten wood? Are, all, are you chief of all the children of pride, even that you should count his darts as stubble, and laugh at the shaking of his spear? Do you mock at fear? And are you not frightened? Do you not turn back from God's word when his quiver rattles against you, the glittering spear and the shield? Well, if the threats and calls of the word will not awaken you, I am sure death and judgment will. But what will you do when the Lord comes forth against you, and in his fury falls upon you, and you shall feel what you now but read? If when Daniel's enemies were cast into the den of lions, 
both they and their wives and their children. The lions had mastery over them and broke all their bones in pieces ere ever they came to the bottom of the den. What shall become of you when you fall into the hands of the living God? Who do not then contend with God, repent and be converted, so none of this shall come upon you. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 6 to 7 8. Directions to the Unconverted Before you read these directions, I advise you, yea, I charge you before God and his holy angels, that you resolve to follow them, as far as conscience shall be convinced of their agreeableness to God's word and to your state, and call his assurance and a blessing that they may succeed. And as I have sought the Lord and consulted his oracles as to what advice to give you, so must you entertain it with that awe, reverence, and purpose of obedience which the word of the living God requires. Now then attend. Set your hearts unto all that I shall testify unto you this day, for it is not a vain thing, it is your life. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 46 This is the aim of all that has been spoken hitherto, to bring you to set your hearts upon turning to God. I would not trouble you, nor torment you before the time with the thoughts of your eternal misery, but in order that you make your escape. Were you shut up under your present misery, without remedy, it were but mercy to let you alone, that you might take in that little poor comfort which you are capable of in this world. But you may yet be happy if you do not willfully refuse the means of your recovery. Behold, I lay open the door to you. Arise and take your flight. I see the way of life before you. Walk in it and you shall live and not die. It grieves me that you should be your own murderers and throw yourself headlong when God and man cry out to you as Peter in another case to his master, Spare thyself. The destruction of the ungodly man is willful. God that made them cries out to them, as Paul to the jailer when about to murder himself, Do thyself no harm. The ministers of Christ forewarn them and follow them and will gladly have them back. But alas, no expostulations or entreaties will prevail. But men will hurl themselves into perdition while pity itself looks on. What shall I say? Would it not grieve a person of any humanity if, in the time of a raging plague, he should have a remedy that would infallibly cure all the country and recover the most hopeless patients, and yet his friends and neighbours should die by hundreds around him because they would not use it? Men and brethren, though you carry the certain symptoms of death on your faces, yet I have a prescription that will cure you all infallibly. Follow these directions... And if you do not then win heaven, I will be content to lose it. Hear then, O sinner, and as ever you would be converted and saved, take the following counsel. 1. Set it down with yourself as an undoubted truth that it is impossible for you ever to get to heaven in this your unconverted state. Can any other but Christ save you? He, and he tells you he will never do it except you be regenerated and converted does he not keep the keys of heaven and can you go in without his leave as you must if ever you go in your natural condition without a sound and thorough conversion 2. Labour to get a thorough sight and lively sense and feeling of your sins till men are weary and heavy laden and pricked to the heart and quite sick of sin, they will not come to Christ for cure, nor sincerely inquire, What shall I do? They must see themselves as dead men before they will come to Christ, that they might live. Labour, therefore, to set all of your sins in order before you. Do not be afraid to look upon them, but let your spirit make diligent search. 
inquire into your heart and into your life, enter into a thorough examination of yourself and all your ways, that you may make a full discovery and call in the help of God's Spirit out of the sense of your own inability to do this by yourself, for it is his proper work to convince of sin. Spread all before your conscience till your heart and eyes are set to weeping. Do not leave striving with God and your own soul till it cry out under the sense of your sins as the enlightened jailer, What must I do to be saved? To this purpose, meditate on the number of your sins. David's heart failed him when he thought of this and considered that he had more sins than the hairs of his head. This made him cry out for the multitude of God's tender mercies. The loathsome carcass does not more hatefully swarm with crawling maggots than an unsanctified soul with filthy lusts. They take the head, the heart, the eyes and the mouth of him. Look backward. Was there ever a place, whatever was the time, in which you did not sin? Look inward. What part or power can you find in soul or body which is not poisoned with sin? What duty did you ever perform into which this poison is not shed? Oh, how great is the sum of your debt, who have been all your life running upon trust, and never did or can pay off one penny. Look over the sins of your nature, and all its cursed brood, the sins of your life. Call to mind your omissions and commissions, the sins of your thoughts, words and actions, the sins of your youth, and the sins of your riper years. Do not be like a desperate bankrupt, that is afraid to look over his books. Read the, the records of conscience carefully. These books must be opened sooner or later. Meditate upon the aggravation of your sins, as they are the grand enemies of God and of your, and of your life, and of the life of your soul. In a word, they are the public enemies of all mankind. How do David, Ezra, Daniel and the good Levites aggravate their sins from the consideration of their opposition to God and his good and righteous laws and of the mercies and warnings against which they have been committed oh the work that sin has done in the world this is the enemy that has brought in death that has robbed an enslaved man that has turned the world upside down and sown the dissensions between man and the creatures between man and man, yea, between a man and himself, setting the animal part against the rational, the will against the judgment, lust against conscience, yea, worst of all, between God and man, making the sinner both hateful to God and the hater of God. O man, how can you make so light of sin? This is the traitor that thirsted for the blood of the Son of God, that sold him, that mocked him, that scourged him, that spat in his face, that tore his hands, that pierced his side, that pressed his soul, that mangled his body, that never left him till he had bound him, condemned him, nailed him, crucified him, and put him to an open shame. This is that deadly poison, so powerful of operation, that one drop of it, shed on the root of mankind, has corrupted, spoiled, poisoned, and ruined the whole race. This is the bloody executioner that, that has killed the prophets, burned the martyrs, murdered all the apostles, all the patriarchs, all the kings and potentates, that has destroyed cities, swallowed empires, and devoured whole nations. Whatever weapon it was done by, it was sin that caused the execution. Do you yet think it is only a small thing? If Adam and all his children could be dug out of their graves and their bodies piled up to heaven and an inquest were made as to what matchless murderer were guilty of all this blood it will be found to be sin study the nature of sin till your hearts incline to fear and loathe it and meditate on the aggravation of your particular sins how you have sinned against all of God's warnings against your own prayers against mercies against corre corrections against the clearest light against freest love against your own resolutions against promises vows and covenants of better obedience 
charge your heart with these things till it blushes with shame and be brought out of all good opinion of itself meditate on the desert of sin it cries to heaven it calls for vengeance its due wages are death and damnation it brings the curse of God upon the soul and the body the least sinful word or thought lays you under the infinite wrath of God oh, what a load of wrath what, what a weight of curses what treasures of vengeance have all the millions of your sins deserved oh judge yourself that the Lord may not judge you meditate on the deformity and the defilement of sin it is black as hell the very image and likeness of the devil drawn upon the soul it would terrify to see yourself in the hateful deformity of your nature there is no mire so unclean no plague or leprosy so noisome as sin in which you are plunged and rendered more displeasing to the pure and holy nature of the glorious God than the vilest object can be to you could you take up a toad into your bosom and cherish it and take delight in it but you are as contrary to the pure and perfect holiness of the divine nature till you are purified by the blood of Jesus and the power of renewing grace above all other sins consider these two one the sin of your heart it is to little purpose to lop off the branches while the root of corruption remains untouched in vain do men lave out the streams when the fountain is running that fills them up again let the acts of your repentance with David's go to the root of sin study how deep how permanent is your natural pollution how universal it is till you cry out with Paul against your body of death the heart is never soundly broken till thoroughly convinced of the heinousness of its original and deeply rooted depravity here fix your thoughts this is that which makes you backward to all good and prone to all evil that sheds blindness pride prejudice and unbelief into your mind enmity inconstancy and obstinacy into your will inordinate heats and colds into your affections insensibleness and unfaithfulness into your conscience slipperiness into your memory in a word it has put every wheel of the soul out of order and made it from a habitation of holiness to become a very hell of iniquity this is what has defiled and perverted all of your members and turned them into weapons of unrighteousness and servants of sin that has filled the head with carnal and corrupt designs the hand with sinful practices the eyes with wandering and wantonness the tongue with deadly poison this is what has opened the ears to tales flattery and filthy talk and shut them against the instructions of life and has rendered your heart the cursed source of all deadly imaginations so that it pours out its wickedness without ceasing even as naturally as the fountain pours forth its waters or as the raging sea casts forth mire and dirt will you ever yet be in love with yourselves and tell us any longer of your good heart oh never leave meditation taking on the desperate contagion the original corruption of your heart till with Ephraim you bemoan yourself and with the deepest shame and sorrow smite on your breast as the publican and with Job abhor yourself and repent in dust and ashes two the particular evil that you are most addicted to fill out all of its aggravations set home upon your heart all God's threats against it repentance drives before it the whole herd but especially sticks the arrow into the beloved sin singles this out above the rest to run it down O oh, labor to make this sin odious to your soul and double your guard and resolutions against it because this is most dishonoring to God and most dangerous to you 3. Strive to affect your heart with a deep sense of your present misery read over the previous chapter again and get it out of the book and into your heart remember when you lie down that for all you know you may awake in flames and when you rise up that the next day may bring you 
to a night in which you spend your bed in hell is it nothing to you to live in such a fearful state to stand tottering on the brink of the bottomless pit to live in the mercy of every disease that if it but fall upon you would send you forthwith into the everlasting burnings suppose you saw a condemned wretch hanging over Nebuchadnezzar's burning fiery furnace by nothing but a thread which was ready to break every moment would not your heart tremble for such an one thou art the man this is your very case O man a woman who reads this if you are yet unconverted what if the thread of life should break and you know not but it may be the next night yea the next moment where would you be then where would you drop verily upon the breaking of this thread you fall into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone where you must lie till God while God has a being if you die in your present state and does not your soul tremble as you read do not your tears wet the paper and your heart throb in your bosom do you yet begin to smite on your breast and think with yourself what need have you of a change oh what is your heart made of have you not only lost all regard to God but all love and pity for yourself oh study your misery till your heart cry out for Christ as earnestly as ever a drowning man did for a boat or the wounded man for a surgeon men must come to see the danger and feel the smart of their deadly sores and sicknesses or Christ will be to them a physician of no value the manslayer hastens to the city of refuge when pursued by the avenger of blood but men must be even forced and driven out of themselves or they will not come to Christ it was distress and extremity that made the prodigal think of returning while Laodicea thinks herself rich increased in goods in, in need of nothing there is little hope of her she must be deeply convinced of her wretchedness blindness poverty and nakedness before she will come to Christ for his gold raiment and eye salve therefore hold the eyes of conscience open amplify your misery as much as possible do not flee the sight of it for fear it should fill you with terror the sense of your misery is but as it were the festering of a wound which is necessary to the cure better now to fear the torments that await you than to feel them hereafter 4. Settle it in your heart that you must look out of yourselves and away from your own doings for any help. That is, do not think that your praying, reading, hearing, confessing, or amending will affect the cure. These must be attended to, but you are undone if you do but rest in them. You are a lost man if you hope to escape drowning on any other plank but Jesus Christ you must unlearn yourself and renounce your own wisdom your own righteousness your own strength and throw yourself wholly upon Christ or you cannot escape while men trust in themselves and establish their own righteousness and have confidence in the flesh they will not come savingly to Christ you must know that your gain is but loss your strength but weakness your righteousness but rags and rottenness before there will be an effectual closure between Christ and yourself can the lifeless body shake off its grave clothes and loose the bands of death then may you recover yourself who are dead in trespasses and sins and under an impossibility of serving your master acceptably in this condition therefore when you go to pray or meditate or to do any of the duties to which you are here directed go out of yourself and call in the help of the spirit as despairing to do anything pleasing to God in your own strength yet do you still neglect duty while the eunuch was reading then the Holy Ghost did send Philip to him when the disciples were praying when Cornelius and his friends were hearing then the Holy Ghost fell upon them and filled them all 5. Henceforth renounce all of your sins 
if you yield yourself to the practice of any sin you are undone in vain do you hope for Christ except in you depart from iniquity forsake your sins or you cannot find mercy you cannot be married to Christ except you be divorced from sin give up the traitor or you can have no peace from heaven keep not Delilah in your lap you must part with your sins or with your soul spare but one sin and God will not spare you your sins must die or you must die for them if you allow one sin though it be but a little one a secret one though you may plead necessity and have a hundred shifts and excuses for it the life of your soul must go for the life of that sin and will not that be dearly bought O sinner hear and consider if you will part with your sins God will give you his Christ is that not a fair exchange I testify unto you this day that if you perish it is not because there was never a saviour provided nor life tendered but because with the Jews you prefer the murderer before the saviour sin before Christ and you love darkness rather than light search your heart therefore as with candles as the Jews did their houses for leaven before the Passover labour to find out your sins enter into your closet and consider what evil have I lived in what duty have I neglected towards God what sin have I lived in against my brother and now strike the dart through the heart of your sin as Joab did through Absalom's do not stand looking at your sins nor rolling the morsel under your tongue but cast it out as poison with fear and detestation alas what will your sins do for you that you should hesitate to part from them they will flatter you but they will undo you and poison you while they please you and arm the justice and wrath of infinite God against you they will open hell for you and pile up the fuel to burn you behold the gibbet that they have preferred for you go treat them like Haman and do upon them the execution that they would else have done upon you away with them crucify them and let Christ only be Lord over you 6. make a solemn choice of God for your portion and blessedness with all possible devotion and veneration avouch the Lord for your God set the world with all its glory and paint and gallantry with all its pleasures and promotions on the one hand and set God with all his infinite excellences and perfections on the other and see that you deliberately do make your choice take up your rest in God sit under his shadow let his promises and perfections turn the scale against all the world settle it in your heart that the Lord is an all sufficient portion that you cannot be miserable while you have God to live upon take him for your shield an exceeding great reward God alone is more than all the world content yourself with him let others profess the, possess the preferments and glory of this world but do you place your happiness in the favour of God and in the light of his countenance poor sinner you have fallen off from God and have engaged his power and wrath against you you know that of his abundant grace he offers to be your God again in Christ what do you say will you have the Lord for your God take this counsel and you shall have him come to him by Christ renounce the idols of your pleasures gain and reputation let these be pulled from their throne and set God's interest uppermost in your hearts take him as God to be chief in your affections and purposes for he will not endure to have any set above him in a word you must take him in all his personal relations and in all his essential perfections in all his personal relations God the Father must be taken for your father who come to him with the prodigal father I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and I am not worthy to be called thy son but since of my wonderful mercy thou art pleased to take me that I am of myself most vile 
even a beast and no man before thee to be a child I solemnly take thee for my father commend thyself myself to thy care and trust to thy providence and cast my burden upon thee I depend on thy provision and submit to thy corrections and trust unto the shadow of thy wings I hide in thy chambers I fly to thy name I renounce all confidence in myself I repose my confidence in thee I declare my engagement with thee I will be for thee and not for another God the Son must be taken for your Saviour your Redeemer and your righteousness he must be accepted as the only way to the Father the only means of life O oh, then put off the raiment of your captivity put on the wedding garment and go and marry yourself to Christ Lord I am thine and all I have my body, soul and estate I give my heart to thee I will be thine undividedly thine everlastingly I will set thy name on all I have and use it only as thy goods during thy absence resigning all to thee I have no king but thee to reign over me other lords may have dominion over me but now I will make mention of thy name alone and do here take an oath of fidelity to thee promising to serve and to fear thee above all competitors I would reject at my own righteousness and despair of ever being pardoned and saved by my own duties or graces and lean solely on thy all sufficient sacrifice and intercession for sin for my pardon life and acceptance before God I take thee for my only guide and instructor resolving to be directed by thee and to wait for thy counsel lastly God the Spirit must be taken for your sanctifier for your advocate your counsellor your comforter the teacher of your ignorance the pledge and earnest of your inheritance awake thou north wind and come thou, thou south and blow upon my garden Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse 16 come thou spirit of the most high here is a temple for thee do thou rest here for ever dwell here lo I give possession to thee full possession I send thee the keys of my heart that all may be thine I give up the use of all to thee that every faculty and every member may be thy instrument to work righteousness and to do the will of my father who is in heaven in all his essential perfections consider how the Lord has revealed himself to you in his word will you take him as such a God O sinner here is the most blessed news that ever came to the sons of man the Lord will be your God if you will but close with him in his excellencies will you have the merciful the gracious sin pardoning God to be your God oh yes says the sinners, sinner otherwise I am undone but he further tells you I am the holy and sin hating God if you will be owned as one of my people you must be holy holy in heart holy in life you must put away all of your iniquities be they ever so dear to you ever so natural ever so necessary to the maintaining of your worldly interest unless you will be at enmity with sin I cannot be your God cast out the leaven put away the evil of thy doings cease to do evil learn to do well bring forth mine enemies or there is no peace to be had with me what does your heart answer Lord I desire to be holy as holy as thou art holy and to be made partaker of thy holiness I love thee not only for thy goodness and mercy but for thy holiness and purity I take thy holiness as my happiness O be to me a fountain of holiness set on me the stamp and impress of thy holiness I will thankfully part with all my sins at thy command my willful sins I do henceforth forsake and for thy mine infirmities that cleave unto me though I will be rid of them I will strive against them continually 
I detest them and will pray against them and never let them have rest in my soul. Beloved, whoever of you will thus accept the Lord, he shall be your God. Again he tells you, I am the all-sufficient God. Will you lay all at my feet, give up all to my disposal, and take me for your only portion? Will you own and honour my all-sufficiency? Will you make me as your happiness and treasure, your hope and bliss? Am I a sun and shield, all in one? Will you have me for your all? Now what do you say to this? Does your soul long for the onions and flesh pots of Egypt? Are you loath to change your earthly happiness for a portion in God? And though you would be glad to have God and the world too, yet can you not think of having him and nothing but him, but had rather take up with the earth below, if God would but let you keep it as long as you would? If so, this is a fearful sign. But now... If you are willing to sell all for this pearl of great price, if your heart answer, Lord, I desire no other portion but thee, take the corn and the wine and the oil who will, that I may have the light of thy countenance. I fix upon thee for my happiness, I gladly venture myself on thee and trust myself with thee. I set my hope in thee, I take up my rest with thee. Let me hear thee say, I am thy God, thy salvation and I have enough, all that I wish for. I will take no terms with thee, but for thyself. Let me have thee for sure, let me be able to make my claim, and see my title to thyself, and for other things I leave them to thee. Give me more or less, anything or nothing, I shall be satisfied in my God. Take him thus, and he is thine own. Again he tells you, I am the Sovereign Lord. If you will have me for your God, you must have me have the supremacy. You must not make me second to sin or to any worldly interest. If you will be my people, I must have the rule over you, and you must not live at your own pleasures. Will you come under my yoke? Will you bow to my government? Will you submit to my discipline, to my word, to my rod? Sinner, what do you say to this? Lord, I'd rather be at thy command than live at my own will. I'd rather have thy will to be done than mine. I approve of and consent to thy laws, and account it my privilege to live under them. And though the flesh rebel, and often break its bounds, I have resolved to take no other lord but thee. I willingly take the oath of thy supremacy, and acknowledge thee for my sovereign, and resolve all my days to pay the tribute of worship, obedience, love, and service to thee, and to live to thee to the end of my life. This is a right acceptance of God. To be short, he tells you, I am the true and faithful God. If you will have me for your God, you must be content to trust me. Will you venture yourselves upon my word, and depend upon my faithfulness, and take my bond for your security? Will you be content to follow me in poverty and reproach and affliction here, and tarry till the next world for your preferment? Will you be content to labour and suffer and to tarry for your returns until the resurrection of the just? My promise will not always be instantly fulfilled. Will you have the patience to wait? Now, beloved, what do you say to this? Will you have this God to be your God? Will you be content to live by faith and trust him for his unseen happiness, an unseen heaven, an unseen glory? Do your hearts answer, Lord, we will venture ourselves upon thee. We commit ourselves to thee. We cast ourselves upon thee. We know whom we have trusted. We are willing to take thy word. We prefer thy promises before our own possessions and the hopes of heaven before all the enjoyments of earth. We will do thy pleasure, what thou wilt hear, so that we may have but thy faithful promise for heaven hereafter. If you can in trust and upon deliberation thus accept of God, he will be yours. Thus there must be, in a right conversion to God, a closing, a closing with him suitable 
to his excellencies but when men close with his mercy but still love sin hating holiness and purity or will take him for their benefactor but not for their sovereign or for their patron and not for their portion this is no thorough or sound conversion 7. Accept Jesus Christ in all his offices as yours upon these terms Christ may be had sinner you have undone yourself and are plunged into the ditch of most deplorable misery out of which you are never able to escape but Jesus Christ is able and ready to help you and he freely tenders himself to you be your sins ever so many ever so great or of ever so long continuance yet you shall be most certainly pardoned and saved if you do not most wretchedly neglect the offer that in the name of God is here made to you the Lord Jesus calls you to look to him and be saved come unto him and he will in no wise cast you out yea he beseeches you to be reconciled he cries in the streets he knocks at your door he invites you to accept him and to live with him if you die it is because you will not come to him for life Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22 John chapter 6 verse 37 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 Proverbs chapter 1 verse 20 Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 John chapter 5 verse 40 Accept an offer to Christ now and you are made forever give your consent to him now and the match is made all the world cannot hinder it do not stand off because of your unworthiness I tell you nothing can undo you but your own unwillingness speak man will you give your consent will you have Christ in all his relations to be yours your king your priest your prophet will you have him and bear his cross do not take Christ without consideration but sit down first and count the cost will you lay all at his feet will you be content to run all hazards with him will you take your lot with him fall where it will will you deny yourself take up your cross and follow him are you deliberately understandingly freely determined to cleave to him in all times and conditions if so you shall never perish but you have passed from death to life here lies the main point of our salvation that you be found in your covenant closure with Christ and therefore if you love yourselves see that you be faithful to God and to your own soul here 8. Resign all your powers and faculties and your whole interest to be his they gave their own selves unto the Lord 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5 present your bodies a living sacrifice Romans chapter 12 verse 1 the Lord seeks not yours but you resign your, therefore your body with its members to him and your soul with all its powers that he may be glorified in your body and in your spirit which are his in a right closing with Christ all of your faculties are given up to him your judgment says Lord thou art worthy of all acceptation chief of ten thousand happy is the man that findeth thee all the things that are to be desired are not to be compared with thee Proverbs chapter 3 verses 15 to 17 the understanding lays aside its corrupt reasonings and cavils and its prejudices against Christ and his ways it is now past questioning and determines for Christ against all of the world it concludes it is good to be here and see such a treasure in this field such a value in this pearl as is worth all Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 to 46 here is the richest prize that ever man was offered here is the most sovereign remedy that was ever prepared he is worthy of my esteem worthy of my choice worthy of my love worthy to be embraced adored admi admired forevermore Revelation chapter 5 verse 12 I approve of his articles his terms are righteous and reasonable full of equity 
and mercy. Again, the will resigns. It stands no longer wavering, but is peremptorily determined, Lord, thy love hath overcome me. Thou hast won me, thou shalt have me. Come in, Lord, to thee I freely open. I consent to be saved in thine own way. Thou shalt have anything, nay, have all, but let me have thee. The memory gives up to Christ. Lord, here is a storehouse for thee. Out with all this trash, lay in thy treasures. Let me be a repository for thy truth, thy promises, thy providences. The conscience comes in. Lord, I will ever side will with thee. I will be thy faithful registrar. I will warn when this sinner is tempted, and smite when thou art offended. I will witness for thee, and judge for thee, and guide into thy ways, and will never let sin have quiet in this soul. The affections also come to Christ. O oh, says love, I am sick for thee. O oh, says desire, now what I have what I have sought for. Here is the desire of nations. Here is bread for me, a balm for me, all that I want. Fear bows the knee with awe and veneration. Welcome, Lord, to thee will I pay my homage. Thy word and rod shall command my actions. Thee will I reverence and adore. Before thee will I fall down and worship. Grief likewise puts in. Lord, thy displeasure and thy dishonour, thy people's calamities and my own iniquities, shall be what sets me a-weeping. I will mourn when they are, thou art offended. I will weep when thy cause is wounded. Anger likewise comes in for Christ. Lord, nothing so enrages me as my folly against me, thee, that I should be so besotted as to hearken to the flatteries of sin and the temptations of Satan against thee. Hatred, too, will side with Christ. I protest mortal enmity to thine enemies. I will never be a friend to thy foes. I vow an eternal quarrel with every sin. I will give no quarter. I will make no peace. Thus let all your powers yield to Jesus Christ. Again, you must give up your whole interest to him. If there is anything that would keep you back from Christ, it will be your undoing. Luke chapter 14 verse 33 Unless you forsake it, in preparation and resolution of your heart, you cannot be his disciple. You must hate father and mother, yea, your own life also, in comparison to him, and as far as it stands in competition with him. In a word, you must give him yourself on all that you have without reservation, or else you can have no part in him. 9. Choose the laws of Christ as the rule of your words, thoughts, and actions. This is the true convert's choice. But here remember these three rules. 1. You must obey them all. There's no getting to heaven by a partial obedience. It's not enough to take up the cheap and the easy part of religion, and let alone the duties for the costly or self-denying, and oppose the interests of the flesh. You must take all or none. A sincere convert, though he makes conscience of the greatest sins and weightiest duties, yet he makes true conscience of little sins and of all duties. 2. You must choose Christ's laws for all times, for prosperity and for adversity. A true convert is resolved in his course. He will stand his choice and will not set his back to the wind and to be of the religion of the times. I have stuck to my testimonies, I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even to the end. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage for ever. I will have respect to thy statutes continually. Psalm 119 3. This must be done deliberately and understandingly. The disobedient son said, Sir, I go, but he went not. How fairly did they promise? All that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, we will do it. And it is likely they meant what they said. But when it came to the trial, it was found that there was not such a heart in them. 
as to do what they had promised. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 27 and 29. If you would be sincere in closing with closing uh, with the laws and the ways of Christ, study the meaning and breadth and extent of them. Remember that they are spiritual, that they reach the very thoughts and inclinations of the heart, so that if you will walk by this rule, your very thoughts and inward motions must be under government. Again, they are very strict and self-denying, quite contrary to your natural inclinations. You must take the straight gate, the narrow way, and be content to have the flesh curbed from the liberty it desires. In a word, they are very large, for thy commandment is exceeding broad. Psalm 119 verse 96 You do not rest in general commands, for there is much deceit in them, but bring down your heart to the particular commands of Christ. Those Jews in the prophet seemed as well resolved as any in the world and called God to witness that they meant as they said but they rested in generals when God's command crossed their inclination they will not obey Jeremiah 43 verses 1 to 6 and 43 verse 2 take the Westminster Assembly's larger catechism and see their excellent and most comprehensive exposition of the commandments and put your heart to it Are you resolved, in the strength of Christ, to set upon the conscientious practice of every duty that you find required of you, and set yourself against every sin that you find to be forbidden to you? This is the way to be sound in God's statutes, that you may never be ashamed. Psalm 119 verse 80 Observe the special duties that your heart is most against, and the special sins that it is most inclined to, and see whether it be truly resolved to perform the one and to forego the other. What do you say to your bosom sin, your profitable sin? What do you say to costly, hazardous, and flesh-displeasing duties? If you halt here and do not resolve by the grace of God to cross the flesh and be in earnest, you are unsound. 10. Let all this be completed in a solemn covenant between God and your soul. Set apart some time, more than once, to be spent in secret before the Lord, in seeking earnestly His special assistance and gracious acceptance of you. In searching your heart, whether you are sincerely willing to forsake all your sins and to resign yourself, body and soul, unto God and His service, to serve Him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. Compose your spirit into the most serious frame possible, suitable to the transaction of so high importance. Lay hold on the covenant of God, and rely on his promises of giving grace and strength, by which you may be enabled to perform your duties. Do not trust to your own strength, or to the strength of your own resolutions, but take hold on his strength. Being thus prepared, on some convenient time set apart for the purpose, enter upon this work, and solemnly, as in the presence of the Lord, fall down on your knees, and spreading forth your hands towards heaven, open your heart to the Lord in these or the like words. O most holy God, for the passion of thy Son I beseech thee, accept thy poor prodigal, now prostrating himself at thy door. I have fallen from thee by mine iniquity, and am by nature a son of death, and a thousandfold more the child of hell by wicked practice. But of thine infinite grace thou hast promised mercy to me in Christ, if I will but turn to thee with all my heart. Therefore, upon the call of thy gospel, I am now come in, and throwing down my weapons, submit myself to thy mercy. For because thou requirest, as a condition of my peace with thee, that I should put away my idols, and be at defiance with all thine enemies, which I acknowledge I have wickedly sided with against thee, I hear from the bottom of my heart renounce them all, firmly covenanting with thee not to allow myself in any known sin, 
but conscientiously to use all the means that I know thou hast prescribed for the death and utter destruction of my corruptions. Whereas formerly I have inordinately and idolatrously set my affections upon the world, I do here resign my heart to thee who madest it, humbly declaring before thy gracious majesty that it is the firm resolution of my heart and that I do unfeignedly desire grace from thee, that when thou shalt call me here unto, I may practice this my resolution through thy assistance to forsake all that is dear to me in this world rather than to turn from thee to the ways of sin and that I will watch against all temptations whether of prosperity or adversity lest they should withdraw my heart from thee I beseech thee also to help me against the temptations of Satan to whose wicked suggestions I resolve by thy grace never to yield myself a servant and because mine own righteousness is but as filthy rags I renounce all my confidence therein and acknowledge that I am of myself a hopeless, helpless, undone creature without righteousness or strength for as much as thou hast of thy bottomless mercy offered most graciously to me a wretched sinner to be again my God through Christ if I would accept thee I call upon heaven and earth to record this day that I do here solemnly avouch thee for the Lord my God and with all possible veneration bearing the neck of my soul under the feet of thy most sacred majesty I do here take thee the Lord Jehovah Father, Son and Holy Ghost for my portion and chief good and do give myself body and soul to be thy servant promising and vowing to serve thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life and since thou hast appointed the Lord Jesus Christ the only means of coming to thee I do here, hereby solemnly join myself in a marriage covenant to him O blessed Jesus I come to thee hungry and thirsty poor and wretched miserable, blind and naked a most a loathsome polluted wretch a guilty, condemned malefactor unworthy to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord much more to be solemnly married to the King of Glory but such is thy unparalleled love I do here with all my power accept thee and do take thee for my head and husband for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer for all times and conditions to love, honour and obey thee before all others and this unto the death I embrace thee in all thine offices I renounce mine own worthiness and do here avow thee to be the Lord my righteousness I renounce my own wisdom and do here take thee for my only guide I renounce my own will and take thy will for my law and since thou hast told me that I must suffer if I will reign I do here covenant with thee to take my lot as it falls with thee and by thy grace assist to run all hazards with thee verily supposing that near, near, neither life nor death shall part between thee and me and because thou hast been pleased to give me thy holy law as the rule of my life and the way which I should walk to thy kingdom I do here willingly put my neck under thy yoke and set my shoulder to thy burden and subscribing to all thy laws as holy, just and good I solemnly take them as the rule of my words, thoughts and actions promising that though my flesh should contradict and rebel yet I will endeavour to order and govern my whole life to thy direction and will not allow myself to ne neglect anything that I know to be my duty only because through the frailty of my flesh I am subject to many failings I am bold humbly to request that unintentional shortcomings contrary to the settled bent and resolution of my heart shall not make this covenant void for so thou hast said now almighty God searcher of hearts thou knowest that I make this covenant with thee this, this day 
without any known guile or reservation, beseeching thee that if thou aspirest any flaw or falsehood therein, thou wouldst reveal it to me, and help me to do it aright. And now, O God the Father, whom I shall be bold from this day forward to look upon as my God and Father, glory be to thee for finding out such a way for the recovery of undone sinners. Glory be to thee, O God the Son, who hast loved me and washed me from my sins in thine own blood, and thou art now become my Saviour, my Redeemer. Glory be to thee, O God the Holy Ghost, who by the finger of thine almighty power has turned about my heart from sin to God. O high and most holy Jehovah, the Lord God, omnipotent, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, thou art now become my covenant friend, and I through thine infinite grace am become thy covenant servant. Amen, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. This covenant I advise you to make, not only in heart but in word, and not only in word but in writing, and that you should with all possible reverence spread the writing before the Lord as if you would present it to him as your act and deed. And when you have done this, set your hand to sign it and keep it. Keep it as a memorial of these solemn transactions that have passed between God and you, and that you may have recourse to it in doubts or temptations. 11. Take heed of delay in your conver conversion, but make a speedy and immediate surrender of your heart to God. I made haste and delayed not. Psalm 119 verse 60. Remember and tremble at the sad instance of the foolish virgins who did not come to the door of mercy until it was shut, or of a convinced Felix who put off Paul to another season, but we do not find that he ever had another season. O oh, come in while it is called today, lest you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, lest the day of grace should be over, and the things which belong to your peace should be hid from your eyes. Now mercy is wooing you. Now Christ is waiting to be gracious to you. And the Spirit of God is striving with you. Now ministers are calling. Now conscience is stirring. Now the market is open and oil may be had. You have the opportunity of buying. Now Christ is to be had for the taking. O oh, strike in now with the offers of grace. O oh, now or never. If you make light of this offer, God may swear in his wrath that you shall never taste of his supper. Luke chapter 14 verse 24 12. Attend conscientiously upon the word as the means appointed for your conversion. Attend, I say, not customarily, but conscientiously, with this desire, design, hope and expectation that you may be converted by it. Come to every sermon, every sermon that you hear, with this one thought. Oh, I do hope God will now come in. I hope this day may be the time, this may be the man by whom God will bring me home. When you are coming to the privileges of God's house, lift up your heart to God thus. Lord, let this be the Sabbath, let this be the season in which I may receive renewing grace. Oh, let it be said that on this day such an one was born unto thee. Objection. You will say, I have been a hearer of the word for a long time, and yet it has not been effectual to my conversion. Answer. Yes, but you have not attended upon it in this manner, as the means of your conversion, nor with this design, nor praying for and expecting the happy effect from it. 13. Strike in with the Spirit when He begins to work in your heart. When He works convictions, oh, do not strifle them, but join with Him and beg the Lord to give you saving conversion. 
quench not the spirit do not reject him do not resist him beware of stifling convictions with evil company or worldly business when you are in anguish on account of your sins and fears about your eternal state beg of God that you may have peace only in thoroughly renouncing sin loathing it in your inmost soul and giving your whole heart without reserve to Christ say to him strike home Lord do not leave the work half done go to the bottom of my corruption and let out the life blood of my sins thus yield yourself to the working of the spirit and hoist your sails to the gusts of his wind 14 set upon the constant and diligent use of serious and fervent prayer he that neglects prayer is a profane and unsanctified sinner he that is not constant in prayer is a hypocrite unless the omission be contrary to his ordinary course under the force of some instant temptation one of the first things conversion appears in is in that it sets men a praying therefore set to this duty let not one day pass in which you have not morning and evening set apart some time for solemn prayer in secret also call your family together daily and duly to worship God with you woe be unto you if you are found among the families that call not upon God's name Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 25 but cold and lifeless devotions will not reach halfway to heaven be fervent and importune importunity will carry it but without violence the kingdom of heaven will not be taken you must strive to enter in and wrestle with tears and supplications as Jacob if you would gain the blessing you are undone for ever without grace and therefore you must set to it and resolve to take no denial that man who is fixed in this resolution says oh, well I must have grace or I will never give over till I have grace I will never cease earnestly pleading and striving with God in my own heart till he renews me by the power of his grace 15 forsake your evil company and forbear the occasions of sin you will never be turned from sin till you decline and forego the temptations to sin I never expect your conversion from sin unless you are brought to some self-denial so as to flee the occasions if you will be nibbling at the bait and playing on the brink and tampering with the snare your soul will surely be taken where God exposes men in his providence unavoidably to temptation and the occasions are such as we cannot remove we may expect special assistance in the use of his means but when we tempt God by running into danger he will not engage to support us when we are tempted and of all temptations one of the most fatal and pernicious is evil companions oh what hopeful beginnings have thus often been stifled oh the souls the estates the families the towns that have been ruined oh how many poor sinners have been enlightened and convinced and been just ready to escape the snare of the devil and have even escaped it and yet wicked company has pulled them back at last and made them sevenfold more the children of hell in a word I have no hopes of you except you shake off from evil company your life depends upon it forsake this or you cannot live you will be worse than the ass of Balaam to run on when you see the Lord with a sword drawn in the way let this sentence be written in capitals on your conscience a companion of fools shall be destroyed Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20 the Lord has spoken it and who shall reverse it and will you run upon destruction when God himself forewarns you if God ever changes your heart it will appear in the change of your company O oh, fear and flee the gulf by which so many thousands have been swallowed up into perdition it will be hard for you indeed to make your escape 
your companions will be mocking you out of your religion and will study to fill you with prejudices against strictness as ridiculous and comfortless. They will be flattering you and alluring you, but remember the warnings of the Holy Ghost. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, cast in thy lot, thy lot amongst us, walk thou not in the way with them, refrain thy foot from their path, avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For the way of the wicked is as darkness, they know not at what they stumble. They lie in wait for their blood, and lurk privily for their own lives. Proverbs chapter 1 verses 10 to 19, and chapter 4 verses 15 to 19. My soul is moved within me to see how many of my hearers and readers are likely to perish, both they and their houses, by this wretched mischief, even the frequenting of such places and company by which they are drawn into sin. Once more, I admonish you, as Moses did Israel, depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Numbers chapter 16, verse 26. O oh, flee from them, as you would those that had the plague, sores running in their foreheads. These are the devil's pandas and decoys, and if you do not make your escape, they will draw you into perdition, and will prove your eternal ruin. 16. Set apart a day to humble your soul in secret, by fasting and prayer, to work a sense of your sin and miseries upon your heart. Read over a thorough exposition of the commandments, and write down the duties omitted and the sins committed by you against every commandment, and so make a catalogue of your sins, and with shame and sorrow spread it out before the Lord. If your heart be truly willing to the terms, join yourself solemnly to the Lord in that covenant set down in direction 10 of this chapter, and the Lord grant mercy to you in his sight. Thus I have told you what you must do to be saved. Will you now obey the voice of the Lord? Will you arise and set to the work? O oh man, what answer will you make? What excuses will you have if you should perish at last through very willfulness? when you have known the way of life. I do not fear your miscarrying, if your own idleness do not at last undo you, in neglecting the use of the means that are so plainly prescribed. Rouse up, O sluggard, and ply your work. Be doing, and the Lord will be with you. A short soliloquy for an unregenerate sinner. Ah, a wretched man that I am! What a condition have I brought myself into by sin! Oh, see, my heart has deceived me all this while, in flattering me that my condition was good. I see, I see I am but a lost and undone done man, for ever undone, unless the Lord help me out of this condition. My sins, my sins! Lord, what an unclean, polluted wretch I am, more loathsome and odious to thee than the most hateful venom or noisome carcass can be to me. Oh, what a hell of sin is in this heart of mine, which I have flattered myself was a good heart. Lord, how universally am I corrupted in all my parts, powers, performances. All the imaginations of my heart are only evil continually. I am under an inability to, and an aversion from, and an enmity against anything that is good, and am prone to all that is evil. My heart is a very sink of sin, and oh, the innumerable hosts and swarms of sinful thoughts, words, and actions that have flowed out of it. Oh, the load of guilt that is on my soul, my head is full my heart is full, my mind and my members, they are full of sin. Oh, my sins, how do they stare upon me? Woe is me, my creditors are upon me, every commandment takes hold upon me, for more than ten thousand talents, yea, ten thousand times ten thousand. How endless, then, is the sum of all my debts, if this whole world were filled up 
from earth to heaven with paper and all this paper were written within and without by arithmeticians yet when all were added up it would come inconceivably short of what I owe to the very least of God's commandments woe well unto me for my debts are infinite and my sins are increasing they are wrongs to an infinite majesty and if he that commits treason against a silken mortal is worthy to be racked drawn and quartered what have I deserved but that I that I have so often lifted up my hand against heaven and have struck at the crown and the dignity of the almighty oh my sins oh my sins behold a troop cometh multitudes multitude there is no number of their armies innumerable evils have compassed me about my iniquities have taken hold upon me they have set themselves against me oh it were better to have all the regiments of hell come against me than to have my sins fall upon me to the spoiling of my soul Lord how am I surrounded how many are they that rise up against me they have beset me before and behind they swarm within me and without me they are possessed of all my powers and have fortified my soul as a garrison which all the brood of hell mans against the God that made me they are as mighty as they are many the sands are many but they are, they are not great the mountains great but they are not many but woe is me my sins are as many as the sands and as great as the mountains their weight is greater than their number it were better that the rocks and mountains should fall upon me than the crushing and unsupportable load of my own sins Lord I am heavy laden let mercy help her I am gone unload me of this heavy guilt this sinking load or I am crushed without hope and must be pressed down to hell if my grief were thoroughly weighed and my sins laid in the balances together they would be heavier than the sand of the sea therefore my words are swallowed up they would weigh down all the rocks and the hills and turn the balances against the isles of the earth O Lord thou knowest my manifold transgressions and my mighty sins ah my soul alas my glory how are you humbled once the glory of the creation and the image of God and now a lump of filthiness a coffin of rottenness replenished with stent and loathsomeness oh what work has sin made with you you shall be termed forsaken and all the rooms of your faculties desolate and the name which you have shall be called Ichabod or where is the glory how you come down mightily my beauty is turned into deformity and my glory into shame Lord what a loathsome leper I am the ulcerous bodies of Job or Lazarus were not more offensive to the eyes and nostrils of men than I must needs be to the most holy God whose eyes cannot behold iniquity and what misery have my sins brought upon me Lord what a state I am in sold under sin cast out of God's favor accursed from the Lord cursed in my body cursed in my soul cursed in my name in my estate my relations and all that I have my sins are unpardoned and my soul within a step of death alas what shall I do where shall I go which way shall I look God is frowning upon me from above hell is gaping for me beneath conscience smiting me within temptations and dangers surround me without oh where shall I fly what place can hide me from omniscience what power can secure me from omnipotence what do you mean O oh my soul to go on thus are you in league with hell have you made a covenant with death are you in love with your own misery is it good for you to be here alas what shall I do shall I go on in my sinful ways why then certain damnation will be my end and shall I be so besotted and mad as to go and sell my soul into the flames for a, a little ale or a little ease or a little pleasure or gain or comfort to my flesh shall I linger any longer in this wretched state no if I tarry here I shall die what then is there any help 
no hope none except I turn why but is there any remedy for such woeful misery any mercy for such provoking iniquity yes as sure as God's oath is true I shall have pardon and mercy yet if I presently unfeignedly and unreservedly turn to Christ why then I thank thee upon bended knee the knees of my soul O most merciful Jehovah that thy patience has waited for me hitherto for hadst thou forsaken me in the state I had perished for ever and now I adore thy grace and resolve by thy grace to set myself against them and to follow thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life who am I Lord that I should make any claim to thee or have any part or portion in thee who am not worthy to lick up the dust of thy feet yet since thou holdest forth the golden scepter I am bold to come and touch to despair will be to disparage thy mercy to stand off when thou bidst me come will be at once to undo myself and rebel against thee under pretense of humility therefore I bow my soul unto thee and with all possible thankfulness accept thee as mine and give up myself to thee as thine thou shalt be a sovereign over me my king and my god thou shalt be on the throne and all my power shall bow to thee they shall come and worship before thy feet thou shalt be my portion O Lord and I will rest in thee thou callest for my heart O oh, that it were in any way fit for thine acceptance I am unworthy O Lord everlastingly unworthy to be thine but since thou wilt have it so I freely give my heart to thee take it it is thine O oh, that it were a better heart but Lord I put it into thy hands who alone can mend it mould it after thine own heart make it as thou wouldst have it holy, humble, heavenly, soft, tender flexible and write thy law upon it come Lord Jesus come quickly enter in triumphantly take me up for thyself forever I give thy, myself to thee I come to thee as the only way to the Father as the only mediator the means ordained to bring me to God I have destroyed myself but in thee is my help save Lord or else I perish I come to thee with the rope about my neck I am worthy to die and to be damned never was the hire more due to his servant never was penny more due to the labourer than death and hell my just wages are the due for my sins but I fly to thy merits I trust alone to the value and virtue of thy sacrifice and the prevalence of thy intercession I submit to thy teaching I make choice of thy government stand open you everlasting doors that the king of glory might enter in O thou spirit of the most high the comforter and sanctifier of thy chosen come in with all thy glorious train all thy courtly attendants thy fruits and graces let me be thine habitation I can give thee but what is thine own already but here with the widow I give in my two mites my soul and my body into thy treasury fully resigning them up to thee to be sanctified by thee to be servants to thee they shall be thy patients cure thou their maladies they shall be thy agents govern thou their actions too long have I served the world too long have I hearkened to Satan but now I renounce them all and will be ruled by thy dictates and directions and guided by thy counsel O blessed trinity O glorious unity I deliver myself up to thee receive me write thy name O Lord upon me and upon all that I have as thy proper goods set thy mark upon me upon every member of my body and every faculty of my soul I have chosen thy precepts thy law will I lay before me this shall be the copy which I will keep in my eye and study to write after according to this rule do I resolve by thy grace to walk 
after this law shall be my whole man governed. And though I can't perfectly keep one of my commandments, yet I will allow myself in the breach of none. I know my flesh will hang back, but I resolve by the power of thy grace to cleave to thee and thy holy ways whatever it costs me. I am sure I cannot come off, off a loser by thee, and therefore I will be content with reproach and difficulties and hardships here, and will deny myself and take up thy cross and follow thee. Lord Jesus, thy yoke is easy, thy cross is welcome, as it is the way to thee. I lay, lay aside all hopes of a worldly happiness. I will be content to tarry till I come to thee. Let me be poor and low, little and despised here, so that I may be admitted to live and reign with thee hereafter. Lord, thou hast my heart and hand to this agreement. Be it as the law of the Medes and Persians never to be reversed. To this will I stand. In this resolution by thy grace I will live and die. I have sworn and will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I have given my free consent. I have made my everlasting choice. Lord Jesus, confirm the contract. Amen. The Motives to Conversion Though what has already been said of the necessity of conversion and of the miseries of the unconverted might be sufficient to induce any considerate mind to resolve upon a present turning to God, yet knowing what a piece of desperate obstinacy and untractableness the heart of man naturally is, I have thought it necessary to add some motives to persuade you to be reconciled to God. O oh Lord, do not fail me now at my last attempt. If any soul has read hitherto and is yet untouched, Lord, fasten on him now and do thy work. Take him by the heart, overcome him, persuade him till he say, Thou hast prevailed, for thou art stronger than I. Lord, didst thou not make me a fisher of men, and have I toiled all this while and caught nothing? Alas, that I should have spent my strength for naught, and now I am casting my last cast. O Lord Jesus, stand now upon the shore, and direct how and where I shall spread my net, and let me so enclose with arguments the souls I seek, that they may be able to get out. Now, Lord, for a multitude of souls, now for a full draught. O Lord God, Remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me this once, O God. Men and brethren, heaven and earth call upon you, yea, hell itself preaches the doctrine of repentance unto you. The ministers of the churches lay before you. The angels of heaven wait for you, for your repenting and turning unto God. O sinner, why should devils laugh at your destruction and deride your misery and sport themselves with your folly? This will be your case except you turn. And were it not better, you should be a joy to angels than a laughing stock and a sport for devils. Verily, if you would but come in, the heavenly host would take up their anthems and sing Glory to God in the highest. The morning stars would sing together and all the sons of God shout for joy and celebrate this new creation as they did the first. Your repentance would, as it were, make a holiday in heaven and the glorious spirits would rejoice in that there is a new brother added to their society, another heir born to the Lord and a lost son received safe and sound. The true penitent's tears are indeed the wine that maketh glad both God and man. If it be a little that men and angels would rejoice at your conversion, know also that God himself would rejoice over you, even with singing. Luke 15, chapter 9, Isaiah 62, verse 5. Never did Jacob with such joy weep over the neck of his Joseph as your heavenly Father would rejoice over you upon your coming to him. Look over the story of the prodigal son. I think I see how the aged father lays aside his state, forgets his years, behold how he runs, oh the haste 
that mercy makes. The sinner makes not half that speed. I think how I see how his heart moves, how his compassions yearn, how quick-sighted is love. Mercy spies him a great way off, forgets his riotous course, unnatural rebellion, horrid unthankfulness, and not a word of these, and receives him with open arms, clasps him about the neck, kisses him, calls for the fatted calf, the best robe, the ring, the shoes, the best cheer in heaven's store, the best attire in heaven's wardrobe. Yea, the joy cannot be held in his own breast. Others must be called in to participate. The friends sympathize, but none knows the joy the father has in his newborn son, whom he has received again from the dead. I think I hear the music in the distance. Oh, the melody of the heavenly choristers. I cannot learn their song, Revelation 14, verse 3, but I think I overhear the theme at which all the harmonious choir with one constant strikes sweetly in. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I need not explain the parable further. God is the Father, Christ is the provision, His righteousness the robe, His grace the ornaments, ministers, saints and angels, the friends and servants, and you that read, if you will, but unfeignedly repent and turn, the welcome prodigal, the happy instance of this grace, the blessed subject of this joy and love. O rock, O adamant, what? not moved yet, not yet resolved to turn forthwith and close with mercy, I will try yet once again. If one was sent to you from the dead, would you be persuaded? Why hear the voice from the dead, from the damned, crying to you that you should repent? I pray thee that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. If one went to them from the dead, they will repent. Luke chapter 16, verses 27 to 28. Hear, O man, your predecessors in impenitence preach to you from the infernal flames that you should repent. O look down into the bottomless pit. Do you see how the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever? What do you think of those chains of darkness can you be content to burn? Do you see how the worm gnaws, how the fire rages? What do you say to the gulf of perdition? Will you take up your habitation there? Oh, lay your ear to the door of hell. Do you hear the curses and blasphemies, the weepings and wailings, how they repent and lament of their follies and curse their day? How do they roar and gnash with their teeth? How deep their groans? How inconceivable their miseries! If the shrieks of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were so terrible that when the earth clave asunder and opened his mouth and swallowed them up, and all that appertained to them, that all Israel fled at the cry of them, Numbers chapter 16 verses 33 to 34, Oh, how fearful! would be the cry if God should take off the covering from the mouth of hell and let the cries of the damned ascend with all their terrors unto the children of men. And of their moans and miseries, this is the piercing, killing emphasis and all the burden for ever, for ever. As God liveth that made your soul, you are but a few hours distant from all of this except you be converted. Oh, I am even lost and swallowed up in the abundance of these arguments that I might suggest. If there be any point of wisdom in all the world, it is to repent and come in. If there be anything righteous, anything reasonable, this is it. If there be anything that may be called madness and folly, and anything that may be called sottish, absurd, brutish and unreasonable, it is this to go on in your unconverted state. Let me beg of you, as you would not willingly destroy yourself, sit down and weigh, besides what has been said, 
these following motives, and let conscience say, if it be not most reasonable, that you should repent and turn. 1. The God that made you most graciously invites you. His most sweet and merciful nature invites you. Oh, the kindness of God, His boundless compassion, His tender mercies. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are His ways above our ways, and His thoughts above our thoughts. He is full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 86 verse 15 This is a great argument to persuade sinners to come. Turn unto the Lord, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. If God would not repent of the evil, it would be some discouragement to our repenting. If there were no hope of mercy, it would be no wonder that rebels should stand out. But never had subject such a gracious prince, such pity, patience and clemency to deal with as you have. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? Micah chapter 7 verse 18 O sinners, see what a God you have to deal with. If you will but turn, he will turn again and have compassion on you. He will subdue your iniquities and cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. Return unto me, saith the Lord, and I will return unto you. Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 Sinners do not fail in that they have too high thoughts of God's mercy, but in that they overlook his justice, or they promise themselves mercy out of God's way. His mercies are beyond all imagination, great mercies, manifold mercies, Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 19, tender mercies, sure mercies, everlasting mercies. And all is yours, if you will but turn. Are you willing to come in? The Lord has laid aside his terror and erected a throne of grace. He holds forth the golden scepter, touch it and live. Would a merciful man slay his enemy, when prostrate at his feet, acknowledging his wrong, begging pardon, and offering to enter into him with a covenant of peace? Much less will the merciful God study his name. Exodus 37 verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Also read Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 17. God's soul-encouraging calls and promises invite you. Oh, what an earnest suitor is mercy to you! How lovingly, how instantly it calls after you! How earnestly it woos you! Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger for ever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, return and I will heal thy backslidings. Thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return unto me, saith the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 3 As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? O house of Israel, Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All the transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that, that he hath done, he shall live. Repent and turn you from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Wherefore turn yourselves, and live ye. Ezekiel chapter 18 O 
What melting, gracious words! The voice of God and not of a man. This is not the manner of men, for the offended sovereign to sue for the to the offending traitorous rebel. Oh, how does mercy follow you and plead with you? Is not your heart broken yet? Oh, that today you would hear his voice. Two, the doors of heaven are thrown open to you. The everlasting gates are set wide open for you, and an abundant entrance into the kingdom of heaven is administered to you. Christ now addresses you and calls upon you to arise and take possession of this good land. View the glory of the other world as set forth in the map of the gospel. Get up into the Piscar of the promises and lift up your eyes northward and southward and eastward and westward and see the good land that is beyond Jordan and that goodly mountain. Behold the paradise of God watered with the streams of glory. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it for the land which you see the Lord will give it to you for ever if you will but return. Let me say to you, as Paul to Agrippa, Believest thou the prophets? If you believe indeed, view what glorious things are spoken of the city of God, and know that all this is here tendered in the name of God to you. As verily as God is true, it shall be yours for ever, if you will but thoroughly turn. Behold the city, a pure, transparent gold, whose foundations are garnished with all manner of precious stones, whose gates are pearls, whose light is glory, whose temple is God. Believest thou this? If you do, you are no more beside yourself that will not take possession. When the gates are thrown open to you, and you are bidden to enter, O oh, you sons of folly, will you embrace the dunghill and refuse the kingdom? Behold, the Lord takes you up into the mountain, shows you the kingdom of heaven and all the glory thereof, and tells you, All this will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me, if you will submit to mercy, accept my Son, and serve me in righteousness and holiness. O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe, will you seek and serve the world and neglect eternal glory? What? Not enter into paradise when the flaming sword which was once set to keep you out is now used to drive you in? But you will say, I am uncharitable to think you infidels and unbelievers. What then shall I think of you? Either you are desperate unbelievers that do not credit it, or you are besides yourselves that you know and believe the excellence of eternity and of this glory and yet still do fearfully neglect it. Do but attend to what is offered to you. A blessed kingdom, a kingdom of glory, a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of peace, an everlasting kingdom. Here you shall dwell, here you shall reign for ever, and the Lord will seat you on a throne of glory, and with his own hand shall set the royal diadem upon your head, and give you a crown, and not of thorns, there shall be no sinning and no suffering there, not of gold, for that shall be viler than the dirt in that day. But a crown of life, a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory, yea, you shall put on glories of robe and shall shine like the sun in the firmament of your father. Look now at your worthless flesh. This flesh which is mere dust and ashes shall be brighter than the stars. In short, you shall be made like unto the angels of God, and behold his face in righteousness. Look now and tell me, do you not yet believe? If not, conscience must pronounce you an infidel, for it is the very word of God that I speak. But if you say you believe, let me next know your resolution. Will you embrace this for your happiness? Will you forgo your sinful gains, your forbidden pleasures? Will you trample on the world's esteem and stop your ears to its flatterers and wrest yourself away from its embraces? Will you be content 
to take up with reproach and poverty if they lie in the way to heaven and follow the Lord with humble self-denial in a mortified and flesh-displeasing life. If so, all is yours and that for ever. And is not the offer a good one? Is it not just that he should be damned that will go on and perish when all this may be had for the taking of it? Will you not take God at his word? Will you not let go of your hold on the world and lay hold on eternal life? If not, let conscience tell you whether you are not beside yourself, that you should neglect so happy a choice by which you might be made happy for ever? 3. God will give you unspeakable privileges in this life. Though the fullness of your blessedness shall be reserved till hereafter, yet God will give you no little things in hand. He will redeem you from your thraldom. He will pluck you from the paw of the lion. The serpent shall bruise your heel, but you shall crush his head. He shall deliver you from this present evil world. Prosperity shall not destroy you. Adversity shall not separate him and you. He will redeem you from the power of the grave and make the king of terrors a messenger of peace to you. He will take out the curse from the cross and make affliction the refining pot to purify your metal, to the fan to blow off your chaff, the medicine to cure your mind. He will save you from the arrest of the law and turn the curse into a blessing for you. He has the keys of death and of hell, and shutteth and no man openeth, and he will shut its mouth as once he did the lions, that you shall not be hurt of the second death. Besides, he will not only save from misery, but install you into unspeakable prerogatives. He will bestow himself upon you, he will be a friend and a father unto you, he will be a sun and a shield to you, in a word, he will be a God to you. And what more can be said? What may you expect that a God should do for you and be to you? That he will be, and that he will do. She that marries a prince expects that he should do for her like a prince, that she may live in a suitable state and have an answerable dowry. He that has a king for his father or friend expects that he should do for him like a king. Alas, the kings and monarchs of the earth, so much above you, are but like the painted butterflies among the rest of their kind, or the fair-coloured palmer worm among the rest of the worms, if compared to God. As he infinitely exceeds the glory and the power of all his glittering dust, so he will, beyond all proportion, exceed in doing his favourites, whatever princes can do for theirs. He will give you grace and glory, and withhold no good thing from you. He will take you for his sons and daughters, and make you heirs of his promises, and establish his everlasting covenant with you. He will justify you from all that law, conscience, and Satan can charge against you. He will give you free access into his presence and accept your person and receive your prayers. He will abide in you and hold a constant and friendly communication with you. His ear shall be open, his door shall be open, his store shall be open at all times to you. His blessings shall rest upon you and he will make your enemies to serve you and work out all things for good unto you. Four, the terms of mercy are brought as low as possible to you. God has stooped as low to sinners as with honour he can. He will not be the author of sin, nor stain the glory of his holiness, and how could he come lower than this, unless he should do that? God does not impose anything unreasonable or impossible as a condition of life upon you. Two things were necessary to be done according to the tenor of the first covenant. One, that we should be fully satisfied 
of the demands of justice for past offences. 2. That we should perform personally, perfectly and perpetually the whole of the law for all time to come. By our sins we render salvation through either of these ways impossible. But behold God's gracious provision in both. He does not insist upon satisfaction. He is content to take of the surety, and he of his own providing too, what he might have exacted from you. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 to 19 He declares himself to have received a ransom, and that he expects nothing but that you should accept his Son, and he shall be righteous and be redemption to you. If you come in his Christ, and set your heart to please him, making this your chief concern, he will graciously accept you. Oh, consider the condescension of your God. Let me say to you, as Naaman's servant to him, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? If God demanded some terrible, some severe and rigorous thing of you to escape eternal damnation, uh, would you not have tried to do it? Suppose it had been to spend all of your days in sorrow, in some howling wilderness, or pine away with famine, would you not have thankfully accepted eternal redemption, though these had been the conditions? Nay, Father, if God had told you that you should burn in the fire for millions of ages, or be so long tormented in hell, would you not have accepted it? Alas, all these are not so much as one grain of sand in the glass of eternity. If your offended Creator should have held you but one year upon the rack, and bid you come and then forsake your sins, accept Christ and serve Him a few years in self-denial, or lie in that case for ever and ever, do you think that you should have hesitated at the offer and disputed the terms and would have been unresolved uh, whether or not to accept the proposal? O oh, sinner, return and live. Why should you die when life is to be had for the taking, when mercy entreats you to be saved? Could you say, Lord, I knew thee, that thou wast an hard man? Even then you would have no excuse. But when the God of heaven has stooped so low and condescended so far, if you still stand off, who shall plead for you? Objection. Notwithstanding all the advantages of the new covenant, I am unable to repent and believe and so comply with its conditions. Answer. These you may perform by God's grace enabling. But let the next consideration serve for a fuller answer, which is 5. God offers all needed grace to enable you. I have stretched out mine hand, and no man regarded. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 24. What though you were plunged into the ditch of that misery from which you could never get out, Christ offers to help you out. He reaches out his hand to you. If you perish, it is for refusing his help. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open to me, I will come in. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. What though you are poor and wretched and blind and naked? Christ offers a cure for your blindness, a covering for your nakedness, riches for your poverty. He tenders you his righteousness, his grace. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Do you say the condition is impossible? 
for I have nothing with which to buy it. You must know that this buying is without money and without price. This buying is by begging and seeking with your whole heart. God commands you to know him and to fear him. Do you say yes, but my mind is blinded and my heart is hardened from his fear? I answer that God offers to enlighten your mind and to teach you his fear. So that now, if men live in ignorance and estrangement from the Lord, it is because they will not understand and do not desire the knowledge of his ways. If thou criest after knowledge, if thou seekest hair as silver, if thou shalt, be, uh, shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, Proverbs chapter 2 verses 3 to 5, is not that a far, fair offer? Turn you at my proposal. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23. Though of yourselves you can do nothing, yet you may do all through his spirit enabling you. And he offers assistance to you. God bids you wash and make you clean. You say you are unable as much as the leopard to wash out his spots. Yes, but the Lord offers to cleanse you. So that if you are filthy still, it is through your own willfulness. I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Ezekiel chapter 24 verse 13. O Jerusalem, wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 27. God invites you to be made clean and entreats you to yield to him. O oh, accept his offers and let him do for you and in you that which you cannot do for yourselves. Conclusion And now, beloved, let me know your mind. What do you intend to do? Will you go on and die, or will you turn and lay hold on eternal life? How long will you linger in Sodom? How long will you halt between two opinions? Have you not yet resolved, whether Christ or Barabbas, whether bliss or torment, whether this vain and wretched world, or the paradise of God, be the better choice? Is it a disputable case whether Abana and Parfar of Damascus be better than the streams of Eden, or whether the vile pool of sin is to be preferred before the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb? Can the world in good earnest do for you that which Christ can? Will it stand by you to eternity? Will pleasures, lands, titles and treasures descend with you? If not, had you not look after something that will? What do you mean by standing wavering? Shall I leave you at last like a gripper, only almost persuaded? You are forever lost if left here. As good be not at all as be not altogether a Christian. How long will you rest in idle wishes and fruitless purposes? When will you come to a fixed, firm and full resolve? Do you not see how Satan cheats you by tempting you to delay? How long has he drawn you on in the ways of perdition? Well, do not put me off with a dilatory answer. Tell me not later. I must have immediate consent. If you are not now resolved, while the Lord is treating with you and inviting you, much less likely, likely are you to be later when these impressions have worn off and you are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Will you give me your hand? Will you set open the door and give the Lord Jesus the full and ready possession? Will you put your name under his covenant? What do you resolve upon? If you still delay, and my labour is lost, and all is likely to come to nothing. Come cast in your lot, make your choice. Now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation, today, if you will hear his voice. Why should not this be the day from which you are able to date your happiness? Why should you venture a day longer, 
in this dangerous and dreadful condition? What if God should this night require your soul? Oh, that thou mightest know in this day the things that belong to thy peace, before they be hid from thine eyes. This is your day, and it is but a day. Others have had their day, and have received their doom. And now you are brought upon the stage of this world, here to act your part for eternity. Remember, you are now upon your good behavior for everlasting. If you do not make a wise choice now, you are undone for ever. What your present choice is, such must be your eternal condition. And is it true indeed? Are life and death at your choice? Why then, what hinders you but that you should be happy? Nothing does or can hinder you but your own willful neglect and refusal. It was the saying of the eunuch to Philip, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So may I say to you, See, here is Christ, here is mercy, here is pardon, here is life. What hinders you but that you should be pardoned and saved? One of the martyrs, as he was praying at the stake, had his pardon set before him in a box, which, which indeed he rightly refused, because upon unworthy terms. But here the terms are most honorable and easy. O sinner, will you perish with the pardon written by you? Do you henceforth give your consent to Christ, to renounce your sins, to deny yourself, take up the yoke and the cross, and you can carry the day. Christ is yours, pardon, peace, life, and blessedness are all yours. And is not this an offer worth embracing? Why should you hesitate or doubtfully dispute about your case? It is not, is it not past controversy whether God is better than sin and glory better than vanity? Why should you forsake your own mercy and sin against your own life? When will you shake off your sloth and lay by your excuses? Boast not of tomorrow, for you know not where you may lodge this night. Now the Holy Spirit is striving with you. He will not always strive. Have you not felt your heart warmed by the word and been almost persuaded to leave off your sins and come to Christ? Have you not felt some motions in your mind in which you have been warned of your danger and told what your careless course would end in? It may be you are like young Samuel who when the Lord called once and again knew not the voice of the Lord. But these motions are the offers and callings and strivings of the Spirit. O oh, take advantage of the tide and know that this is the day of your visitation. Now the Lord stretches wide his arms to receive you. He beseeches you by us. How movingly, how meltingly, how compassionately he calls you. The church is put into sudden ecstasy at the sound of his voice, the voice of my beloved. Oh, will you turn a deaf ear to his voice? It is not the voice that breaks the cedars and makes the mountains to skip like a calf that shakes the wilderness and divides the flame of fire. It is not Sinai's thunders, but the soft, still voice. It is not the voice of Mount Abel, a voice of cursing and of terror, but the voice of Mount Gerizim, the voice of blessing and glad tidings of good things. It is not the voice of the trumpet nor the voice of war, but a message of peace from the King of Peace. I may say to you, O sinner, as Martha to her sister, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Now then with Mary, arise quickly and come to him. How sweet are his invitations. He cries in the open concourse, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. John chapter 7 verse 37 How bountiful is he! He excludes none. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22 verse 17 Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live. 
Proverbs chapter 9 verses 5 to 6 Come unto me and take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you shall find rest for your souls. Matthew chapter 9 verses 28 to 29 He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John chapter 6 verse 37 How does he bemoan the obstinate refuser? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Matthew chapter 23 verse 37 Behold me, behold me, I have stretched out my hands all the day to a rebellious people. Isaiah 65 verses 1 to 2 O be persuaded now at last to throw yourselves into the arms of his love. Behold, O ye sons of men, the Lord Jesus hath thrown open the prison, and now he comes to you by his ministers and beseeches you to come out. If it were from a palace or paradise that Christ did call you, it were no wonder that you would be unwilling to go. And yet how easily was Adam beguiled from paradise? but it is from your prison, from your chains, from the dungeon, from the darkness that he calls you. And yet, will you not come out? He calls you unto liberty, and yet will you not hearken? His yoke is easy, his laws are liberty, his service is freedom, and whatever prejudice you may have against his ways, if God may be believed, you shall find them all pleasure and peace and shall taste sweetness and joy unutterable, and take infinite delight and felicity in them. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 17, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8, Psalm 119 verses 103, 111, and 165. Beloved, I am loath to leave you. I cannot tell how to give you up. I am now ready to close, but I would see a covenant made between Christ and you before I end. What? Shall I leave you at last where I found you? Have you read this far? And yet not resolved to abandon all your sins and to close with Jesus Christ? Alas, what shall I say? What shall I do? Who will turn off all my importunity? Have I run in vain? Have I used so many arguments and spent so much time to persuade you? And must I sit down at last in disappointment? Shall it be a small matter that you turn me away? You put a slight upon the God that made you. You reject the compassion and beseechings of the Saviour and will be found resistors of the Holy Ghost if you will not now be prevailed upon to repent and be converted. Well, Though I have called you long and you have refused, I shall yet this once more lift up my voice like a trumpet and cry from the highest places of the city before I conclude with the miserable exclamation, It is all over. Once more I shall call after regardless sinners that, if it be possible, I may awaken them. O oh, earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 22 verse 29 Unless you are resolved to die, lend your ear to the last call of mercy. Behold, in the name of God, I make open proclamation to you. Hearken unto me, O your children. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 32 to 33. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labour for that which satisfieth not hearken diligently unto me and eat you that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness incline your ear and come unto me hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 to 3 Ho, 
Every one that is sick in any manner of disease or torment, or is possessed with an evil spirit, whether it be of pride, fury, lust, or covetousness, come ye to the physician. Bring your sick. Lo, here is he that healeth all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people. Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. Ho, oh, every one that is in distress, gather yourself unto Christ, and he will become a captain over you. He will be your protection from the arrests of the law. He will save you from the hand of justice. Behold, he is an open sanctuary to you. He is a known refuge. Away with your sins and come unto him, lest the avenger of blood seize you, lest devouring wrath overtake you. Ho, oh, every blind and ignorant sinner, come and buy eye salve that you may see. Away with your excuses. You are forever lost if you continue in this state. But accept Christ for your profit and he will be a light unto you. Cry unto him for knowledge, study his words, take pains about religion, humble yourself before God, and he will teach you his way, and make you wise unto salvation. But if you will not follow him, but sit down, because you have but one talent, he will condemn you for a wicked and slothful servant. Matthew chapter 25 verses 24 to 26. Ho, oh, every profane sinner, come in and live. Return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on you. Be entreated. O oh, return, come. You that have filled your mouth with oaths and execrations, all manner of sins and blasphemies shall be forgiven you, if you will but thoroughly turn unto Christ and come in. O oh, unclean sinner, put away your whoredoms out of his sight, and your adulteries from between your breasts, and give yourself unto Christ as a vessel of holiness alone for his use. And then, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Luke chapter 7 verses 47, Isaiah chapter 1 verses 18, and chapter 4 verse 7. Here, O ye drunkards, how long will you be drunk? Put away from you your wine. Though you rolled in the filthiness of your sins, give yourself unto Christ to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Embrace his righteousness, accept his government, and though you have been vile, he will wash you. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 Here are you loose companions, whose delight is in vain and wicked society, to sport away your time in carnal mirth. Come in at wisdom's call and choose her and her ways, and you shall live. Proverbs chapter 9 verses 5 to 6 Hear, O you scorners, hear the word of the Lord. Though you make a sport at godliness and its professors, though you have made a scorn of Christ and his ways, yet even to you does he call, that you should be found among the worst of that black roll. Yet upon your thorough conversion you shall be washed, you shall be sanctified, you shall be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 Ho, oh, every formal professor, you are but lukewarm and resting in a mere form of godliness. Give over your halting, be a true Christian, be zealous and repent, and then Though you have been an offence to Christ, you shall be the joy of his heart. Revelation chapter 3, verses 16 to 20. And now I bear witness that mercy has been offered to you. I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that ye may live. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 I can only entreat you and warn you. I cannot otherwise compel you to be happy. If I could, I would. What answer will you send me with to my master? Let me speak to you as Abraham's servant to Nahor's family. And now if you will kindly 
and truly deal with my master, tell me. Oh, for such happy answer as Rebecca gave them. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, Will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And Genesis chapter 24 verses 49 to 58. Oh, that I had this from you. Why should I, who agonize for your salvation, be your accuser? Why should the passionate pleadings and of mercy be turned into hor horrid aggravations of your obstinacy and additions to your misery? Judge in yourselves. Do we not think their condemnation will be doubly dreadful that shall go on in their sins after all these endeavors to recall them? Doubtless it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, yea, for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment, than for you. Matthew chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. Beloved, if you have any pity for your perishing souls, close with the present offer of mercy. If the God that made you have any authority with you, obey his commands and come in. If you are not despisers of grace, and would not shut the doors of mercy against yourselves, repent and be converted. Let not heaven stand open for you in vain. Let not the Lord Jesus open his stores and bid you buy without money and without price in vain. Let not his spirit and his minister strive with you in vain, and leave you now at last unpersuaded lest the sentence go forth against you. The bellows are burned, the lead is consumed in the fire, the founder melteth in vain. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Jeremiah chapter 6 verses 29 to 30 Father of spirits, take the heart in hand that is too hard for my weakness. Do not thou end, though I have done. A word from thy effectual power will do the work. O thou that hast the key of David, that openest and no man shutteth, open thou this heart as thou didst Lydia's, and let the King of glory enter in, and make this soul thy captive. Let not the tempter harden him in delays. Let him not stir from this place, nor take his eyes from these lines, till he resolve to forego his sins, and accept life on thy self-denying terms. In thy name, O Lord God, did I go forth to these labors. In thy name do I close them. Let not all the time they have cost be lost hours. Let not all the thoughts of the heart, and all the pains that have been about them, be lost labor. Lord, put thy hand upon the heart of the reader, and send thy spirit, as thou didst once Philip to join himself to the chariot of the eunuch, while he was reading thy word. And though I should never know it while I live, yet I beseech thee, O Lord God, let it be found at the last day, that some souls have been converted by these labors, and let some be able to stand forth and say, that by these persuasions they were one unto thee. Amen and Amen. And let him that readeth say, Amen.